Hey everyone, Nico Carver here. This past July, I put out a call to send me your images for another astrophotography critique, and the response was incredible. I had 257 images sent in, so it took me several months to look at each one, and my notes document is up to 75 pages long, single-spaced. So I'm sorry it took so long, but I wanted to get to every single person who took the time to send in an image. But now that I'm all organized with uh, all of my notes, today's the day to finally hit record and get this done. We're gonna go straight through, so here we go. This is from Anand, and it's an image of the Andromeda galaxy, of course, taken with a Rokinon 135 millimeter camera lens, a Canon T3i DSLR, and a star tracker. And it's a bit under an hour's worth of integration from a Bortle 6 sky. I think that the color, the framing, I love the vertical crop and the contrast here all look really good. I don't see really any issues with the final edit, but Anand did send in the raw stacked uh, data. So let's take a look at that. And actually I already did a, okay. So here's just the raw uh, picture uh, after stacking. And you can see there's a light pollution gradient. The, the light pollution dome is over here on the left-hand side. So the first thing I did is I just removed that light pollution gradient with automatic background extractor in PixInsight here. And you can see there is this ring artifact. And it's hard to really pin down exactly what that's from. It's usually some kind of reflection from the optics. Um, it could be something like a very localized light pollution source reflecting on something. Um, but what I try to do is just try different things to pin down what that's coming from. Um, I do, with the Rokinon 135, I don't think it's the lens, but I don't know why you have this sort of ring artifact. The other thing to really try is just play around with your flats technique, because maybe this is a, an overcorrection of the flat or something like that. Um, so play around with different kinds of flats. And because uh, this is really difficult, this kind of ring artifact to completely get rid of in post-processing. So it's something you want to address uh, in the acquisition stage. Um, for this image, of course, it didn't really matter too much since Andromeda was in the middle and you could just sort of crop it away. But in a field where you had like nebulosity across the field, this would be a bigger issue. So work on flat fielding, otherwise good job, Anand. Aaron sent in this image of the Ro Ofuki cloud complex done with uh, without a tracker, uh, just a Sony a6000 and a Sigma 16 millimeter lens on a tripod. So I'm surprised by the amount of detail uh, Aaron got at 16 millimeters focal length, like the star cluster here is quite impressive. I, I wonder why Aaron cropped in so much, because if this was done at 16 millimeters, I think Aaron could have fit in a lot more, like the blue horse head and even the Milky Way core area, but maybe there were problems in other parts of the field. Um, so other than that, I think this is very well done. Personally, uh, I would have shot probably wide open rather than stopping down, um, as that's my preference when shooting without a tracker. I'd rather get more signal and just, uh, you know, sacrifice the star quality a little bit. Um, but that's that's me. Other people are more sticklers about, about uh, tight stars. A Becca 18 captured Cygnus region with a Canon ESRA, a Rokinon 135 lens, and an iOptron Skyguider Pro. A Becca 18 mentioned splotchiness from uh, combining in the starless image, especially in the Canada section here of the North America nebula. And um, that's a common problem, especially, uh, you know, with Starnet artifacts. And if you if you change the if you do star reduction too much, then that's going to leave uh, those artifacts exposed when you add the stars back. So my way of dealing with that, um, and I'll just show sort of my version here, is to just leave the stars alone. Don't try to reduce them. Um, just play around with levels on the stars layer um, or curves to get sort of how you want it to look. So I just never do star reduction on a wide field image. It just doesn't work out because of that splotchiness. And I'd, I'd rather have lots of stars uh, even if they look sort of like noise, then what I know is the sort of splotchy star reduction artifact kind of stuff. Um, 
My one other note about this image is I think that the color balance got a little bit too red. Um, I'd prefer a little bit more of a, a balance with the O3 uh, signal. Um, so I just did a quick version here and you can see I got a little bit more color variety, brought out blues a little bit more um, and reduced uh, sort of the reds impact. Um, so, and the, the other thing I'll say about color contrasts is I think that it also helps with detail. So when you have a color contrast, like the Cygnus wall here is in red against uh, this more neutral uh, background, it really makes it helps it pop out and it looks like you've captured more detail, but it's all through manipulating color. Adi sent in an image of the Carina Nebula, which is a treat for me since it's a Southern Hemisphere only object. And this was shot with a Nikon D750 and a Nikkor 105 millimeter lens, untracked on a tripod from Bortle 4. And it's about 11 minutes total. And I think for untracked, this looks really great. Um, Adi mentioned maybe going overboard with the processing and getting weird shades of orangish brown in the image. And so I tried processing the same data sort of with uh, Adi's uh, issues in mind, uh, and I was able to get this out of it. Um, I'll just quickly show everything I did here. I just took the stacked image that Adi sent. I made a starless version of it that looks like this. I did that with Starnet++. I did a small color adjustment using a blue curve to bring out the blues in Karina. Then let's see here. I added the stars back as a new layer and set that to screen blend mode, which you're going to hear this a lot. This is sort of my standard processing and then reset the black level and did a little bit of a color adjustment there to remove some of the green noise. And then I just finally added a little bit of uh, saturation and playing around a little bit more with curves and called that done. And so I'm not sure exactly how you brought out so much brown uh, stuff. Uh, I, mean, I don't think that this area has that much brown dust. Um, so just play around with your, um, but it is, I think in the Milky Way, so there are a lot of stars. So maybe that's that's it, but just play around with your techniques and, uh, and keep going. Thanks for sending it in. Okay, uh, this is from Adrian, and it's another highlight of the Southern Hemisphere skies. Uh, this is an image of the fighting dragons of Ara. And Adrian took this with a William Optics 81 millimeter telescope and a ZWO 1600 with ZWO narrowband filters. And first off, I want to say I love the composition and color of this. It, it has a really nice flow, the composition. Um, and the color variety gives it this really nice depth. Um, so I have two small critiques. One is that I find that the O3 halo artifacts are a tad distracting. So like this, this kind of thing where it's like a very saturated blue around the star. Um, so I would just suggest cleaning those up manually. Um, you could do it in Photoshop uh, or another tool. Um, just when you're combining things, just look for those artifacts and, and use like spot healing brush to clean them up. Um, if, you know, if they're away from any nebulosity, make sure you're not destroying any detail. But like, for instance, this one, I don't think you would be destroying much detail if you just cleaned up that artifact. And my second critique is with uh, the Topaz Denoise AI. Um, I'm not opposed to it as a rule, but I think it's very easy to go a little bit overboard with the sharpening aspect of it. And this feels to me just a bit overdone with the sharpening in Topaz. Um, but that's, that's really a personal taste thing. Again, the color work and the flow of this composition are just superb. So other than the O3 artifacts, um, I think that the stars look great too. Um, you know, the, the size of them, uh, their impact in the image and their, their color saturation all look really good. So thanks for sending this in. All right, Ahmed sent an image of the North America and Pelican Nebula taken with a Nikon D850, an Optolong L Enhance filter, and a Red Cat 51 telescope all on the iOptron Skyguider Pro Star Tracker. Ahmed asked about the balance of the photo, 
and how to balance the image when the stars are so unevenly distributed. So Cygnus, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Cygnus is smack dab in the middle of the Milky Way. So of course there are a lot of stars. And um, then in this photo, it's interesting because on this side, you have the Northern Colsac Nebula, which is a huge dark nebula. So my critique of Ahmed's processing here is that I think the crop is a bit too aggressive and I'll talk about balance more when we look at what I did. But I think the problem with balance here is that Ahmed didn't like all the stars on the left side of the image, so cropped them off. And that centers the pelican. Um, but then it makes sense that the left side of the photo is too heavy um, since there's nothing over here to balance out the North America nebula. My other small issue with the processing is that, like many people do, I think that the reds are too saturated here, um, which makes the image feel sort of not as detailed <clears throat> because of lack of uh, the color variety that you could bring out. Okay, so here's what I did with the image. And what I tried to do is keep as much color variety in the image as possible. I added no extra saturation saturation because I really liked that, you know, uh, how it looked uh, with this sort of original framing. And uh, there's uh, interesting stuff in each corner um, that I think balances it out well, creating a nice X pattern uh, with the nebula, the big nebulas in the middle. And um, when you start looking at it, uh, I think that the the huge star cloud over here to the left of North America and the coal sack over here on the right, they provide sort of a nice yin yang kind of balance to the photo all on their own. So, so to answer your original question, how do you balance when the stars are very different? I think you just accept that's how this scene is and, uh, and, and try to embrace it uh, in your crop and in your processing. Okay, Askel. Askel shot uh, this image of the Orion Nebula with a Bresser Exos 2 mount. Not really a mount I'm super familiar with, but I think it's sort of uh, on the lower end. Um, and a Skywatcher 150 PDS Newtonian reflector and a Canon 400D from a Bortle 4 sky. And I think this looks really good, very sharp and noise free, um, which is especially impressive considering the 400D is a pretty old Canon DSLR. And the collimation of the telescope, I'm just looking at the star spikes, uh, looks really spot on. My only critique is that I bet Haskell could bring out a bit more of the Running Man Nebula up here. In my experience, if you can bring out the lower part of the Orion Nebula, uh, then you should be able to get pretty good detail in the Running Man. And um, this is just a JPEG, so ignore uh, <clears throat> so this is just a JPEG that was sent to me. So ignore what I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to bring out a lot of noise, but just to show you that there is more stuff up here in the running man, uh, I'm just going to bring up the levels a lot and you can see that we can see more of the shape of the running man. If I really, bring up the levels like that. Now, it might be hard to, to balance out the noise and the other stuff and bring that out, but I'd, I'd give it a shot um, just because I think that would sort of help uh, complete the image by making this corner so interesting with the running man up there. Albin time-lapse shot this with a Canon 200D and a 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens at 250 millimeter focal length from a Bortle 4. And this is shot untracked, meaning just on a tripod. And Albin time lapse, uh, as the name suggests, uh, noted that they usually shoot time lapses and they're new to trying deep sky stacked exposures. And I think it's very good for someone new to deep sky shooting untracked. For me, it's a little bit over processed, uh, meaning pushing the data further than it can go based on the amount of data that you have. And over processing creates artifacts usually. Um, that's sort of a sign of it. Usually, uh, or especially, I should say, on the stars. Um, when you when you try to push something too hard, you get sort of rings and different things on the stars. Um, 
so I tried to stick with sort of the vision for this picture, but um, not have all of that uh, sort of satur saturated artifacts on the stars and in other places um, and reprocessed it using uh, Albin time lapses data like this. Um, and so I just sort of went through my normal process here. Uh, starless, um, playing around with saturation and curves, bringing the stars back in, uh, resetting the black point. And then I did a little bit of noise reduction using the camera raw filter, which in Photoshop is right here. Alex sent in in, in Alex sent in an image of the Carina Nebula and the Southern Beehive Cluster shot without a tracker using a Nikon DSLR and a Nifty 50 lens. Alec was looking for tips on bringing out the Milky Way and nebular detail. Um, so it's definitely a challenge with untracked stuff. Uh, what's the right amount of detail to bring out? or hide. Uh, we had an earlier picture of the Carina Nebula that was sort of going through this exact same thought process. Um, but in any case, uh, here's what I came up with. Um, it's it's a lot, I think, messier than Alex's version. So I think, you know, it really just sort of comes down to what you're looking for. Um, but since Alec mentioned, how do you bring out the Milky Way in the nebular detail? This is how you would do it but it's not perfect. It's a, it's a very sort of messy looking, I think. Um, so it's a trade-off and maybe you'd want to go somewhere in between where I went here. This is sort of maximalist editing versus where uh, Alec went, which I would call more minimalist editing. But anyways, I'll explain my process here, but it's pretty similar to what I'm going to explain many times, I'm sure, in this video. I went starless with Starnet++. I did some curves work. I probably went a little bit too far there, but oh well. Um, brought the stars back in, just did a little bit of cleanup, um, a glow in that lower right corner there. Um, reset the black point, increase saturation, and a final color correction curve. But, um, the other thing I'd say is just, uh, I love this field. I can't wait to get down to the Southern Hemisphere and see uh, this kind of cool field with the Milky Way plus these huge open star clusters, the Carina Nebula. It's so it's so uh, neat. And the and the giant coal sack uh, here. I think that's the coal sack. Uh, so really cool field. Thanks for sending it in. Alejandro sent an M31 image, Andromeda Galaxy, untracked from a very light polluted location. It looks very good. I love the star color Alejandro was able to bring out. Um, and Alejandro mentioned having to redo the flats the next day um, and was wondering if that was an issue. They did send the full image here. And looking at this full image, I don't think that the flats are a problem here. Um, there is a lot of sort of funkiness going on, uh, you know, along the edges, but I think that is more of a untracked recentering issue where um, my biggest advice here looking at this final stacked TIFF from Alejandro is to recenter more often because this, this, so this was done at 200 millimeter focal length. And so I've noticed at 200 millimeters, I'm recentering every 90 seconds, every two minutes, something like that, um, pretty often to keep the object as centered as possible. The more you increase the focal length when on, with untracked, the more you're going to have to um, take, you know, uh, 40, 50 shots, even 30 or 20, something like that, and then recenter. Um, and so it's it's a little bit more intensive with with untracked at high focal lengths, but it can be worth it because you can pick up more detail, of course. Um, but I think that will really help with all the the registration artifacts we're seeing here. I don't think uh, this is a uh, problem with uh, flats, but uh, this is an impressive amount of detail on the galaxy, especially considering this was taken from a Bortle 7 sky. Uh, so thanks for sending that one in. Okay. Uh, 
Alex B sent a tracked wide field image of Cygnus done with a Tamron zoom lens set to 35 millimeter focal length. I really love this. It's very nicely processed to my eye. Um, I love constellation shots where you really get a sense of the vast number of stars in the band of the Milky Way. Um, and it def definitely helps to have a sharp lens for a shot like this, because uh, if your lens is not very sharp, then it gets very overwhelming with a ton of stars. Um, I don't really have any suggestions in terms of processing. Alex mentioned having trouble with polar aligning because it was hard to distinguish Polaris from other bright stars. And I think the key there is to really get comfortable with the northern constellations of Ursa Major, Cassiopeia, and Ursa Minor. Um, because of course, all three can help really confirm that you're pointed at the right spot. Uh, if you sort of look at a, a star chart on your phone and see how Cassiopeia um, or Ursa Major, depending on the season, should be pointed, um, you can really pretty quickly, even with lots of stars, I think, point in on where Polaris should be. And then you just get down and sort of line up your star tracker and make sure it's it's pointed right. The other thing is use your latitude adjustment on the equatorial wedge to really dial in your latitude as closely as possible before starting with any of this, because then you know you're at least correct up down and you just have to get it uh, correct sort of left right, which again, you can do sort of looking at the constellations. So hope that helps. Okay, Alex O uh, sent me an image, and this is again untracked from of the Andromeda Galaxy, and again taken at 200 millimeter focal length. I love the colors; uh, it looks really good. The blues and the sort of neutral uh, whitish brown and the star color looks good. Um, I think for my taste, uh, the Topaz Denoise AI is too much, and I don't usually use Topaz Denoise AI on untracked images because it's just not, I just don't find it works very well. Um, so what it does is it, it, it takes noise and it blurs it and it, but it also sharpens some of the noise so that it looks like signal. Um, so anyways, for untracked stuff, I'd rather use the camera raw filter here for denoising. Um, so here's sort of my take and yes, it does look noisier than yours, but yours also has sort of a lot of um, blur uh, that looks sort of strange to my eye. Um, so anyways, I think uh, camera raw filter is safer than Topaz. Um, you know, I, I personally only use Topaz if it's something like a 30 plus hour integration and I'm just using it very uh, carefully, like it two to three percent strength um otherwise i think that it sort of makes a, a mess of things a little bit um but i think that uh you're definitely on the on the right track here and uh keep it up i think that the the color uh variety you got here for an untracked shot is is really nice okay anador sent a very nice milky way image uh at 50 millimeters with a Canon M mirrorless camera and a cheap 50 millimeter lens. And again, I love wide fields that aren't afraid of really showing off how many stars there are um, when we just let our cameras expose uh, for those smaller stars um, that we can't see visually, just that like we're looking up at this night sky doesn't look like this because we're not seeing all those small stars. I do have a few very small tweaks um, one is I would reduce the chromatic aberration. And this is, again, with just a bit of that camera raw filter. I can open it up here to show you what it looks like. One sec. And so the chromatic aberration fixer is called D-Fringe. It's under optics. And you just play around with these sliders um, to fix it. Um, but doing that, uh, you know, taking the chromatic aberration out, turned the image a little bit greenish, at least on my monitor. So I uh, fixed the color balance 
And then I just brought down the overall brightness of the image just a little bit with curves like that. Andrea shot this image of my favorite constellation, Cygnus, and mentioned it was their first image done with a star tracker. Andrea used a Nikon 3100 and a Nikon 50 millimeter f1.8. Uh, I think that's the Nikon version of the Nifty 50. And was wondering about the stars being misshapen um, away from center and Yes, this is a very common thing with almost all lenses, but especially wider angle lenses. So 50 millimeters and wider, you're going to see more distortion uh, as you get away from center. Um, generally, uh, so, you know, we can say that certain lenses are better or worse. It's not that all lenses perform the exact same way. Um, so sometimes even very expensive lenses that are great for normal photography are really bad under the stars in terms of star distortion. Um, but now that you have the star tracker, I'd probably look into something like the Samyang 135 F2 lens. It's a very good lens for astrophotography with really minimal distortion uh, considering the price of that lens. It's like uh, around $500 or even $450. Um, and so there are better lenses out there, but a lot of times, you know, the really good lenses for astrophotography, like the Sigma Art series, are over $1,000. So the Samyang 135 is really very good for considering its price. Um, and, and, and once you <laughs> start getting into, like, trying to get to perfection, you're just going to be going at higher and higher prices to eco. Just a little bit better star performance. Um, but I should say that I think that this looks better actually than the Canon Nifty 50, and it's a very nice image uh, with really uh, nice color and uh, restrained processing. So thanks for sending it in. Okay, and Andres uh, M, or first Andres, um, this Okay, Andres, uh, this is a really cool photo, very inspiring to me because it's I, something that I'd like to try myself. This is the trapezium region of Orion. So just that really bright core of Orion that most of us usually blow out to just pure white. Um, but you can see it's a really interesting color, the green greenish color of nebulosity. And that's the true color of it. Um, this was shot using an eight inch reflector telescope without tracking. Uh, from the middle of a city, a white zone in terms of light pollution, and it's 50 photos at one second each at ISO 200. And so this should give you an idea of how uh, the trapezium is pretty unique and how bright it is for a deep sky object. So it's really the perfect target to try um, untracked with a telescope, so high focal length. Um, and I don't really have any critique. I love this. It's a perfect uh, natural color shot. The trapezium should be this uh, sort of sea green um, with a little bit of the red uh, hydrogen alpha coming through. And then the goal when you're shooting the trapezium is to split these four stars uh, in the trapezium cluster. Um, and they're clearly separated here. So great job. Okay, another Andres sent me an Andromeda done with a zoom lens set to 135 millimeter focal length and using a Celestron CG3 mount with uh, motors added to it. And this was done from a Bortal 5 sky. And Andres mentioned maybe having overdone the star reduction. Um, so maybe, but I, I've definitely seen uh, star reduction um, done sort of way too much where you're seeing artifacts or it just looks very unnatural. And this doesn't look that unnatural to me. So I think it's pretty tasteful, especially for this high contrast uh, look that you're going for. And my one critique actually has to do with the saturation in the galaxy. Um, I think that the saturation boost to the galaxy worked out pretty well um, to the outer uh, arms and things like that. Um, because the hot blue stars uh, out here um, really need uh, sort of a saturation boost. Um, but as we go in towards the core, some of these colors are starting to look a little bit um, 
unnatural, like an unnatural orange that shouldn't, isn't quite right. Um, and this is sort of nitpicking, but it's just happened to me many times, so that's why I recognize it. So a quick fix would be just to select the part of the galaxy where it feels like a little bit too much saturation and bring it down a little bit. Um, but other than that, very nice job. Okay, Andrew. Andrew shot this with a modded Nikon D850 and an L enhance filter on the Red Cat telescope. And Andrew asked about the colors and if they looked natural and was worried about oversaturating. And I mean, no, the colors don't look natural in that the HA emissions are gold uh, when they should be red, um, but or a slight pinkish, I guess, because there's so much O3 in this region. Um, but people use the word natural in all kinds of different ways. And Andrew put it in quotes. So I think he understood that there isn't anything. This is this picture isn't anything like true color of the nebulosity. Um, so maybe the question is more, does it feel natural? And I think it does. I think this uh, doesn't look oversaturated. And I like the amount of color variety, um, like over here in the Seder butterfly region. It looks really nice. Um, and we're also seeing more uh, greens uh, over here. While in the O3 area, we have just more of like a straight up blue. And so not lots of nice color varieties and uh, good amount of contrast, um, be, meaning not too much contrast. Like I love when you can see uh, the natural color of the sky is a little bit brighter than some of the dark nebulosities. Um, and so I think you really nailed the contrast, which is what helps it feel natural and not uh, like overdone. So good job. Okay, here we have a photo by Andrea. Um, and Andrea shot this untracked with a Nikon DSLR and a Sigma zoom lens. And it's a conjunction of Mars, this bright object right there, and the Pleiades star cluster. And Andrea mentioned that this is their second astrophoto ever, and it was stacked, um, but they didn't do much further processing. And I don't blame them. Um, these conjunctions of planets and deep sky objects are very difficult because the planet is so much brighter than the deep sky object. So it's challenging to retain color on the planet because we want to see like that's the red planet Mars while trying to bring out any detail on the DSO. Um, so I think this is a good balance here um, and nice job capturing this event. Andy Ben did a bunch of 10 second exposures tracked with a Skywatcher HEQ5 and a Skywatcher 80 millimeter refractor and Sony mirrorless camera. And I think the processing is very good. Um, I did look at the raw data and I can see that the reason the background is as dark as it is is because you're trying to hide walking noise. And walking noise is very annoying. It's this diagonal uh, noise. And the only really effective way to get rid of it is to dither. Um, or to really nail polar alignment, I suppose, which, but dithering is only practical once you've added auto guiding. But as soon as you do add a guide scope and guide camera to your kit, then you should immediately work on figuring out dithering because it would really help eliminate uh, walking noise. Um, I also suspect that taking longer than 10 second exposures would help with walking noise uh, because then you're burying the noise in more signal. So even without guiding, I think that would help. Um, and I'm pretty sure with your Skywatcher HEQ5 and that telescope, you should be able to go up to 30 seconds, no problem, without any kind of trailing issues from the periodic error of the mount. Um, but other than that, really nice job. The focus looks uh, very good and it's very uh, sharp, uh, nice picture of uh, a perfect uh, pair of galaxies to try with your setup. Okay, Angelo shot Andromeda with a Canon 60D Tamron zoom lens and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And Angelo asked about image acquisition, feeling that his shots were not as detailed as they could be. 
Um, so what stood out to me here on close inspection, let me zoom in just a little bit, is that all of the stars are a little bit trailed from left to right and then just a little bit pointing in the upper to the upper right corner. And when all the stars are trailed in the same direction like this, um, that is that means that there's some issue with tracking. So it could be polar alignment. It could just be that the the mount can't handle uh, sub exposures as long as you're doing. Angela mentioned they were doing 90 second sub exposures. So my first advice is to try 60 seconds or even 30 seconds. And then, um, you know, you're, you're shooting at F 2.8. If you want to try to match uh, exposure with the shorter exposures, then you can just bump ISO. Um, and uh, that, that method of just using shorter exposures um, is I think the best way to avoid this kind of trailing um, other than just really practicing polar alignment, making sure you have good balance, nothing is loose or dragging on the tracker. Um, and I think that's um, uh, an important one. It, you know, loose, loose things could be like the wedge could be loose. Just make sure everything is really tight, nail polar alignment. And then take some test exposure. See if you can maybe get up to 90 seconds. But if you zoom in and you see any trailing, then back it off to 60 seconds or 30 seconds. And that will help with uh, detail too. If you're if you're not trailing, it's not just that the stars will be rounder, but you'll see more detail in the objects. Okay, Anker uh, shot the Markarian chain of galaxies. And Anker mentioned after going full spectrum modification, meaning taking out some filters out of the camera, um, they noticed these artifacts. I think they mean like this here and this here. I'm not sure what this is about, but I don't think that's what they mean. I think they mean these little like white smudges. Um, on their photos. Um, so I suspect these little uh, smudges have something to do with some physical thing on the sensor, maybe. Um, I mean, dust is usually dark, so I'm not sure why they're bright, but maybe maybe they were dark and then with flats, the flats overcorrected and they became bright. But anyways, that's my best guess is that there's something physically uh, going on with the sensor dust or something like that um, to Test that theory, try a manual air blower, never use compressed air, but just like a manual rocket blower. Hold the camera upside down so that the dust can fall out and then take a long exposure, blow the air manually onto the sensor um, and see if you can dislodge any dust. If that doesn't work, um, which I'm not sure if it will, um, but it's always good to do that first anyways, then get order one of these sensor cleaning kits, um, which will be sort of a one-time use thing with some liquid uh, to help clean the sensor and see if that helps. Okay, Anurag sent in an image of M81 and M82 Bodes and Cigar. This is LRGB uh, filtered plus HA filter, and it was taken with a refractor ZWO mono camera. And I think this is really uh, well done. You know, it's a very high contrast, high saturation look, but they, they did it well. And Anurag asked about the integrated flux nebula, IFN, which is this very dim um, background dust kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's especially strong in this area of the sky. So to see if I could find any, I stretched the heck out of the, uh, the luminance filter, because that's where you would probably see it first. And I didn't really see much of it there. Um, but what I did find in stretching the loom like this is lots of reflection issues. These rings are uh, sure signs of reflection issues. So check your, your optical tube, your spacers, make sure that everything is a matte flat black to try to get rid of those. Um, there's also this big obvious, uh, I don't know, dust spot or something here. I don't know what that is, um, but and I'm surprised that didn't get taken out with flats. Um, and I, I'm not sure also how you dealt with all with that one, especially in processing the photo. Um, but it, it's uh, it's something I would I would look at with your system is, is try to figure out some of these 
uh, rings and, and reflections. Um, other than that, let me see what I think about this picture. I think the color balance is pretty good. I think you could have relied on the luminance uh, just a bit more to bring out detail and keep the saturation of the HA boosted red um, a little bit lower. So lower the saturation on these on these reds. I know that it was exciting to bring those out and I think they look pretty good in the cigar. On the bodes, I think they look a little bit too popping. Like they're they're not part of the galaxy anymore. Like it looks almost like they're like on top uh, pasted on or something. Uh, so that's it. I think it's uh, really well done and I would just look at what's going on with uh, with this, these rings. I've had them before and they were my spacers were just a little too shiny. Even though they were black spacers, I painted them with matte black paint and I got rid of those rings. Okay, Arash uh, shot the Pelican Nebula with an L Enhance filter and asked about star elongation on the corners, suspecting tilt. Uh, so I agree. Um, and there might be some tilt because um, if I look at the center, they look pretty round. If I look in the corners, I can see a little bit of elongation. Um, so that could be tilt. I don't know. It, might, it could also be a back focus issue. Just make sure um, you know your your back focus is really right on. Um, I, I, I'm, you probably have already looked into that, but just it's something to look into. You know, it might that might just be the best you can do. You could try uh, fixing uh, tilt with you know foil tape or something like that, but I, I'm usually too lazy to to do that. Anyways, uh, it's, I don't think it's too bad in terms of processing. I just think this could go further. Um, use more. You could use more stretching. So I'm just going to put a curves adjustment on here. Just to show you that even just something like that on the JPEG, I think there's a lot more data uh, in here. Um, the other thing I'd say is uh, I'm not sure if I I like this composition just because you have part of the North America over here, um, but then sort of nothing over here on this side of the pelican. So I just wonder if you could have done something a little bit more interesting compositionally. But I think the data looks really nice. I mean, I. I, to me, the slight elongation doesn't really bother me, but I know some people it does. So if you, you can try to figure it out, but I think the focus is good um, and it looks pretty uh, pretty clean. Even when I just apply the stretch to the JPEG, I still think it looks pretty clean. Okay, another Arash uh, sent the North America and Pelican taken with a Canon T3i and a Canon 200 millimeter prime lens on a star tracker and was asking about how to best bring out emission nebulae with a stock camera. Well, I think you did a really good job of it here. Um, the only thing is I think we just need to finesse the processing a little bit to get rid of the green uh, noise and the, the chromatic aberration that's really common with this uh, lens, the sort of see the sort of like orangish red around a lot of the stars. And so I just did that here just to show you what it looks like. Um, and it's really great data. So I would just keep working on processing it because you've captured a lot of nice sort of O3 signal uh, the, and the HA signal, um, which is common uh, with a stock camera and I think can make a really beautiful photo of this uh, region as you have done here. Um, so I just used my normal processing technique where I took the photo, I made a starless version with Starnet++, I increased uh, color with curves and saturation, I added the stars back in, and on this stars layer I screen blended it and also applied the defringing with camera raw filter, and then I did a final uh, reset of the black point. Okay, next up we have Arn, and Arn did a very nice wide field on the Cygnus region, uh, focusing sort of on Seder, centering on Seder. And 
Uh, I think that Arn framed it this way so that they could include the supernova remnant, uh, the Cygnus loop or the Veil Nebula, whatever you want to call it, down here. Um, but it doesn't come across super well. Um, but And then it also means that because you framed it this way, uh, the North America Nebula is sort of awkwardly cropped on this side. Um, so I think I would have preferred a normal... Um, horizontal rotation, even if it meant cutting off the Cygnus loop, uh, but getting more of the North America. Uh, so that's my only critique is just the, is the, the framing and the rotation. But, uh, I think other than that, it looks, it looks really good. And, uh, especially for that wind up tracker, which it seems like a lot of fun. And I hope to use this summer. Okay. Speaking of the veil nebula or the Cygnus loop, uh, we, so, so I should, explain what I mean by that you know we sometimes we say the eastern and western veil nebula but then when you when you shoot the whole thing with the Fleming Pickering triangle and all that you could call it the Cygnus loop supernova remnant so if you hear me just say Cygnus loop that's what I mean uh it includes all of the pieces of the veil um this is uh, uh pictures by Arthur or Arthur I'm not sure uh and Arthur Arthur ugh. And uh, this picture of the object, it was done by Archer, and Archer did this with an acromat, meaning a, a doublet telescope that's um, not as corrected as, a, as, an, as an APO. Um, and uh, they did it with a stock Nikon D610. So that's very impressive to shoot the veil with a stock DSLR. And Archer mentioned um, just having gotten a flattener for the telescope and that made a big difference. Yes. So if you're using an acromat, uh, getting a flattener will really help, um, because, uh, the stars will clean up a lot. Uh, so, uh, anyways, um, I think this is a very nice image. It's very impressive how much detail they got in the, uh, Fleming Pickering triangle here. Uh, if you, you know, if you've picked that up, uh, with a stock DSLR, you're doing something right. And I think that uh, the star reduction is pretty good too. It's, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it makes the small stars look a little bit like noise, but that's really uh, sort of the best you can do for the Veil Nebula region because it's so packed with these small stars. So I think this is a, is well done in terms of the star reduction. Okay, Ariane shot uh, this with the Nikon D5300 DSLR and a Nikon 85mm lens, no tracker from a Bortle 5 area, and they sent two versions. This one, which looks good, and then this other one where they said they stretched it really aggressively to try to pick up the Horsehead Nebula here. And yes, I do uh, see it, um, but then they mentioned that with this version, the noise and the color banding um, and all that is pretty bad. And yeah, that's a that's a common problem with uh, untracked is that uh, when you're you starved for signal and you try to boost it up in, in post processing, you're also bringing up the noise and the any any problems with the camera sensor. Anyways, Ariane said they shot this at ISO 800, so I'd suggest trying a higher ISO. Might not help, but it's worth a shot. And of course, if you can get anywhere even darker than portal five, that can also help with noise issues. I've found doesn't, doesn't intuitively make sense, but I, I found that, um, the reason it does work is because when you're at a very dark spot, then you're doing less in processing to subtract sort of like light pollution gradients and things like that. And, uh, then, the light pollution itself is a signal that comes with its own noise. So going to a darker place can help with uh, noise in your image as well. Uh, but I agree with you that this one where you got the flame, but the horse head is pretty much invisible is still a nicer uh, process uh, overall. Okay. And then we have Asa and Asa sent this uh, Milky Way image over a rock formation and said the rock was lit up by cars and by a town below. And I like it, especially the natural green air glow down here that was not processed out. I think that looks really cool. 
Um, the, the overall brightness of the image makes me feel like it's not very naturalistic. Um, so, you know, this is just a JPEG, but let me just try taking down the brightness here. Something like that, I think, is where I would put it. So, you know, this is all about taste, but, I, you know, and, and personal preference. But I, I like a sort of darker, moodier Milky Way image. And I think that by bringing down the brightness a lot like that, it also actually makes the the rock formation look more dramatic and make it, even though I know it was lit up by cars and towns and everything, it makes it look more like night, you know? Um, with it at full brightness like this, it almost feels like a Milky Way uh, afternoon or something. So I, I like to have some, some dark blacks in my night shots. Astro shot this untracked with a stock DSLR and kit lens, and it's definitely a difficult object to do with a kit lens and an unmodified stock DSLR. So it's great that we're seeing some structure here in the North America nebula. I did take a look at the raw frame, and I think this is good processing for what you had. My only suggestions are, one, to take more flats, uh, I mean, to take more lights if you can. Uh, this was 202 lights or sub exposures and going up to 500, I think would make a big difference um, or even more if you can. And then my other suggestion is if you haven't tried the Orion Nebula yet, that's a winter object. Well, this is a summer object. So maybe uh, since this video is coming out in the winter, it'd be a good option for you right now. It's much, much brighter than the North America Nebula, so it'll be much easier to bring out untracked compared to North America. But otherwise, uh, nice job. It looks uh, pretty well focused and, uh, and and pretty good for a, for a kit lens. So Astrobrick sent an image of Andromeda shot from a very light polluted sky, and this is 400 lights at three seconds each at f2 on a star adventurer with a Sony camera and a zoom lens. And um, they had a bunch of questions about sort of the, the performance of this lens. What I'd really recommend with a lens like this is, and here's just a more sort of neutral um, uh, stretch that I did just to show uh, the, the massive distortion. Um, is to stop down the lens because at, at F2, I'm guessing that's pretty probably wide open or close to wide open. So try stopping it down to like F5 and um, take longer exposures. So uh, if it, three seconds ISO 800, if you stop down to F5 or F5.6 or something like that, um, and then exposing longer, I think you might get a lot better performance out of it um, and not see so much, you know, weird stars, especially away from center. Um, that would also help with noise to, because three seconds is pretty short. Um, if you did like 30 seconds, you know, that might be a combination of bringing down the ISO and the, the aperture. But uh, I think that would be worth trying before you uh, feel like you need another lens. Okay, Astro Abood 7 took this image of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulae. And my main suggestion is. Um, just to do a little bit less with the processing here um, and, and specifically doing less with star reduction and noise reduction. So uh, if you were at like, let's say 80% on those things, star reduction and noise reduction, uh, if you're at 80%, try 30%. Um, and especially the, the noise reduction, I find can give it sort of a an artificial look where some parts are super smooth and then other parts are more crunchy. And so um, I did just look at your raw data and the data actually looks really good. Um, you know, like there's a lot of detail in here, but the what's really holding it back is the uh, huge vignetting and, and, and there's like a ring here too. So I think what you could, what would really help is flat fielding. So if you can figure out how to get a really good flat, uh, master flat frame to calibrate your lights with, uh, that would really help um, uh, 
get cleaner, cleaner data. So keep trying, try figure, try to figure out flats and, and make them uh, work better uh, and, uh, and go from there. Okay, Astro Amateur 1 captured Central Cygnus with a stock Canon T3i and a Canon Nifty 50 on a Skywatcher Star Adventure, and they asked why their colors seemed unusual. Um, I think it's it's normal not to get a lot of red with a stock camera, um, although you could just boost the red channel a bit in processing to bring it out. Other than that, I think you just stretch the data too hard, um, bringing up everything a little bit too much. Um, and uh, the noise beca you know, becomes so bright here uh, that it's hard to tell what's noise and what's a star. Um, uh, so anyways, I, I did it. Here's my take on your data. I didn't really bring out the reds too much, but maybe a little bit more than you have them here. They look a little bit more orange in yours. And then the main thing I focused on is just um, a different uh, stretch. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you stretch it not as aggressively, then the noise won't take over the image so much. Uh, but you can see that you can still get a lot of nebular detail, uh, you know, even uh, with just your nifty 50 lens. Uh, this is the starless. I applied some curves and saturation, put the stars on top as a screen blend, and then reset the black point. And, you know, this, I'm going to, that's my sort of standard just sort of test of what the data looks like. You know, I might do more in processing, but just to show people uh, who are shooting wide field like this sort of what they have, I find that this is a good way to do it. Just go starless, apply a little saturation to the starless, screen blend the stars on and and reset the black point. You can really get an idea of what's what's in the field that way. Okay. Astro Creations sent this image of the Lagoon Nebula done with a Canon 40D, a Celestron Power Seeker 70 millimeter telescope, and an Orion Astro View mount. So the, all of that is, you know, uh, what I'd call budget gear. It's it's, uh, but for budget gear, this is really well done. It looks really cool. I really enjoy the framing of the Lagoon as this vertical feature up and down. I rarely see it that way. Um, I usually see it turned 90 degrees clockwise, I guess, from here. Um, but this orientation gives it a, a different feel. Um, my only suggestion is in the stretch to see if you can go for a little less contrast um, and a bit brighter overall in the shadows. Um, and I know you said that you had a lot of red noise and things like that. so. Um, but I wonder if you, when you say red noise, if what you were seeing was really noise or just the Milky Way, because the lagoon is smack dab in many stars that are sort of this sort of like orangish, reddish color. Um, and so it can seem like noise, you know, especially over here when it really isn't. Um, so I, I just play around with different stretches, um, bringing out uh, things with a little bit um, less contrast is a meaning that, you know, not making the sky so dark and the uh, bright parts of the nebula so bright, but just more in between where the mids are coming out a bit more. Okay, Astro Jeff. Astro, this is Astro Jeff's first astro photograph. Very impressive, much better than mine was, I think. Um, it was shot with a Rokinon 135 millimeter lens and a full spectrum Canon DSLR on a star tracker. And I think that the focus um, could be a little bit improved. It's either that or, or maybe that the, the um, you should use a clip-in uh, IR cut filter. Um, just there's just so many stars in this region, and then the eye. If if you have a full spectrum camera, the the infrared picks up so many more. Um, but. Uh, and in the in the deep red, so then that can give a color balance shift too. So I'd try IR cut filter, and then also maybe just uh, I'm not sure if the focus is is quite right. Um, you also mentioned wanting to work on color balance, which I agree. It's a little bit um, too magenta ish, reddish. Um, so I just took your data and tried to make it a more neutral. 
uh, color. I don't think I got it quite right, but it's, it's more neutral maybe. Maybe now I'm going a little too blue. Um, but I just do it by eye. And uh, it takes practice to get color balance right. You know, I look at the, the histogram sometimes, sort of see are the channels lined up over here on the left-hand side. Uh, that gives you at least a good black balance. The white balance is harder. There are tools um, in PixInsight and Cyril for, for getting the white balance right. But at least in Photoshop, you can get the black balance just by sort of lining up the left-hand edge of the color channels. So another Southern Hemisphere Nebula. This is, you know, I, I love these because they're a treat for me to see something different, uh, something I've never seen before or been able to photograph myself. And I think this looks really nice. Uh, this is by astrogirl.au. And astrogirl.au asked about getting the color right, especially the HA looking to orange. Um, and astrogirl.au uses PixInsight. So let me actually jump over to PixInsight for this. Okay, so I'd actually be prefer to do this in Photoshop, but I can do it in PixInsight here since that's what astrogirl.au uses. I'm just working off the JPEG, but what I would do if you see it looks too orange is I would go to the scripts, utilities, and color mask. Here's the color mask script. I'm just gonna click the red button and that picks sort of the hues that are, that considers red. And click okay. It's gonna make a mask. Okay, there's our mask of everything in the image that is red. And then I'm just going to apply that to this image just by dragging it over here like this. And then let's go into the mask menu and nope, click on this image, turn, go into the mask menu, click off show mask so we can see what we're doing. And then we're going to open up the curves transformation under processes. And then I'm gonna click into the blue curve Let's open up a preview so we can see what we're doing. Nope, not on that, on this one. There we go. And now with this blue curve, I'm going to just start adding blue to the reds. And remember we've masked it so that white is what's what it's being applied to, black is not being applied to, so it's not going to change the color balance in anything but the reds. And then I'm just gonna take a blue curve and do something like that. Just take it about one, make a point about one quarter of the way over and raise it a little bit and apply that. Okay, and then let's see the before and after. So here's before, too much orange, adding blue just to the reds, and it looks like that. And that's, I think, a much closer to a, a natural HA response, including the H beta part of the spectrum. Um, and the reason you're, I'm adding blue, if you see too much orange, is that blue is opposite on the color wheel to orange. So by adding blue to red, we're basically uh, taking away orange uh, or making it less orange. And it, it, it gets to this more sort of pinkish uh, red, which, as I mentioned, I think uh, could be the O3, if there isn't any O3 in this object, or it could be the H beta. But in any case, I think it looks... The bluish red uh, can look better than the orangish red, but it depends on the photo. But I think in this one, uh, it does help. So hopefully that uh, made sense. I'm less experienced with showing how things work in PixInsight, even though I do know the program pretty well. Uh, I, I feel like sometimes I'm bumbling around a little bit. So thanks for sending this in, astrogirl.au. Okay, next up we have Astrohio. Astrohio sent in an image of the pelican and the Cygnus wall. And I really like this uh, framing and orientation, this vertical crop with the, uh, it's sort of like, it shows the Cygnus wall and the pel this bright part of the pelican, how they sort of mirror each other, uh, which I've never really seen exactly like this, uh, but it looks really cool. Um, 
I think for me, the the star reduction and especially the contrast have gone too far. Um, so with the star reduction, it feels like uh, maybe you felt you needed to push it because the focus wasn't so good. I'm not, because uh, if I zoom in on the stars here, I feel like I can sort of see their donuts. Um, so my guess is maybe you, um, you did a lot of star reduction but the, uh, I, re I, sh I should say I really like the color palette. I just think that uh, if it was a little bit uh, less contrast, it might look even better. But I, I do like the, the sort of unusual uh, color palette. Okay. Uh, Astro Hunting Ed took this image of Orion with a stock Canon T7, an ultra high contrast filter, and a nifty 50 lens on Star Adventure. And uh, definitely pulled out some nice detail. I think, let me zoom in to make sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so there's definitely a bug in your processing here where you use the wrong um, debayer pattern or it's not like necessarily that you use the wrong debayer pattern, but the program you were using used the wrong one. And the way that I know that is because when you see sort of the grid here in certain places, like the grid of pixels, and then when you look at the colors of the the nebulae when they're sort of reversed so this should be red the horse head but it's green that means that the wrong de bear pattern was chosen and the pixels that should have been coded as red were coded as green and so forth anyways um i think you mentioned you use cyril so if cyril did this automatically you're going to have to find the setting in cyril to manually override the de bear pattern so instead of putting it in auto um you should for the T7 put it on RGGB. Um, uh, but if that doesn't work, depending on which version of LibRaw you use, I'm just reading this online, uh, you might need to apply the GBRG. Um, anyways, just, just try it out uh, on a few samples. And once you figure it out, uh, then the Barnard's loop uh, you know, you have here, you've caught here and the, and the horse head and stuff like that should appear more uh, red than green. And that will be your your sign that you've, you've found the right Bayer pattern. Okay, Astro Lux brings us a photo done with the telephoto lens on a Huawei phone, like the one I have here, piggybacking it on an equatorial mount. And I think this is a very cool idea and one that I wanna try. I've only tried the normal wide angle lens on my Huawei phone on, on the Milky Way. This is with the telephoto lens, which is more like a 50 millimeter equivalent. And for anyone that doesn't recognize this object, this is the Ro Ofuyuki cloud complex. You can sort of see the dark streamers there. And uh, this is the Ofuyuki uh, reflection nebula, the blue reflection nebula there. Um, and I think this is a really beautifully vibrant star field for a cell phone. I would not expect to get these kinds of colors out of the stars from a cell phone. Um, and so that's something that impresses me. I want to try to do more with my phone after after seeing this uh, photo. So thanks for sending it in, Astro Lux. Okay, next we have Astro Swank. And Astro Swank processed this in Cyril. S-I-R-I-L, which is a really good free program for uh, processing. And then they've also brought it into Photoshop, um, but they're wondering how to make it less green in Photoshop. So let me show you how I would go about this. Uh, it's not gonna be perfect since I've sort of did it quickly, but um, it gives you an idea. Um, so I'm gonna start with a uh, saturation adjustment layer. So I'm just gonna add that. And what this does is I just went into, instead of setting it to master, I set it to greens. And then I'm just going, I just played around with the hue of the greens. So you can see, you can sort of make them any color. And I'm just gonna make them a sort of golden yellow. Now you can see there's a lot of green left still in when you do this, but uh, it gets us uh, somewhere, a better starting point than it being just completely green like that. Then I just applied a curve, uh, both the RGB and the green curve, just bringing them both over 
so that the sky is darker and more neutral. Okay, and then next I'm gonna add a selective color and this is where it gets really fun. So we're gonna go into green, so we're gonna take out all the yellow, uh, make it and add 100% cyan. So just to show you what that does, And then we're gonna go into the yellows after that and mess around with those as well. You can see like this. And also go into the cyan and take out the yellow and that's gonna get us closer to this central part being blue, but we're gonna to have to do it again. So we do it again in this one and now it's truly blue. We do the same kind of thing with uh, yellows we keep adding magenta to yellows to get it closer to this sort of golden orange um did i do anything else here yeah kept keep taking yellow out of green this time i also took cyan out of green and we're at this point getting to a pretty good uh cool like sho look and so then i'm going to add saturation oh i think that's a bit too much let me add a little bit less there we go and finally, a final uh, reset curve to the black point. And actually, I'm going to take out a little bit more green yet again. I don't know, something like that. Again, as I said, I'm doing this pretty quickly, but it gives you an idea of how to go from uh, very green all over to something that looks more like an SHO look with this data. Okay, next up we have AstroWim, and AstroWim sent me a photo of Lagoon and Triffid taken with a Panasonic GX9 and lens on a Star Tracker. And they were wondering about bringing out the blue in the field. Um, well, AstroWim definitely has some here. I see the the blue reflection part of the Trifid there. Um, but Astrowim did send me their data, so let's see what I could do with it. Here we go. Um, and I didn't do much here. I just did my first sort of step in processing, which is trying to get the color balance right when stretching um, and uh, getting rid of major gradients, uh, but just applying a stretch to see what was there. So this is just looking at the data in a more raw state than uh, this finished one. Um, but you can see that there is a lot of blue uh, reflection all around. And there's also some blue in the lagoon um, and in the stars and things like that. Uh, so you could process it here uh, to your liking. Um, but uh, it's really just about looking and trying to preserve data as you as you stretch and and not crush anything. Uh, so just being careful with your your black level because I mean this is a finished picture, but your black level is pretty black. So uh, just uh, trying to be sort of neutral and and just keep looking at these. Um, ooh, I can see actually I have too much uh, green in the background there. So let's see what happens if I adjust the green a little bit. Oops, wrong way. Yeah, cut that part out. So the the key thing is just if you if you want to get more of the faint blue nebulosity, you're going to have to adjust your black level to get more of it in. But that also means maybe bringing out more of the noise and the fainter stars. So there's always trade-offs here. Okay, AT Astrophotography processed a single four minute shot that I had taken and previously shared in a video called Single Shot Challenge. And I like this take on the processing. It's very creative. I like that they went with a, a vertical framing and added these star spikes on all the bright stars. Uh, especially works well, I think, on these belt stars to give the uh, picture an interesting focus at the top there. To give you an idea of how different this is from the processing I shared, this is my processing. It looks very different because I brought out a lot of this 
uh, tried to bring out a lot of this brown dust. Uh, so these are processed from the sing same single four minute shot just to show you how big of a difference processing can make in astrophotography to get different kinds of presentations. All right, Augie uh, is pretty new to astrophotography and did this with a stock DSLR and lens on a star tracker. And this framing with the, the leading line uh, here, this dark nebula up into North America, and then the dark nebula sort of continues out there into the that upper corner, I think is ingenious. I haven't seen it too much and it, it looks really good. Um, overall, I'd say this photo looks too bright. Um, I, I usually like brighter versus darker because then I can see what's really there. But of course, it also highlights all the issues uh, in the picture, like noise and things like that. Augie did send their data and I took a stab at it there. I tried to keep the picture pretty bright. Um, uh, it, it looks a little bit funky um but i was basically just trying to get rid of some of these uh gradients and uh un uneven uh field issues um, i did start with pix insights automatic background extraction tool to do that um, but if you don't want to spend money on pix insight uh, there is a free version in Cyril sir S-I-R-I-L, uh, the background extraction tool in Cyril works pretty well too. But again, very nice image, love the framing, um, and it shows what can be done with pretty basic equipment. This was 90 minutes with a stock Canon DSLR, 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens on an iOptron Skyguider Pro from a Bortle 4 Sky. Okay. Aussie Astro. Aussie Astro is a 13 year old astrophotographer from Australia who took this image of the lagoon and Triffid with an Olympus camera and lens on an EQ1 mount with an RA motor drive. And they were wondering about making this image better and sharper. So let's zoom in just a bit. Okay. And um, so what stands out in terms of uh, sharpness is that the all the stars are trailed just a little bit left to right, um, meaning there's a tracking issue, either tracking or polar alignment, one of the two probably, um, or maybe a combination of both. Um, and trailing, besides just making the stars a little bit out of round, um, will also hurt image sharpness because uh, the small details that you're going to get in the nebula and stuff like that are, uh, can also get a little bit blurred out left to right. Um, uh, Aussie Astro said this was 60 images at 30 seconds each at 150 millimeter focal length. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, I'm not sure if the EQ1 is capable of that. It probably should be, but um, so may maybe just work on your polar alignment. Uh, I know that's harder in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you know, from Australia. So maybe that maybe that's the issue. Uh, but when you think you have polar alignment down, my next tip is um, if if is when you're shooting, try different exposure lengths. So try 30 seconds. Try to zoom in on the camera. Make sure that the stars are round, zoomed all the way in. If they're not, then then bump it down. Try 20 seconds. Try 15 seconds. And because it's going to get you a better image overall to shoot shorter sub-exposures with round stars versus longer sub-exposures with, uh, with trailed stars. But keep it up and uh, looking forward to seeing more from you. Barney sent this image of Andromeda. Uh, Barney said they are new to astrophotography and they have an EQ5 mount and don't have a polar alignment scope yet. So they're limited to shorter exposures. This is 30 minutes total from a red zone with a Canon DSLR and a zoom lens. And they're wondering about how to get more detail into that, into this shot. Well, uh, there are a few different ways. Uh, the main thing is the more light pollution have, the more you should focus on just getting lots and lots of total time on the object. So 30 minutes from a red zone is just barely enough, I'd say, to, you know, uh, be passable. Like, you know, this image is definitely getting some detail. Um, 
but uh, you know, extending that to one hour, two hours, ten hours, whatever uh, is always going to help. Um, the other thing I'd say is uh, be careful with uh, noise reduction because that's going to blur detail, and I think that uh, you went a little too far with the blurring uh, effects here, uh, which hurts hurts detail. Okay. Bear. Bear sent this image of Orion and the Running Man nebulae and asked if the reason uh, the flats correction didn't work well is because they didn't use enough flats. Uh, uh, they used 20 flats. No, I don't think that's the issue. It's much more likely that the way that you're taking the flats needs to be tweaked in some way. So uh, let's see if I really stretch the JPEG here. Let me do this. Okay, um, you can see it's it's darker in the center uh, and then a little brighter along the corners. Uh, so that means the flats are overcorrecting uh, for one reason or another. And the the first thing I'd try if your you know flats are overcorrecting is just uh, decreasing the exposure time on the flats. So if you were at half a second, try a quarter of a second. If you're using like a flats wizard in a, in a program, you know, if you can see the ADU value, try having that. Um, uh, you know, an another thing to try is just stack your lights without any calibrations frames and see if you have this issue of the bright corners, because it's probably flats, but maybe it's not. Uh, so stack with just darks, check add darks and bias and flats check this kind of thing this is what I, I tend to tell people to do for calibration issues is try to try to needle it down to what actually is is causing the problem probably probably your problem is flats given the corners uh being the issue but you never know okay ben uh took this image of the andromeda galaxy with a samyang 135 millimeter f2 lens on a star tracker and this looks really cool i think um, ben saw this meteor strike uh right here which is a really nice green meteor in one of his frames and then added that back in after stacking um Ben did send in a stack with flats and one without flats, and then the stack with flats got messed up and removed a lot of the stars. I don't know why that would have happened, um, but I think it demonstrates something important, which is if you think you have good photos, you know, if you're looking through your individual lights, your individual sub exposures, and they all look good, and then after stacking, something very strange happens, then, like I said in the past, critique the thing to do is try eliminating calibration frames and seeing if you can find where the problem is um uh, so the and then you try to fix the calibration frame so the lesson isn't don't ever take flats it's that you know you have to work on figuring out why uh something wrong happened um and that, that that's just a lot of trial and error i can't i can't usually tell someone exactly what to do next, but they, they just have to try out different things. Uh, and uh, if I was there with you, maybe I could figure it out. But uh, otherwise, I just tell people just to experiment and it, you'll get there eventually. Okay, another Ben uh, took this nice image of the Lagoon and Triffid with a camera lens and asked about stock DSLRs and H alpha response, specifically if there was anything short of modifying the DSLR to enhance the H alpha response. And they also said maybe a darker sky could be a way. Yeah, a darker sky will help a little bit. Um, another thing you can try is a filter. So if you use an H alpha filter or a, one of the newer dual band pass filters like an Optolong L enhance, those filters won't increase your signal, but by blocking out all the other wavelengths other than the emission nebula ones, they allow for much tighter contrast um, higher contrast, I should say, on the H alpha regions, even with a stock camera. I have some videos now showing this and it can help enhance uh, those. Now, they will also, though, block out a lot of this um, natural blue color, like in reflection nebulae. So uh, especially the deeper blues, uh, they will capture the sort of teal of an O3 because uh, that's what they're meant to do. But um, they, they will stop a lot of the yellows and deep blues and things from coming through so 
the best I think is, you know, get one of those up the long L enhance or L extremes or whatever. Uh, use that with a camera lens. You're going to want the L enhance because that can be a clip in filter. Use that to get some of the nebula details, then take it out, shoot unfiltered like you have here, and then combine both data sets in, in process egg, and you really get the best of both worlds that way. Okay, and burned, uh, burned send this uh, sent this image of the North America and Pelican uh, with a nice Hubble palette effect taken with a DSLR and L enhance filter, and this was done with short sub exposures, just forty four seconds each, and no auto guiding. Um, and I've heard a lot of people say you can't use filters like the L enhanced with these very short exposures with no auto guiding. It's it's not true exactly. Uh, you you know it's going to be more difficult maybe because you know can see you can, can see there's some walking noise here that auto guiding would have helped with because you can you can dither in between your sub exposures. Um, you know that's a it's a an auto guiding also helps keep you more right on your target so then you're not going to have as much drift to begin with, which was what causes walking noise. Um, so I think it's sort of true auto guiding would help, um, but it's not it's not strictly necessary to use these filters. Um, another question that Burned had was about the star color. Um, and I think that could be made better with just processing. Um, Burned also sent the just the stretched image. So this is with some manipulation of like separating the color channels and putting them back together. Um, but here's just the image stretched with the filter and you can see the star color is a lot better. So what I would do is take out the stars from this image and layer them on top of this image um, to get the better star color. And so you can do that with layer blend modes like Lighten or something like that in Photoshop or uh, GIMP. Bops sent in a nice image of Andromeda taken with a vintage Soviet lens called the Terror 3S, which I have a copy of that lens too, and I've been meaning to do more with it. Uh, Bops asked about the noise in the photo and the stars uh, being a little bit out of round, perhaps a bit triangular. Let's see if we can see that. Uh, maybe a little bit. I, don't, I think they look pretty good, but not perfect. Uh, and I think I think that's probably just the limit of the optics of the lens you have. You know, the lens copy and everything. It's just you know chromatic aberration. Not much you can do about that. Um, you asked if taking darks would help with noise, and yes, I think they do. Uh, but the thing that really helps with noise, I guess, is just total integration time of the lights, meaning the photos of the night sky. So this is just under an hour integration. If you uh, quadrupled that to four hours, you're going to see a market improvement because every time you quadruple the total, you're going to have the uh, well, you don't really have the noise, but you you increase the signal to noise ratio uh, times two. So it it really helps be be able to bring out more of you know in the image without seeing as much noise. Uh, so try try to increase the total integration on even on a bright target like Andromeda, because the thing about Andromeda is the core here is very bright, but the actual the outer arms with these blue stars is actually still pretty faint. So. It just needs more time to develop. Big Nose 13. Big Nose 13 sent me this image of North America and Pelican Nebulae taken in Cygnus, taken with an old 135 millimeter focal length lens, a modified Canon 600D, and an EQ5 with the motor kit attached. And Big Nose 13 wanted me to address the colors in the image and did send me the stack TIFF file to take a look at. So my first thought with the colors is that the red and magenta color overall has, has taken over the image a bit too much. Um, I'll show my processing here. So you can see in my processing of the image, there's a lot 
there's more variety of colors in the scene. Um, you know, there's more variety in the star colors, but also in the nebulae, I think we see more of a, a pale blue uh, into red. Um, color is tricky because it's not just about saturation, but also contrast. Uh, so when you when you up the contrast uh, or saturation too much in an astrophoto, both of those tend to uh, destroy color variety or flatten the total number of colors in the image. So a couple things I did here in my uh, processing is a careful background extraction. You can do that in PixInsight or Cyril. Um, Cyril's free. Then, you know, removing the stars, separating out the stars and the nebula, adding the stars back, playing around with saturation, and then a final color balance. So you can see here, I think uh, this is sort of, to me, looks a little bit too yellow. So I just took away a little bit of yellow by, I think, let's see what I did, reducing green and adding blue. Yeah. So it's definitely somewhat about, you know, uh, developing an eye for color, um, but there's also things you can do like just being careful with, with contrast uh, that are just good general things that you can learn in, to, in processing to, to maintain color variety. Okay, Bill. Bill sent in a photo of the Wizard Nebula. Somehow the Wizard is one I still haven't shot myself, but it's on my bucket list to try. Bill was wondering about printing and images coming out too dark. And yes, that's a very common problem. There are two solutions I found if you're talking about home printing. One way is sort of a trial and error method. You make a small test print um, and then you make some adjustments uh, and uh, then you can sort of, you know, go back and forth between uh, your computer and the printer until you figure out what kinds of adjustments are needed for your printer. And then uh, you have those, you can save them in a Photoshop file and, and bring them back up next time and basically just apply those adjustments uh, for other astrophotos. Um, the other way is to use a calibrated monitor. Um, there's little calibration devices and then you can load up the, the calibration file for your printer. Uh, and paper and use soft proofing options in Photoshop. And that works pretty well too. Um, uh, and if, for a critique of this image in general, I think um, it would be better if you lifted the shadows up uh, here. Um, you know, if when I'm looking at an image, I like my black levels to be like in the 30s. Um, and on your image, they're like down in the single digits. So it's almost crushed like, you know, to black. Um, but you'll see more of a transition from the nebula to the sky when you have a, a higher black level. And it will still sort of look black in comparison um, to the bright nebula because um, your eyes are very good at adjusting to what is what is black. Um, uh, it's, and it's, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, I understand because those faint areas of the nebula are are much noisier usually than the brighter parts. So you might have done this on purpose, um, but but th that's my advice uh, to make it look a little bit more naturalistic. And then that might also help with printing actually, because uh, since prints come out darker, if you just make the black level a little higher, I think it might work better. Okay, Borgia. Borgia says this is their first tracked astrophoto. And for the first attempt, I think it's very impressive. It looks uh, like you got perfect focus, nice and sharp across the field, um, and shows what's possible with a Nifty 50 lens stopped down. I really need to stop down when I shoot with my Nifty 50 because uh, this looks so much better than what I usually get wide open. Uh, they stopped down to f2.8 uh, from f1.8. Uh, Borgia did have a few questions. One about the corners not looking as good as the center. That's just the reality of using basically any wide angle lens, even really expensive ones, wide angles, you're not gonna have perfect stars in the corner to do corners. To do that, you have to go up to a higher focal length. Um, 
So you either just live with non-perfect stars in the corners or you crop it down, crop down the image. Um, personally, I, I just live with those stars because I don't think most people really notice that, you know, that star over there is, is just a little bit distorted. Um, the other thing Borgia asked about is arc sine stretch in Cyril. Um, and the arc sine stretch is a way of stretching with a curve that is designed to help keep star color as you stretch. Uh, is one of the you know one of the problems with normal kinds of stretching is that it's very easy to bleach out the highlights, including the star color. Um, it looks like it worked well for you here. Sometimes I have issues with arc sine stretch, but I don't know. It might just be the data I'm working with. I'm not sure. Um, and I, I don't see, have much experience with it. I try it often. Usually I don't like it, but sometimes I do. So it, it's just something I think to, to keep in your pocket and try in processing. Um, my only critique I have of the processing, processing here is that I think um, this little uh, blue artifact is a little distracting. So I wonder if we just, uh, you know, just took this and just cropped it out like like that, something like that. I think that doesn't uh, hurt the image much at all, and it and it just gets rid of that little blue uh, artifact down there. Okay. Brad H. Visuals. Brad H. Visuals sent in this image of the Wizard Nebula done with a Sigma 150 to 600 zoom lens at 600 millimeter focal length on a Skywatcher EQ3 mount, a Sony A6500, and an STC multispectra light pollution filter. I think the colors and the composition on this one are really nice. Um, my only critique is that there seems to be a little bit of star trailing. Let me zoom in to show you what I mean. So see, uh, so on the bright stars, you're not going to see it as much, but on the medium sized stars, see how they all have this sort of trailing left to right and a little bit up into the upper right corner. And that's across the field. So even though, uh, you, you went to 600 millimeters to capture the finer detail on the wizard nebula, which is understandable. If your tracking isn't supporting, uh, being at 600 millimeters on your mount, then it's better to go with a slightly shorter focal length and you'll actually get more details. Even if you're, if you're at 400 millimeter focal length or even 300 millimeter, if you can get pinpoint stars, uh, with a shorter focal length and then just crop in, uh, versus 600 millimeters, but you have a bit of trailing. Um, so just, just try that out. I know that it's hard sometimes to see on a, on a mirrorless or DSLR camera that you're, there's a tiny bit of trailing, but, um, you know, try out different, uh, focal lengths and, and also do test exposures and make sure you're zooming in all the way and playback and seeing if you can see any, any trailing on the stars. And if you, if you do, you know, your two options are shorter focal length or shorter exposures usually. Brandon sent in this wide field shot of Andromeda Galaxy done without a tracker with a Canon 70D and a vintage Pentax 55 millimeter lens at f2.8. This looks really nice. I like uh, bringing back in this out of focus uh, tree here from one of the shots. That's my favorite part to really ground us in just how huge Andromeda is in the sky. Um, it's over three times the width of the full moon. Uh, Brandon does acknowledge, uh, the whole photo is a bit blue, but says that was a stylistic choice. Uh, so in that case, I don't really have much of a critique. Um, zooming in on, sorry, zooming in on the stars. Uh, I can't really tell. They may be in focus. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, it, you know, they might just be a little bit soft looking because of the vintage lens. That's my guess at a 55 millimeter Pentax lens. They're just going to be a little soft even when in focus because uh, those old film lenses are not super sharp on the stars. Uh, I wish they were uh, better because uh, you can get really good deals on them. Uh, but usually a modern lens uh, at f2.0, 2.8 will beat out any vintage lens. But even though 
I'm saying that, of course, you can get really cool photos like this with uh, with whatever gear you can afford or have access to. So thanks for sending this in, Brandon. And next up, we have Brian. Brian sent in a photo of the moon, which is a little bit different because you've seen mostly star uh, photos for, for me, uh, knowing that I don't, I shoot mostly the star photos, but this looks really cool. Um, it's taken with a Sony camera and a very nice Zeiss lens, which makes it so sharp. And this is 200 photos stacked and processed with PIP, auto stacker, and a bit of finishing in Photoshop. And Brian mentioned they skipped doing wavelets and Registax because it already looked sharp, but they did do a little bit of sharpening in Photoshop. Um, and I, I wonder if it even needed any sharpening because I do see a little bit of the typical sign of a sharpening artifact on something like the moon or uh, a planet, which is a pretty crisp white line all around the edge. It's not too bad. I'm not, you know, it's not, it's barely noticeable, but it's just if you're looking for it, you can sort of see a little bit of a sharpening artifact there along the edge. Um, I didn't notice it zoomed out, but uh, if I zoom in here, you see there's like a white line there, and then the moon uh, details start, and that sort of goes all along. You can really see it. there see the white line um so i don't th i don't think it's uh it's it's always going to be a trade-off between sharpening uh and and getting these artifacts and trying to control them anyways i think this is really nice it's my favorite kind of moon shot when it's in phase like this uh, so you can really get the cool shadow details on the craters which uh really come out well here Okay, another Brian uh, took this photo of Cygnus with a DSLR telephoto lens and a star tracker and asked about color and composition. So for color, I think that you're definitely on the right track. It looks very, looks very neutral. Um, I would just add some saturation. Let's see what that looks like. Something like that. And then maybe just add a little bit of an S curve here. Okay, so here's before and after. Before and after. And I'm just doing this on the on the JPEG, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of where I would go next with. Um, with saturation and contrast. Usually I tell people do less, and for you I'm saying do a little bit more. For composition, my only note is uh, when you have a strong feature like this uh, bright star Deneb up here, um, I'd say give it a little bit more breathing room. So instead of, uh, in this case, instead of moving the frame, because I think it's important to have some stuff down here, like this dark area down here, uh, what I do is actually rotate the frame a little bit from here. Um, but that might not be an option for you if you don't have a lens collar. So anyways, um, if you can, you could try to improve the composition a little bit next time. But when you have a bright star, uh, give it a little bit more room in the frame rather than being cut off right at the top like that. Okay, Brody shot this image of Andromeda with a Nikon D3200 DSLR and a zoom lens without a tracker. I like it, the color and the detail look good, but I think I'd be interested in seeing the original crop. Um, this crop is interesting because it's like, it's, it's sharp in the center and then it's sharper on the left here than it is on the right. The right is so um, distorted, it looks sort of strange. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe a different crop would be better. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe this is more, maybe this is pretty interesting too. So, uh, I would just see what works compositionally. Um, uh, other thing I see is there's a lot of, a lot of green noise. I wonder if we can bump that down at all with a curve. Let's see here. Well, we're starting to eat into the detail, but this is on the JPEG. I would just I just play around, see if you can on the, if if you're working with the TIFF, if you can 
bump down the green noise without uh, hurting detail on the image. Okay, Bryce. Bryce shot this image of the Milky Way core area with a Nikon D3100 DSLR and a 50 millimeter lens stopped down to f3.5 no tracker so i think it looks nice and detailed it's not over processed at all um there's some field unevenness uh i'm not sure exactly where that's coming from though it's mostly over here on the left uh, you just have sort of like a brighter part so if you couldn't fix that in processing i would probably just crop uh, some of that off uh, just so it's not distracting um, but other than that looks really good caleb sent in a photo of m81 and m82 also known as the bodes and cigar galaxies taken with a nikon dslr a tamron zoom lens and an ioptron skyguider pro it was shot from a Bortle 2 sky caleb described a lot of stuff um, he did to the image based on both my andromeda on track tutorial and also mixed in a tutorial from peter zelinka who's another astro youtuber uh, I think somehow along the way, the colors got a little bit off. That's really the only sort of critique I have of the image. Uh, let me zoom in to show you what I mean. So there's this like green color in both the galaxies, but especially here in the cigar galaxy, what should be red is somehow green. Um, just to show you what it should sort of look like uh this is just an image i did very early on with the dslr show you sort of the, it should be a sort of red out here and then the the bodes should be mostly blue with a warm core so i'm not sure where that green came from but i would just look through your processing steps to try to figure that out um from a portal 2 sky uh with a star tracker I generally I would just try to do a lot less in processing so just just try to like pre-process um, with deep sky stacker skip the whole lightroom pre-processing just stack in deep sky stacker stretch it and and that's how the colors should probably look they should probably look fine uh, you don't have to really do as much with good data from a dark sky you know I shot this data from a from a Bortle 8 sky which is why there's lots of noise and stuff but it uh with Caleb's here there's a lot less uh noise and uh it's really just the color that I think needs work all right Cameron Cameron took this image of Andromeda with a Nikon D610 DSLR and an old Canon FD 300 millimeter telephoto lens on a star tracker and Cameron asked about the funky stars and assumed they probably did something wrong. Uh, I can say with some certainty, no, you didn't do anything wrong. It, wrong, it's the lens. Uh, older lenses, unfortunately, that were designed in the film era, uh, while they still can be used today and adapted to modern cameras, the vast majority of them are not going to be very sharp uh, or well controlled on star fields compared to today's lenses. Uh, so bigger, bloated, funkier stars are par for the course with older lenses. Uh, honestly, though, I sort of like it. Uh, it's, it gives the picture a certain uh, uniqueness uh, <laughs> compared to, you know, I'm seeing many Andromedas today. And so it's sort of fun to see one where the lens uh, has given it sort of a unique flavor. Um, but it looks well processed and and captured so nothing you did wrong if you don't like how the stars look unfortunately you're gonna have to change your your optics your your lens okay next up we have carlo carlo sent me an image of ro ofuki cloud complex and he mentioned that flats and biases made the image worse but also said that he processed the image before stacking in adobe camera raw so this is something I see that many people try, but um, the thing is, if you have a, a choice, uh, 
if, if you if you want to do that, if you want to pre-process your images in Camera Raw or Lightroom or something like that before stacking, then calibration frames may not work properly since Camera Raw or Lightroom stretches your, your lights, making them non-linear, and calibration, the way that it is designed in something like Deep Sky Stacker or PixInsight, it's meant to work with linear data, raw data. Uh, so as soon as you open something in Lightroom or Camera Raw, it's a, uh, automatically applying a stretch to that data. So it's no longer raw. It's, even if you save it as a 16-bit TIFF, it's, it, calibration is sort of out of the window. So for this reason, you know, if you, I believe if you really want to use calibration frames as they're intended, you want to pre-process, you don't want to pre-process raw files. Um, so I start with Deep Sky Stacker or Serial or PixInsight loading in raw files. Okay, with that mini uh, sort of aside over, I, I think uh, Carlos processing is nice here. Um, it's just a little too much uh, contrast uh, for my taste. So I went in the opposite direction just to show what's there uh, without much anything, any kind of heavy processing added. Um, so you can see it's pretty noisy, um, but that sort of uh, can be fixed by just taking more photos. Um, but you can see there's a lot of color variation in the dust that um, you could bring out uh, that, that looks really nice. Uh, there, there's a nice variety of browns and different colors. When you add too much contrast, things get a little bit uh, sort of one note in terms of color. Okay, we have <clears throat> Charles. Charles shot this image of the bubble and lobster claw nebulae with a William Optics 61 telescope, a ZWO uh, 71MC, and an Optolong L Extreme on an iOptron mount. <clears throat> it looks uh, really nice. Uh, Charles mentioned this was their first time processing in PixInsight. And I think this shows even newcomers to PixInsight can get a very nice image from it. Um, my only critique is I find the the framing a little bit um, boring. I think a lot of people, when they shoot the bubble, will just uh, center it like this. Um, but I know this area of Cepheus has a lot of stuff, so I wonder if there's just a different rotation or a different um, you know, the movement of the, the mount, uh, you could fill the frame with stuff a little bit better. Uh, cause right now it's just, you have the nice cluster here, but then nothing over here or up here. Um, you know, another idea is we could just maybe just crop in, uh, on this in more interesting stuff here. And I sort of like that composition better uh, just because it fills the frame more so you, your eye doesn't wander into an, an empty area. Okay, Cheralatan sent me a Milky Way shot from a yellow zone done with a Nikon DSLR and a kit lens. And they were wondering why there is a bright light at the bottom of the photo. Um, I strongly suspect that's a fairly close by light pollution source causing it. Um, if it looks like a typical, looks like typical light pollution, um, you'd see from like a street lamp or something like that. Uh, there's not much you can do about that other than try different locations to see if you can try to not get it in the shot in the first place. Um, it's very hard to subtract light pollution gradients from Milky Way as they're they're very close in color and intensity usually, so you can you, know, you can try, um, but uh, just you know using something like a, a gradient uh, mask, you know, doing something like this, and then playing around with bringing it down. But it's very it's very difficult. Uh, so the best thing is to to try to avoid those light pollution sources in the first place if you can can find a different location near you. Okay, next up we have Chai Town X-Ring. Chai Town X-Ring sent in this image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula and wondered why they were having trouble getting the gold and blue Hubble palette look in PixInsight. Um, so I think the problem is your HA channel is dominating the S2 and O3 too much. 
Um, so what you need to, to do is you take the HA, the S2, the O3, before combining them, stretch them differently. So like, they're all unstretched. You're going to want to stretch the, the S2 and O3 more dramatically so you get higher contrast to there um, than the HA. So don't never use like the auto stretch. That's always going to give you sort of a weird mix. You always want to be able to stretch them independently so you can even out those channels so that the HA doesn't dominate too much. And then you'll be able to get that uh, Hubble palette to work a lot better. Um, Cause otherwise the, the overwhelming green from the HA is just going to be too hard to, to work with. Um, so the best way to control that is in the stretch, not after combination. Okay, Chris O sent in an image of the Crescent Nebula, and this is actually a perfect follow-up to the last one because Chris said that they tried to process this as HOO with H alpha in the red channel, but they couldn't get it to look right because the red dominated the image too much. And the answer is my same answer I gave from the last one. You need to control the H alpha brightness in the stretch. So don't stretch it as much. Um, you intentionally make it dimmer than it could be um, so that you can go to town when you stretch the O3 and then when you combine them, it looks more correct. Um, now this is easier to do in my experience when you make each channel starless uh, with something like Starnet++ or Star Exterminator first. Um, and you may also need to do some noise reduction on O3 since O3 is already a weaker signal. That's why you're stretching it more, but then you're also bringing up the noise. So I usually just clip the noise in the O3 basically to black uh, before combining with the HA channel. And that works uh, pretty well in, in most cases. Okay, another Chris uh, sent in this image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula. This was taken with a modified DSLR and a mix of LPRO data and H-alpha data. Uh, Chris says that they can't get much on these emission nebulae without the H-alpha filter, but they find when combining HA data with RGB data that it's a very red image. So that all makes perfect sense since uh, uh, you know, HARGB is very red unless there's some reflection nebula or dust to break up the image. Uh, Chris wonders if getting a dedicated astronomy camera would help with this. If you're talking about a color camera, um, that won't help with this issue exactly. What might help though, or would help, I actually I could say it pretty clearly, at least on deep sky objects uh, that have you know a strong O3 emission, is to get a dual narrow band filter, like the Optolong L Enhance, L Extreme, or the Amplia ALPT. I did a video comparing those. You can check them out. Um, but those paths, both the HA line in the red on the red pixels and the O3 line in the, both the green and the blue pixels. And um, then you can make uh, the O3 whatever color you want in processing. I usually make it a nice blue. And what that O3 signal really lets you do is add some more dynamics to these emission nebulae. And you could do it with the elephant trunk or, or anyone that has some, some strong O3 data. Um, so then you come, you, instead of doing uh L Pro and H Alpha, do L Pro and L Enhance, and then mix them the same way you did here, sort of. But you would all, you'd want to do a little bit more of a pre-mix with the L Enhance data to bring out the blues, and you can get a bit more of a dynamic uh, shot that way. So I don't think switching cameras is going to be your best bet. I think switching uh, filters from HA to L Enhance or L Extreme or something like that would be your best uh, bet here. Okay, Clip Watt sent me a photo of Andromeda. They asked about the core and if I thought that it looked okay or too blown out. Um, I think it looks, the core looks really good. Um, doesn't look too blown out to me. Um, my one critique of this photo is to ease off on the noise uh, reduction. To, for, me, for my taste, it just looks too smoothed out. Um, and I'd like more grain. Um, if it means you know not smoothing out some of these uh, details, uh, you know that's a personal thing. I, you know a lot of people 
like the more smooth uh, look. Personally, I like a I like a more uh, more of the noise if it means uh, it doesn't feel sort of um, too smooth. Like like sort of like it has like a plastic uh, look to it. So I would just ease off on the noise reduction and uh, and then I think this image is great. Okay, here's something different. Uh, Craig sent this in. It's a really interesting composite idea of a of a moon Mars conjunction passing right by the lagoon and Trifid nebulae. So it's like sort of like two pairs. It's like a very fam famous duo of deep sky objects and then a famous uh, conjunction idea with the the moon and, and Mars. Um, and Craig was able to do this by having two different telescopes shooting the same patch of sky but with different settings different cameras all that kind of stuff and then combining the two photos i mean that are each made up of stacks but like combining the two finished photos in a composite like this um so uh, this is a little different to review um but i'll give it my best shot the three things that stand out to me um one, the fact that this is a moon and Mars occultation or conjunction um, would have been lost on me if you hadn't told me in the description that that's what was going on. Um, and the reason is, is because Mars appears to me to be like the brightness of just like a bright star. It's it's not it's not really jumping out at me. Um, and so uh, I know that the reason you probably had it like this is to retain the color on Mars. But I still think there's there must be some way maybe you could have made it brighter or something um, to draw the eye to Mars in processing. That's my that's my hope is that there'd be some way to to bring out uh, the brightness of Mars maybe with glow or something um, to to make it stand out. Um, and not not make my brain just think that's a star. Because uh, I think that you want to communicate that as a, as a central sort of feature of the of the image. Um, and then the secondly, I feel the sort of the same way about the moon um, in terms of I understand like, you know, the bright side of the moon here, you have it just about as bright as it could be, be before you just lose all detail. Um, so it's very well captured. Um, but in my favorite moon and deep sky composite I've seen, they do something with the moon halo to make it feel more seated in the scene um if it, it, it feels uh like you started to do that here there's a little bit of haziness around there but i will go further with it because it feels it feels still a little bit too sharply pasted on as in a composite sense um so i think breaking up somehow the transition um between the moon and the the deep sky mosaic um, picture uh, is still needed. Um, and then my third thing uh, about this image, this one's actually more uh, going back to a classic uh, kind of critique, is I don't like green stars. And so this image is pretty full of green stars. Um, so I would just uh, do something about that. Um, probably pretty easy to correct. Um, I know that this is a HOO image, meaning you're working with narrowband data. So when we work with narrowband data, perfect star color is sort of out of the question. Um, but, uh, you know, you could just run SCNR green uh, in PixInsight to get to get rid of the green. And I think that's a pretty simple way. If I was doing it here in Photoshop, I could just uh, select by color range and select the green stars and uh, color correct them that way. And since we're not working with natural star color anyways, I don't think it it makes much difference, but it would it would uh, you know fix a little itch for me of like not liking green stars in the image. Um, so that's it. I want to thank you for for sending such an interesting uh, image in because uh, it's, it's always a treat to get some some sort of uh, unique images when I'm when I'm doing D Contog says they are pretty new to astrophotography and are just looking for a general critique of their veil nebula image so with this one I think you should do two things differently um, one 
you've clipped out a lot of the interesting nebulosity down here of the Fleming Pickering Triangle. Um, I did take a look at your TIFF and there was plenty of data there to work with. So it's just about not adding so much contrast, making the black so dark, um, you know, initially. Uh, you can then darken them after you've raised up some of that nebulosity. Um, and then second, I think there's a better framing and crop for this image. I, I don't like this uh, veil. I can't remember if this is the eastern or western, but I don't like this veil nebula when it's just centered like this in a big black void. Um, I think that works really well for galaxy shots, but for nebulae, I prefer to see the extent and seeing more of the, the veil uh, nebula stuff, the Cygnus loop supernova. So I would have maybe just tried a different rotation or, or framing rather than just uh, centering it. Um, but that's, that's it. I think, uh, those are my two sort of major points. Um, I, I also wonder, I actually sort of like the, the yellowishness cause it's sort of unusual. I mean, there's, there's more, you could probably try with color. Um, but I, I sort of like it as is. Okay. Dan sent a nice Milky Way composite image. Uh, it's, it's two images, one for the foreground and then a tracked, uh, image for the sky, but that's also a single exposure. And, uh, Dan was asking about noise and what they could do to minimize it and mentioned that they hadn't learned, uh, stacking techniques yet. So I've done a fair amount of stacked nightscape stuff. I think it is worth learning. I've typically done it. Um, it's sort of a deep sky style, meaning I use programs like deep sky stacker or pix insight. Um, but what's more common is to use a free program called sequator, like equator with S on the front. Um, and I want to learn it cause it's really designed for stuff like this, where you're wanting to stack and blend in a foreground, um, with a stacked, uh, nights, you know, Milky way shot and making that as easy as possible. I, I've heard that Sequator is really good at that. So I just, I'd suggest checking that out. But, um, I, you know, I think that this style of nightscape shooting, uh, where you just do a single shot for the sky, single shot for the, uh, single shot for the foreground works really well too. So, uh, you, you, you clearly have a lot of the important stuff down, like focusing and, and, uh, wide angle, uh, tracking, uh, so. I, I think you could keep going, you know, with this style or, or learn stacking or, or both it, uh, with nightscape, a lot of different, uh, techniques can work well. All right. This is Daniel's first photo of a deep sky object through a telescope. I think it looks much better than my first effort through a telescope. And I like the composition here with Andromeda sort of diagonal across the frame but with uh, the satellite galaxy sort of hanging out over here, it looks good. Um, in terms of what to work on, I'd work on retaining more color and processing. It looks a little bit monochromatic, um, meaning a lot, not much color variety. Uh, maybe it needs a little saturation uh, boost too. We can try that, Let's see what it gives us. Yeah, I mean, um, this is just on the JPEG, but I think a little saturation boost, but also working on um, retaining color. Um, and then, you know, a, a lot just comes down to how you stretch it. Um, and then of course, uh, there's a lot of noise. So we're, you know, shooting more total time always helps, uh, more total integration. And a different uh, Daniel sent in this image of Cygnus taken with a camera lens on a star tracker. And Daniel mentioned having an issue with artifacts left over after using Starnet++. Um, yeah, that can be an issue. Uh, what I suggest is uh, two things. Uh, one, don't star reduce this, don't reduce the stars on the star layer. So just bring them in and uh, control their appearance through levels or curves. Uh, if you start reducing the stars, then any artifact that's 
that would have been just behind and hidden by the star is going to be is going to show more. The other thing you can do is uh, on the starless layer, if you see any major artifacts like this one stands out right here, um, clean it up with like a healing brush tool uh, uh, here in Photoshop. Or uh, the healing brush is sort of like clone stamping, but it just is faster since uh, it's a little bit like more intelligent um, than clone stamp. Uh, so it usually works pretty well for getting rid of the bigger artifacts. Uh, other thing I notice here is the background uh, sky is a little uh, blue. Um, so I'd maybe just see if we can knock that down a little bit. That's a little bit more neutral. Maybe it needs a little bit more work still, but just to give you an idea of what I mean. Um, Otherwise, I think it looks nice. I sort of I like the con the um, framing here. Uh, it's interesting. Okay, next up we have uh, Devesh sent in an interesting comparison where they process the Milky Way in Sequator, uh, which is a software I need, I still need to learn, and Cyril, which is a, a software I'm more familiar with. Um, and then in both cases, they finished off in the GNU image manipulation program. And Devesh said that they found using each of these programs workflows resulted in different results and wanted me to take a look at them. Um, so here's Sequator and here's Cyril. And then I'm not sure, I guess this is their final one. Um, to me, the, the color balance is much more dynamic in the Cyril result. Uh, in the sequator result here, it looks a little bit too yellow because the blue channel, I think, is very weak. Um, now, we could try to fix that, of course, at the end. Uh, you know, we could play around with the color balance uh, here, something like that. But um, I think, f yeah, then there's some, some strange things with stacking in this one. I don't know what's going on. Cause this looks stacked much better. So maybe, maybe Sequator because it doesn't, it's not as picky about star quality and like the star roundness. Maybe it did a better job stacking. Well, this did a better job with color. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I think, um, maybe you found that Sequator is better for this kind of Milky Way stacking you're doing, but, uh, Cyril might be better for color. So, you might want to try using both because uh, I'm not exactly sure which uh, which ones you you did uh, in what or, you know which processes you did in what order. But it it is an interesting uh, experiment to try out the different programs. Okay, David sent in an image of Deneb and the Pelican and part of the North America Nebula done with a DSLR and a lens and a star tracker. And David asked about where to head next with improving on his astrophotography and asked about a number of gear upgrades or if it'd be better to focus on processing. Um, so I'd suggest um, focusing on bright targets like Orion Nebula now uh, in the winter, the Pleiades is up still. Andromeda, and then just spend time on the processing side. So I do, don't recommend gear upgrades for you right now. Uh, specifically, I'd take a look at Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. I have a couple of videos on it. I want to do more. I think if you want to stick with free software, Cyril is your best bet. Um, if you want to jump into paid software, I'd look into PixInsight. Um, but in either case, they're going to help you extract the light pollution uh, more cleanly, and that's going to help you bring out the nebula and the other deep sky objects. Uh, just to show you, uh, here's what I could do just very quickly, just extracting the light pollution from your data. Um, the biggest issue actually found with your data are these dark marks down here and here. Um, and I wasn't sure if those are something on the lens or on the sensor. Um, but I'd say in terms of priorities, fixing those would be a top priority uh, for cleaning. I always start out with a manual air blower on a lens or a sensor before uh, using any 
fluids or lens pens or anything like that. Um, and yeah, once you fix that, then I would focus on processing, uh, not not gear upgrades yet. Dennis sent an image of the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae, and Dennis says that they're new to astrophotography, and this was done with the Omegon Windup Star Tracker. Um, my only real criticism is that would I think it would have helped this image a little bit to have taken flat frames, um, as there there is vignetting um, that would have been uh, easy to correct with with flats. Uh, Dennis said that he used Dodge and Burn in Photoshop to try to correct the vignetting, but flats work better if used uh, correctly. Um, but but even so, even though there was vignetting and uh, and you used Dodge and Burn, it came out really uh, pretty even and, and nice. Um, so uh, it shows you you can do without them, but it's easier it's easier sometimes to process uh, with them if you if you take them. Okay, and another Dennis and another Lagoon and Triffid. So it's funny how that works sometimes, the odds of uh, two people with the same name shooting the same thing and putting them in for their critique. Um, but this one was done with uh, an 8-inch Rasa telescope, um, and it's very nice. Um, my only complaint is with the stars. Um, you know, this this processing of, of the stars is interesting they really stand out against the sky um, and they're they're very colorful and distinct but uh especially when they get into like the nebulae here they're just too punchy for me meaning too uh sharp and contrasty um very very sharp edged well i prefer a sort of softer star profile um especially when it comes to uh the being with the, the the soft nebulae, I think that the the hard stars look sort of strange. Well, it looks it does look good when it's on its own. So I, I can see that it's a it's a balancing act because if you want the star field as a whole to look interesting, maybe these sharper stars are better. Um, uh, but that's my that's my only uh, small critique of this one. All right, Dion sent in an untracked image of the Veil Nebula uh, complex, the Cygnus Loop, with a stock Canon DSLR and a kit zoom lens. And uh, Dion was wondering why the colors are weird. I actually don't think the colors are that weird. Um, th this was just a very ambitious idea to shoot the Veil untracked because the whole thing is super dim. Um, and it's in a very busy star field. Um, if you want to try it untracked again, I would maybe go wider than this. Um, but I'm impressed that you got some pretty nice O3 signal up here in this corner on the, on this part of the veil. Um, my main thing is I'd recommend some other objects to try with this gear untracked that will be easier than the veil. And you may have done some of these are all of these, but I'll just mention them anyways. Uh, untracked with a zoom lens, things I'd try uh, before the veil are uh, Orion Nebula or basically any part of the Orion constellation, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, the Pleiades, uh, Messier 81 and 82, uh, Messier 101, uh, a bunch of probably other Messier galaxies and clusters and things. Because all of those will be a lot brighter than the veil, um, especially with a stock uh, DSLR, and much much easier to to capture with those short exposures. But 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 it's uh, I still admi admire you for for trying such a challenging object, and I think parts of it came out really well. Derek sent in this image of the Eastern Veil Nebula. Okay, that's uh, that's what it is, the Eastern Veil. I always get them mixed up. Um, and it's taken with a William Optics 61 on an Ioptron Star Tracker with an Optolong L Enhance filter and the Canon T1i DSLR. So I think this shows very clearly that old DSLRs with the right combination of, of other gear can still produce really 
fabulous results. Um, Derek did mention the noise was hard to deal with, so uh, that might have been the the DSLR's fault. He said it was a hot night, um, but I mean, I think you did a really nice job with it. Um, my only critique is like the last time we saw this one, uh, I don't like the, the framing of having the, the Eastern Veil centered and uh, across the frame like that. I'd prefer it turn 90 degrees from here. Uh, so then you could have the Fleming Pickering triangle at the bottom and have less dead space overall in the, in the photo. All right, uh, Demont shot this image of Andromeda from a yellow zone and did 500 shots at one second each. Uh, so untracked, I'm assuming. Um, and they sent their TIFF file. So I processed it and let's see what the difference is here. Okay, so I processed it uh, brighter to try to bring out any detail that was there. Um, but being from a yellow zone, which is like a portal five or maybe portal six, I think with just eight minutes total integration, it's still gonna be pretty noisy, especially out in the fainter regions here. Um, so if you're you're gonna want to put if you want to push the image you know much further than this, um, you're gonna to have to shoot more. So I'd suggest starting by doubling, try a thousand shots. That would get you up to about 15 minutes total, and uh, it's gonna be easier to manage the noise uh, when you do that. Demetrius sent in an image of the Ro Ofuki cloud complex uh, taken with a classic combo of the Canon DSLR Samyang 135 f2 lens and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. This is a combination that I use often. And there's lots of nice details in here. Um, my one criticism of this uh, image is the color still needs a little bit of work. There's some green hues in here, and then there's a very strong purplish blue cast from about right there up in the image. I'm not sure where that's uh, coming from, but it's not a it's not a natural phenomenon to have such a strong blue. Um, so I'll just show a quick way to deal with something like that in Photoshop. Um, I could just grab a curves adjustment. I'm gonna take a gradient mat, uh, tool and draw a quick gradient on there. Something like that, Wait, maybe like, like this. Okay, so here's what the mask looks like. And eh, not quite right yet, let's try this. Yeah, that might be right. Okay, so anyways, they draw the, the gradient on the mask and then we're gonna take the blue channel and just try to fix this here. So. I'm just working on the JPEG, so it's not gonna be perfect, but something like that uh, is how to fix that kind of weird uh, color shift. Okay, next up we have DIY NASA. DIY NASA sent a nice wide field HOO image of the Crescent Nebula and the soap bubble. Uh, soap bubbles right there. And uh, the waves of nebulosity uh, are in the background as well. And this is all in Cygnus. And for this one, uh, DIY NASA did equal amounts of HA and O3 filters, three hours data on each. So I think it was probably enough on the HA, but the O3 is still looking a little bit um, broken up and uh, noisy, at least for as how much is how much he stretched it here. Uh, so I would probably start with keeping the HA um, amount the same, but tripling your O3. Um, but I'm impressed by how well you got the oath, uh, the soap bubble to stand out. So it definitely is, uh, some nice processing here to get it to this point, but if you want it to look even better in terms of, uh, the sort of the noise performance, I would just, uh, 
keep pushing uh, with the O3, keep uh, keep doubling or tripling or quadrupling your your total integration there, uh, and uh, it will look even cleaner. But nice job. All right, this one is from Duarte. Duarte's third astrophoto, and it's very impressive how uh, good people are right out of the gate these days. I, uh, I like the colorful star field. It's very distinctive. It's not a, I usually don't go for this, the super colorful star fields in wide field like this, but it, it works really well here. I, I like it. Um, and I see some nice uh, detail um, in the nebulae. My one suggestion is maybe just to see if, if the horse head and flame can come out a little bit more. I feel like the, they're getting a little bit lost in the and how dim they are uh, compared to everything else. Uh, so I, I wish they were just a little bit brighter to draw the eye, eye over there as well. Okay, Dylan. Dylan sent a photo of Andromeda Galaxy, and they added a nice uh, tilt shift effect to it. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I wonder. Uh, there must be a. I wonder if that's a filter on its own, or if they. That's a process that you go through to do that. Um, I do have a suggestion, and that's to see if you can bring out a bit more of the blue outer arms of Andromeda here, because um, I see that you have lots of nice blue stars outside of the galaxy. So I thought maybe it's possible to bring out the blue um, in the galaxy a bit more. Dylan also asked about good landscape astrophotography spots in New England. Um, so in terms of getting good, uh, landscape features, I'm still working on that myself. Um, there's, you know, there's the lighthouses in Cape Cod and in Maine and along the whole coast. Um, uh, and then there's the white mountains in New Hampshire. Um, trying to think of other things I've heard about. I think there's a lot of spots in Maine that might be good. Um, if you want to go that far North. But, but the, the, the top things I'm thinking of are, are probably, uh, you know, going to the coast is going to be your best bet for getting cool landscapes with, with astrophotography in New England. Okay, Ed Holt Astro sent me this nice photo of the Flaming Star Nebula in Auriga and said that his particular telescope setup gives him some trouble with halos on bright stars. That's pretty common with certain filters and telescopes and things. Um, so, uh, looking for a method to deal with those and I'm glad you use Photoshop ed, cause that's my preferred way to deal with star halos like this. And this will be a little bit involved for a critique, but I'll just show the whole process. Cause I don't know how I'd explain it without showing it. So we're going to start with, uh, the elliptical marquee tool. You have to get comfortable using that. Start with it in its normal new selection mode. And um, you can leave these other things basically alone. Um, I might turn down the feathering just a little bit. I'm going to turn it down to five pixels. OK, then we're going to zoom in on a star with a very noticeable halo. So this is the one that jumped out to me. And you're going to want to put your cursor right in the middle of that star halo and then click and start dragging out. And you'll notice that it drags out in the direction that you drag out. So that's not really what quite what we want. But if you hold down the option key, look what happens. It now is uh, dragging out in every direction um, using where you started as the central point. So that's looking much better, right? Now, the other thing we can do is if you drag out like this, you can see it can make all kinds of different ellipses. But if you hold down Option and then also add Shift, then it's going to be constrained to a perfect circle. So I'm going to do something like this, and I'm going to make it slightly bigger than the actual halo. So, okay, we're going to do that. And then I'll just center it up a little bit better. I'm just using my arrow keys to nudge this. 
Okay, then the next thing we're gonna do here is we wanna get rid of the halo, but we don't want to affect the, um, the central star here and its natural halo, which extends out to about there. So let's subtract that from the selection. We're still using the elliptical marquee tool, but we're gonna change it to subtract from selection mode. And then we're gonna center up on that central star there. We're gonna start dragging, we're gonna hold down option, shift, drag out, let go. Okay, so now our selection is just selecting the halo. Let's make it a little fuzzier by feathering it. So we're gonna do select, modify, feather. Let's feather it by two more pixels. Okay, if I press Q for a quick mask, we can look at the selection here. That looks pretty good. Okay, now I'm going to add a adjustment layer. And when you've selected something in the image and then you add an adjustment layer, it automatically adds that as your mask for that selection layer. So it's only working on that part of the image. And so then what we can do is we can just desaturate and uh, darken that part of the image and maybe also change its hue a little bit. Okay. And then if it still doesn't look quite right, what you can do is you can, you can um, continue to feather the selection. So if it looks a little bit too obvious still, you can feather it a little bit more. Okay, so yeah, maybe you can still see it, um, you know, zoomed in like this, but let's zoom back out. And I think that's much better. We can maybe go even a little bit further with darkening it. Perfect. And then here's before and there's after. Okay, so that's the that's the basic idea we could, I'm. I could be more persnickety about it and try to get it even more perfect, but uh, I think you get the, the basic idea of what we're doing there to get rid of those halos. So thanks for sending that in, Ed. Edwin shot the M81 and 82 galaxies from a red zone with a basic zoom lens and a sky watcher star adventure, processed them with Cyril and the GNU image manipulation program. Um, for this one, I think it's a great start. It's a little bit monochromatic, so I'd maybe go a little bit further with uh, uh, saturation and play around with the crop a little bit. Um, here's my idea for, uh, for that. Uh, so just a slightly different uh, crop, a little bit closer in on the galaxies and adding just a bit of more saturation to them. Um, so it, it, these are all just sort of like fine tuning kind of things. Um, and I think you still with this crop include all of the the minor, uh, smaller galaxies in the M81 group. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure, maybe I missed some of the smaller galaxies uh, by cropping in. So uh, the crop is sort of up to you, but I still think maybe try increasing saturation just a little bit to make those galaxies uh, stand out a bit more. All right, Edgis uh, sent in a photo of the Cygnus region untracked with a stock Canon 60D and a 70 to 300 zoom lens. Was wondering about the overall uh, red cast to the picture and how to fix that. Um, so if we're gonna bring up, uh, we can bring up histograms here. And if we look at those, you can see um, the, the red channel is, uh, well established, but the green and blue are sort of clipped uh, over here on the left edge. So what we want to do ideally is when we're when we're uh, stretching the image, we want to we want to bring the green and the blue channels so that the left edge of those uh, as we're stretching matches up with the red channel. Um, so I think I covered this in the Andromeda start to finish series. So check that out for. Uh, more of a walkthrough, um, but here's just an idea of what it would look like after you stretch um, those to have all 
three channels sort of at the same black point like this. Um, but it's a very nice image for being untracked and shows you what you can do even with the stock DSLR and a basic uh, lens. Um, so nice job, Edges. Okay, here's Elliot. Elliot sent in an image of the core of the Milky Way area done with an old manual 55 millimeter lens on a Star Adventure. Um, and the problem with these old lenses, as I think I mentioned a few times now, is the chromatic aberration. Some of the star distortion doesn't look as good. Um, but since you mentioned you have Photoshop, Elliot, let me show you a cool way to get rid of some of that. Um, you're just gonna go here into filter, camera raw filter, and go down to optics. And then under optics, there's this D fringe. And since most of the chromatic aberration in this image has turned out sort of orange, just take the purple hue slider thing here and extend it so that it's including all orange. And then just uh, drag this over until you see it basically disappear in the image and click OK. And there you go. I think that's much better. Um, it really helps put that finishing touch on the photo. So here's before and there's after. Now, in this case, it did, I think, eat into the nebulae a little bit, um, especially right there. So uh, what you might want to do in that case is just make a copy. So I'm going to go back and make a copy and then apply this uh, trick to the copy and then just apply a layer mask and paint in black on the parts where you don't want it to apply and then it will show back through to this background layer so uh, if you if you do see it eating into something that isn't a star uh, that's an easy way to fix that okay elisha sent in an image of the beehive cluster taken with a nikon d3300 dslr and a zoom lens and this was taken at 55 millimeter f4 on a tripod and I think this came out really well. Um, when I processed it, I got a very similar result. Uh, so I, I think uh, this is um, what you can expect from this data. Elisha asked about the image um, looking dark after stacking. That's very normal. Uh, if you stack with like something like Deep Sky Stacker or one of those, if you if you just take the TIFF file out of there, it's still in a in a very raw um state um where you have to stretch it out to to, to bring the the picture out so it doesn't come out uh pre-stretched like you would normally out of a like a raw converter um so that's normal that's what you want to see uh, my only suggestion is on star clusters like this um it could look cool if you want to try this to to tape some fishing line or some thread onto the front of your lens and that will create these diffraction spikes and um, it just allows you to see the star cl color in the stars a little bit better and makes them stand out because it's you'll see the diffraction spikes clearer on the brighter stars and so then the star cluster will really pop out from the scene a bit more um, and I did a, a quick video on that if you're if you're curious uh, it's, it's pretty easy to do Okay, Aaron. Aaron sent in an image of the Milky Way taken with a Nikon DSLR and kit lens at 55 millimeter focal length. It's Bortle 4 sky. And Aaron mentioned the Milky Way core, though, was in the same direction as a city light pollution dome. So, yeah, we're seeing some um, color gradients in here that can be worked on a bit. Um, the image looks a little bit magenta in over here in this corner and then a little bit green in this corner. Um, so, uh, and then a little bit blue on top. So, you, you know, we can work on those with, um, uh, gr you know, gradient masks. Like you can draw in a, put in a curve here, draw in a, uh, gradient. So let's say I want to work on this corner. Let's draw in a gradient like this. And you can see on the mask here, it's just applying to that corner. And then we go into the red channel and correct it a little bit. Um, and then you can just keep going like that. Um, it takes some patience to get to get that 
right? Um, but that's one of the challenges in in astrophoto processing is is fixing gradients. Uh, so it, it's worth uh, playing around with. But I think this looks really nice. I love how the the star cloud came out up here. All right. Next up, we have Eric. Eric sent in an image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula taken with a color astronomy camera, an Optolong L enhanced filter, and a small uh, refractor, a William Optics refractor. And I think this looks very good. Eric said um, he had trouble with keeping the stars round after reducing them. Huh. So I'm not sure. I'm. See, I, see, I think you're using Photoshop. Um, the only thing I can think of in terms of keeping the fil the stars round when reducing them is if you're using the minimum filter to reduce stars, make sure it's set to roundness and not squareness, because uh, that could make stars very much not round. Um, and then probably the other thing is just like you're, you're, you're using a mask when you... Um, when you use the minimum filter to reduce the stars. So how you constructed that mask um, may be an issue too. And this is all assuming this is how you're reducing the stars. If you're doing it with a with a script or something, then I don't know, because uh, I, I, I usually don't reduce my stars. Um, anyways, my, my only other critique is uh, the transition from the nebula um, to the sky, uh, I think, looks good on the right side, but then on the left side looks like a little too dramatic. Um, well, actually in the, on the right side in this corner too, it looks a little too dramatic. Just the, this sky in these corners looks almost clipped. Um, so be, just be careful not to clip the blacks and then you'll have a nice softer transition for your nebula. Fabian captured the interstellar flux nebula around Polaris. And Fabian asked about the color of the dust and had seen others images where it was more brown while in his, it turned out more gray. Um, so I think that just comes down to processing. Um, uh, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it more colorless and I've seen it more brown. Um, I'm not convinced, uh, you, you mentioned you used luminance layering. I'm not convinced you need luminance layering. Uh, in general, I think it's hard to maintain natural color saturation with uh, the luminance uh, layering techniques. It's not impossible. I think it's just harder. Um, uh, so in general, I'd maybe try a simpler workflow and see if that works better for at least capture, bringing out the color. And then maybe you could, you know, fine tune your workflow, do a mix. Um, just as an example, um, I did look at your data and all I did was just an automatic background extraction, a stretch histogram transformation and star net. And this is what I got. And I mean, it's not very clean yet. I didn't do any noise reduction or anything like that, but it, it shows you that with just keeping it very simple, uh, the color balance is pretty brown, I would say, um, browner than yours here. Uh, so, but you know, at the cost of it's it's noisier. Yours is a lot cleaner. So I don't know if I could just use some noise reduction to get to where you are, but keeping it browner, uh, maybe. Um, I'll let you try to figure that out. But I would try just a simpler workflow, just try background extraction and some, you know, stretching and and see where, see where that lands you. Because I sort of agree with you that this might look better with a more brown IFN because I think that would look more natural with these very colorful stars. It almost looks like you have a monochromatic nebula uh, grayscale and then colorful stars on top. Okay, Fergus. Fergus took this image of the North America nebula with a modded Canon T3i and a mix of unfiltered shots and shots with an H alpha filter. Uh, and Fergus said they liked how the image came out in terms of detail, but felt the image was a bit uniformly red. And uh, I agree with that assessment. The, the trick with, uh, with that is just color balancing as you work. You know, even with this JPEG, which has clipped blacks, I'm sure. If I just go here into the blue channel and just try to raise that up, 
you can see there is a lot of uh, O3 signal here in the nebula. Just ignore that it what it's doing to the black parts. Um, but even just that shows where your blue signal in the nebula is, uh, which is where I'd expect it to be. Um, and so you could you could just you know play around with color balancing. Um, you know, another thing you can do, and not to tell you to go buy another filter, is um, uh, with an L Enhance uh, filter, uh, instead of a, an HA filter, you would capture that O3 a little bit more strongly, and that can help separate them out in processing. But even just doing some color balancing with what you have, I think if you're not using the JPEG, but your original TIFF file, um, just try to do something here you know i think you could get you could get a um, a little bit more uh, dynamics in color uh, in the nebula okay and then finley finley took a nice photo here of the whirlpool galaxy from a Bortle 6 sky with a zoom lens set to 600 millimeters focal length at f9 and Finley said their issue was little color in the stars in the galaxy. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that's mostly a processing issue. Um, you know, you'll want to work with masks so that you're only boosting saturation where you want it boosted. You can, you can just make a copy of this image, turn it black and white, and use that as a mask, as a luminance mask. Um, uh, but there, there is probably nice uh, color in there. You just need to boost the saturation of it selectively. Um, I'd also suggest taking flats as it'll help with the uniformity of the field. And you can see these rings out here. It's like lighter blue than green than dark. That it, Flats will really help with that. Um, so with flat fielding and then boosting the saturation, I think you'll, um, you'll be much happier with it. Just to show you even in the JPEG, that there's color here that you're uh, sort of unrealized. Even if I just hu hugely boost the saturation, you can see the natural colors of that galaxy in there. It looks right to me. You know, the yellow, yellowish gold in the core and out here, and the blue and pink arms. Um, you know, it's mixed in with some noise, of course, but this is a wide field image. So back out here, if I wasn't also boosting these uh, rings, I think that would look pretty good um, to boost the the galaxy and the stars uh, with a saturation boost. Okay, and then we have Fixie Rider. Fixie Rider sent in an image of the Cygnus Loop supernova remnant taken with a Canon RP camera and a Radian Raptor telescope. Uh, the RP was, oh, the Canon RP was a stock camera and no additional filters were used. So that's really cool because um, this is a difficult shot without any kind of filters or a modified camera because um, the whole uh, supernova remnant is coming through, I think, really clearly despite this very busy star field. So that's nice. Um, so I did do my own take on this just because I thought it was an interesting shot. Um, and uh, I sort of went to town here, I guess, um, on the layers. Um, I, I guess just because I, I got a little carried away with trying to get it looking how I wanted. Um, so I um, was I looked at this image and thought maybe um, there could be a more interesting crop. And then when I looked at your raw data, I saw this bright star up here. So. My thinking for this was just sort of make a an interesting triangle with the um, the Cygnus loop and the this bright star. Um, I'm not sure if it really works that well, but that was my intent. Um, and then what I was doing with all these layers was just trying to bring down the noise of the background while bringing out the nebula and stars. Um, so. I think uh, this works well. Um, it's a very busy star field. I was just seeing if I could maybe make uh, the nebula pop a little bit more by, um, you know, bringing down the uh, the background uh, and the and the noise. Um, it may look like I reduced the stars, but I didn't. What I actually did was I just uh, 
played around with the stretch and things like that um, to, to get it to look like that. All right. Uh, so this is from Florian. Florian sent in an image of the North America and Pelican Nebulae. It was shot with a modified DSLR and a 72 millimeter refractor and an SV Boney CLS filter, which is a type of light pollution filter. It was processed in Affinity Photo, uh, which is a program I haven't gotten around to learning, unfortunately. I want to though. And Florian mentioned that the stars uh, maybe weren't the best. And I, I agree. I think that's one of the biggest um, things that stands out about this image that I uh, would critique is um, this is a type of star reduction where I think the, you know, you have the really big stars look not reduced, um, but then all the other stars in the image sort of end up the same size. And I think that just makes it, them sort of look like noise rather than stars. Um, so to avoid that, I, I don't reduce, I don't do star reduction in a typical way. I either do it the atom block de-emphasis method, um, which is sort of complicated in Pix Insight, or the way I do it even more commonly is I just use Starnet plus plus to separate the stars and the nebula, and then I blend the star layer in with a screen blend and adjust the stretch of the star layer just with levels or curves to sort of get the intensity of them right compared to the rest of the picture, but they don't, it doesn't change their size, um, which is what I like. Um, the other thing that Florian mentioned is over here um, on this bright star, I can't remember what it's called. Let me go to it. There's a, this offset halo. That's from the, the CLS filter. It's very common with all kinds of uh, interference filters. Um, I already showed sort of how to, how I reduce these in uh, the Ed Holt critique. So I just go back to that to look at it, but it's basically you just um, make a, oops, make a selection here. And then if you want to get fancy, you can subtract uh, the star out of the selection. And then you reduce the intensity of the halo like that. Um, so I think it, it works pretty well if, if uh, for a quick uh, way to do it. And uh, let me just show off and on. So you can definitely see it and then it sort of disappears in the wide view. If you wanted to make it look perfect, you might have to do a little bit more than that. But uh, that's, a, that's just a quick way to show getting rid of those halos. Okay. Now we have Frank. Frank sent an image of central Cygnus here. And Frank was wondering if there was anything wrong with their technique with capturing or taking calibration frames. Um, from everything you sent in and what I can do, no. I, don't, I think you're doing everything right. Um, the thing is with these diffuse emission nebula and Cygnus, Cygnus they're very dim and um, doubly so without modifying your camera. So uh you know what happens when you when you stretch aggressively is you get bring up more noise as well as more signal um but the cool thing about astrophotography is that we can change the signal to noise ratio just by collecting more data overall and so that's what i'd look at doing is capturing more data even if that means multiple nights um under the night sky um and that actually leads me into the next picture, which is by another Frank, and it's of the same uh, thing. So this actually is a good uh, uh, twosome. Um, so this is, uh, this, you know, also Cygnus with a stock Nikon DSLR, so not modified. Um, but Frank says he took this with a small mead telescope from a Bortle 8 Sky um, so this is probably you know tracked and everything, um, uh, but it's from a light polluted sky. But he but he put seven and a half hours into the image by combining data from four different nights, and so when you do that, when you put a lot of data into the image, you can bring more out of it without uh, the noise sort of taking over too much. Um, 
And Frank was wondering about all the variations in color and if the blues were real. Uh, yeah, the blues are definitely real. They, they You don't see them as much um, outside of narrowband imaging because uh, when you modify the camera, it throws off the color balance so much that the HA dominates. So you don't see the O3 signal as much. Um, but with a stock DSLR, it does. Uh, it actually helps getting this nice color variety on this scene. Um, the one thing I'd work on here though is getting the sky background a bit more even in color and maybe you don't, you're not sure where to do that but like for instance over here it looks a little weird to me with like too much color um and down here so just look at some other people's pictures and i think uh you'll you'll see where to try to sort of work on the background neutralization a bit but other than that i think that looks good And then we have Gabe. Gabe sent in an astonishingly good photo, I'm jealous of this one, of Comet Neowise and Natural Airglow, which is, um, you only see it usually from dark locations. It's sort of like a aurora in a way. Um, it's, 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 it's a natural phenomenon in our atmosphere. Um, uh, so this is really cool. This is from a Bortle 1 sky in Canada. And so you're seeing these streaks of natural red and green air glow and then uh they they contrast very well uh with the the vertical feature of the comet neowise um you know i think this is a photo that will definitely impress other astrophotographers who know what they're seeing uh i'm not uh you know i'm not i not to say that it wouldn't impress other people. I'm just not sure if, uh, you know, non astrophotographers would know what this is. Um, it reminds me of, you know, the, the solar eclipse in 2017, because when I saw there were sort of passing clouds, I was so disappointed. But then after I processed all my photos, my favorite one actually is one where there's like clouds in the shot. And then also the, the diamond ring of the solar eclipse, because it's, it just makes for a very unique photo, just like this is a, you know, incredibly unique photo. It's sort of like a, lots of people have pictures of Neowise that looks sort of like this, but no one has it with this formation of air glow, uh, over it. Okay, uh, Garunix Reborn uh, captured the Carina Nebula in a wide field shot with a kit lens at 55 millimeter focal length on a Nikon DSLR. And I think uh, given the limitations of a kit lens, um, this looks very good. Uh, Garunix Reborn processed mostly in Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, um, which is a very good free software. Um, Something I don't know though how to do in Cyril is quickly reduce star bloating from chromatic aberrations. In in Photoshop, uh, we have you know this camera raw filter, which just makes it so quick to just go in here, go down to defringe, pick up the colors that you want to uh, defringe, and then just you know do a slider, and uh, just like that, you've killed a lot of that. Uh, fringing on the stars and it's pretty it's pretty seamless and so the, so a lot of the more affordable lenses and kit lenses are going to have that sort of color um, so then if you try to increase saturation um, overall on the scene it, the, the the chromatic aberration really takes over but if you take it away and then you increase saturation um, that works a lot better uh, for getting sort of a nice uh, star field, uh, nice colorful star field. All right. And then we have George, George sent in an image of the North America and Pelican nebulae taken with a Canon RA and a Radian triad ultra filter and a small mead refractor. And so I love how well you've brought out, um, you know, all these dimmer details down here, um, due to the, the narrow band, the, multi-band pass narrowband filter. Um, two things I'd probably look at differently in processing. One is with, with those multi-band pass filters, um, like you have with the, 
the radian, um, you should be able to separate out the red, green, and blue channels and then process them separately to boost the O3 signal and then recombine them. And then you'll get a bit more color variety that way um, than you have here. It'll look more like mapped narrowband data. So just to sort of show you what I mean really quickly, if I just uh, select and copy the blue channel and uh, paste that on here, and I'll set that to screen. And then I'm going to turn it blue. Just I'll just colorize it here. Okay. So just something like that. Um, you can see that you get a little bit more color variety, but if you if you really map the the channels, um, you'll get even more uh, sort of variety than that. Um, the other thing that I noticed is that the stars within the North American nebula look really muted, almost gone. And I'm not sure why they're not as bright as other stars in the image. Um, but I've, I've found that when stars look too de-emphasized, um, they start looking like noise. And so I just pay attention to that and see if you under, know how in your process that, that happened. Okay, and then we have another George, George from Washington State. And George from Washington State did a narrow band image of the Vail Nebula complex, also known as the Cygnus Loop supernova remnant, and did it with narrow band filters and a full spectrum Nikon DSLR. And George mapped the colors in an HSO mapping. It's a little unusual. Um, as uh, you know, SHO uh, with sulfur in the red channel, that's more common. Um, uh, I examined the, the raw data you sent in, George, and uh, one thing I found was that the O3 data was really sharp, perfectly focused, and the HA and S2 in comparison were a little bit out of focus. So um, just, just keep that in mind, um, you know, make sure you're, I don't know what your focusing technique is, but it worked well on the O3 and then on the HA and S2, it wasn't as good. So, um, and that, that might have been an over the night kind of thing. I don't know if you refocused the, the filters, but you're going to want to refocus for each uh, filter uh, as you change them. Great. Uh, Gipard sent in an image of the North America Nebula shot with a very interesting combination of gear the Tear 3S Soviet lens, just a manual lens. I own a copy too, and I like it. Uh, Canon 500 DSLR. 500D DSLR and uh, the cool part, the Open Astro Tracker, which is a very cool 3D printed open source tracker system that I really want to try sometime, um, either buy one or make one myself. Is it's a very interesting looking star tracker and uh, looks, you know, I think also looks like it does a pretty good job. Uh, Gipard asked about getting a natural color, and I think. This is not too bad in terms of natural color. I think the blue needs to be a little bit stronger. Let me just sort of try that out on the JPEG here. Yeah, I think the blue should be a little bit stronger. And then um, personally, I like a little bit more saturation than this. So just something like that. And then maybe a little less magenta. Um, this, this I don't know if the, the less magenta is really a uh, you know, well, if we do less magenta, then maybe we'd want to do less cyan in the red. So this is getting complicated. Okay. But I don't know, something like that, I think is pretty close to natural color. Maybe it's the magenta and the reds that I don't, I mean, in the blacks that I don't like, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's getting pretty close to natural color. Um, the other thing uh, just to say about this uh, quickly, which is something you probably already noticed is uh, compositionally, I'm not sure if this is the best to have the neb sort of like cropped off like this, with just a giant halo coming through. Um, so I feel like this is sort of a compromise where you wanted 
uh, the Neb in there maybe, or and then but then the Cygnus wall gets so low uh, in the shot. So I don't know. I, I would just try out a different comp composition next time. Um, you know, even if it takes a little bit longer to to find the right composition, I think it's worth it because um, this one just feels a little bit uh, off. Okay. Guesser 000 has captured the Carina Nebula untracked with a Canon T2i and a kit lens, a 75 to 300 zoom, just on a fixed tripod, 500 lights at two seconds each, ISO 6400, and processed in Cyril and Photoshop. And I really don't have much of a critique for this image. It's presented in a nice uh, neutral color where the blue of the Carina nebula is preserved the stars look nice um and it's it's really quite impressive for an untracked shot with a an older dslr and a zoom lens the only thing i might change is uh the composition i think you know you wanted if you if you want to make karina off center like this um and so so that you can include this nice star cluster then I wouldn't use the square crop like this. This is almost square. Um, I would go to like a five by four or even a six by four vertical. Uh, it just feels a little bit weird to have that star cluster so um, uh, close to the corner there. Um, and then Karina just slightly off center. So I would just, I would try a different uh, crop, crop and then I think the composition would improve. Okay. Giuseppe uh, imaged the Andromeda Galaxy with a DSLR and telephoto lens on an Omegon mini wind-up tracker. Um, it's about one and a half hours total over two nights. And my main comment here is on the color of the galaxy. So with a spiral galaxy like this, um, Andromeda, you have the... Um, the outer arms of the galaxy are sort of um, more bluish with the blue, hot blue stars are out here. And the cores are sort of a warmish white. They're like, they're not white, they're not pure white. They're more of a uh, orangish yellow. Um, but in general, your color balance is just too red here. And this is like sort of a fiery orange in the middle. Um, but then the red is also making the outer arms go a little bit purple. Um, so just look at your channels and curves and, um, and, you know, play around with, with those to, to, to work on the color. Uh, that's it. Okay. And then Gordon, Gordon has a nice image of the Carina Nebula here. Um, the Carina Nebula, of course, is one of the jewels of the Southern Hemisphere skies. And this was taken with a stock Canon DSLR and a Sigma zoom lens on a Star Adventurer. Uh, Gordon did mention he just took delivery of an HEQ5 mount, which is a very nice mount. Uh, and you can do guiding and dithering with that, which will help out with walking noise. Um, and I do see a little bit of walking noise here, but it's not too noticeable. Um, Walking noise is just when noise streaks into a pattern. It's usually diagonal lines, but it could be in any direction, really. It's just about drift of the system. Um, my, my only other critique of this image is the stars are a bit bright and sharp for my taste. Um, you know, they're, 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 um, they feel almost all white, and then they just all have very, like, sharp edges, like they're blown out. Um, so... Since I see you use PixInsight, a couple things to maybe try are one, trying to use StarNet++ in your workflow. That allows you to work on the nebula and the stars separately. Um, and then, or two, another thing you could try is just in the stretch, um, trying instead of a histogram stretch, try masked stretch or arc sign stretch. And both of those are stretching methods that tend to um, preserve star color a little bit better. Greg sent in an image of the North America and Pelican Nebulae taken with a Radian Raptor telescope and a QHY 268C camera. And um, looks like very nice data. Um, 
the, t the processing I think looks a little bit too uh, sharp and um, you know sharp and contrasty. That's what that's what I'm looking for uh, for my taste. Um, so I would just maybe ease off on both of those, but I know that's sort of a, a personal uh, preference kind of thing. Um, and the stars, I don't know, look a little um, bright maybe. Um, so I'd maybe just make the stars a little dimmer. But um, other than that, I think it looks really good. There's there's a big halo on this star. Um, you can watch uh, my Ed Holt critique uh, earlier in the video to talk about reducing that if you're interested. Um, but other than that, looks looks good. All right. Grazy. Grazy sent an image of the Ro Ofuyuki cloud complex taken with a stock Canon T7 and a 75 to 300 zoom lens without tracking. So uh, we can call this an untracked image. And for an untracked image of Ro Ofuyuki, this looks very good. The only uh, thing I might do a little differently in the processing is just go a little darker. Um, I can just put a curve on there now just to show you what I mean. So just something more like that. Um, if you want to do try to increase the saturation a little bit, you could make a luminance mask just by making a copy of this photo and turning it black and white. And then applying that to a saturation layer. So I'm just going to copy it in there with uh, alt click and paste it and then I can just increase the saturation just a little bit on the nebulae and the stars only um, so that's sort of just what I do differently is just a little a little darker overall and then maybe after that a little more saturation Okay, next we have Gregory. Gregory sent in a nice image of, uh, you know, the Veil Nebula, the Eastern Veil with an L-Extreme filter from a Bortle 9 sky. Um, I think these colors look great, um, you know, good, good balance so you're not uh, blowing anything out so you can really see a nice... Uh, you know, uh, variation where the O3 and the HA are overlapping. Uh, Gregory asked about getting more details by shooting a luminance with a luminance filter. Um, I think well, you know the luminance provides details. That's true, but shooting luminance and RGB in mono, for instance, works really well because then you get your details in the luminance um, and then your color in the RGB. Uh, so that's you know tr tr traditional lRGB imaging works really well for galaxies and things like that. Uh, with narrowband imaging for emission nebula like this, um, whether it's with a color camera or a mono camera, we're always going to get more detail in the emission nebula from you know these higher contrast narrowband data. So to apply a luminance imaging technique to this kind of data, I don't think makes sense. Um, what you can do is you can create a pseudo luminance, like uh, you know, just extract luminance information and then apply high pass filtering, deconvolution, sharpening, all of those kinds of techniques to your actual narrowband data um, while it's still mono, um, uh, but maybe the HA and O3 combined, so it's representing both, and then use luminance techniques on this. Um, but I don't think it makes sense to try to shoot with a luminance filter for this target, especially from Bortle 9. That's not going to give do you any favors. So you're betting better off just getting more data with your L-Extreme or um, saving for mono camera and three nanometer filters or something like that to get even more contrast from Bortle 9. Um, the, the, my only other comment about this image is I wonder if, uh, if you'd rotated the sensor in relation to the object, you know, uh, you know, the, or the whole image, the whole optical train in relation to the object, if you could have fit uh, it, the more of it in diagonally, um, it seems like maybe you could have, uh, rather than just having this little tip cut off over here, which looks a little awkward. 
Um, but that that's my only other thing I really noticed about uh, about this one. Okay. Uh, and Guillermo. Guillermo captured the Andromeda Galaxy with a Nikon camera and a 55 to 200 millimeter zoom lens on a fixed tripod. And it looks like um, you have very nice star colors here. So I'd personally just go brighter overall with the image. Um, let's see, just what if I just add a curve adjustment here? Yeah, you can see it's sort of clipped to black there. Yeah, look at that. So if I just apply a little curve adjustment, see how the the galaxy um, pops out a bit more. So that's a that's a very small adjustment just to show you with a on your original TIFF it'll work even better. Um, Okay, uh, Guillermo also asked about star aberrations. Um, so I'm, I've pulled up uh, Guillermo's full photo here. And so there's some, you know, uh, artifacts along out here that we should just ignore because it's like uh, over time, I guess, over the time, I guess you've com combined data from different sets at different rotations. And so it's causing some issues out there. Um, so, but if we just focus on the stars in the center and away from center, I can see they do have some coma, um, but I think you might also have a little bit of trailing since all of the coma or all the stars across the field seem to have a little bit of trailing up and down, just a tiny bit. But, you know, I'm not positive that's what it is. It could be the lens. Um, it's definitely not the worst I've seen in terms of distortion, but it's not the best either in terms of a zoom lens. Um, and you know, yeah, all with all these lenses, as we get away from center, uh, it's going to get worse. Get more of this astigmatism. Um, it's pretty common though. There's not really much you can do to improve on that other than stopping down, uh, more, um, but you're on a fixed tripod, so that's why that's why you have so much sort of distortion out here is because you're recentering, um, and then uh, when you stack all of that together, uh, if there's any distortion in the lens, then when you stack it, the distortion gets even worse uh, when you without a tracker. So I don't know. I, I think that if I were you, I wouldn't save for a new lens yet. I'd save for a star tracker then stop down your current lens to like f5.6 and take longer exposures. And that would sort of fix a lot of things. Um, so that's that's where I would go uh, if you have some money to spend on the problem. Hagelpig sent in an image of the Lagoon Nebula taken with a ZWO uh, dual narrowband filter and the details here are really excellent um, and great that the the core details aren't blown out as you often see. Um, Hagelpig asked about how to bring out more of the O3 in the blue spectrum since it's a dual narrowband filter. So there are different techniques there. Uh, you can separate out the color channels uh, and process them separately. So you know you just bring in your data uh, if you're in Photoshop here, you would just take the blue and the green, maybe combine those together, have the red, you know, take these things, uh, separate them out and, and process them and then recombine them. So that's what I usually do. Um, you know, short of that, even just boosting the blue channel uh, with an adjustment will work because the blue data is in there. So I'm just working off the, the JPEG here. So let me do, bear with me. But hopefully you can even see just from doing something like that, where the O3 signal is strongest um, before and after. Um, so it's, it's a different look. Um, you know, it, you may or may not like it, but it, but play around with it. You can, you can try just doing it on the, you know, a starless version, uh, playing around with curves, or you can, again, separate out the channels. Another thing we could try here just as a, 
just for fun is let's just take this blue channel and copy it, paste it on here. I'm just going to then reset the black point of the blue channel and then turn it to screen and let's colorize it to blue. Oh, and we'd have to clip this to just there. Okay, and then I'll reset the black point again. So it takes some uh, finessing. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get it perfect with your JPEG uh, here, but um, hopefully you can see uh, some sort of ideas for techniques of of how to bring it back in. Um, but you, you'd have to you'd have to finesse it further uh, to to really make it look right. Okay, hi on <clears throat> sent in two images from a Bortle 9 location in Vietnam. Wanted to show that untracked astrophotography is possible from a Bortle 9 location. And these were done on a fixed tripod. So no tracker Modified Canon 80D, Canon 70 to 200 zoom lens, stopped down to f5.6. And one of the key things High On did was not go to the maximum focal length of that 70 to 200 lens. These, um, they shot this at uh, 70 millimeters and this one at 100 millimeters. Um, and so by staying sort of uh, more zoomed out, um, that meant that they could do 3.2 second long exposures at 70 and two second long exposures at 100, um, which gives you more light um, in each in each picture and helps manage the noise better. So great job, Hyan. I, I hope this inspires others to try out techniques, even if uh, you know, even if someone like me says they're unadvisable uh, to shoot from shoot on track from Bortle Nine. But I, I think it's it's really cool that people try things like this and show that you can make it work. Um, so I don't really have a specific critique. I think uh, Hyan left these photos a bit dark on purpose to avoid seeing uh, the noise. Um, and I think it worked well because I think they don't look overly noisy and the stars and nebula um, look really nice in both images. All right, Hawken. Uh, submitted the Rosette Nebula taken with a modded Canon 60D, a star tracker, and a Red Cat uh, telescope from William Optics. Um, and this was also shot from a red zone, and but also with a nearly full moon out. So I think given the gear and conditions, this looks pretty good. Um, the only thing I would probably do is try a less dramatic stretch. Um, especially before you use Starnet, because um, uh, when I looked at a, a raw, a single raw sub you sent, and then the final result, the stars don't look very blown out in the sub, um, but they do look a little bit blown out in the final result, meaning that it's more from your processing and how you're stretching the data. Um, I think generally you can just go a bit softer and Usually when I when I use that word softer, I mean less contrast. And when I meet when I say harder or sharper, that means you know more uh, contrast. So the the stars become whiter, the background becomes blacker. Um, so doing a little a little less contrast might work well here. Okay, and then we have Hans three o four. And uh, they converted a Debsonian telescope into an imaging scope by mounting it on an any Q6 mount, uh, which is sort of like uh, an EQ6R. It's the, the older version of that. And they took uh, this very nice detailed shot of the Western Veil Nebula with a ZWO 294MC Pro and an Optolong L Extreme filter. And Hans 304 mentioned that they had issues with AmpGlow, 
which I'm guessing is these lines over here sticking out. Um, and I think that might be also why the O3 is sort of turning into a different color. It's like a nice teal in the middle and then it's sort of turning blue over here. Maybe that's amp glow too. I'm not sure. Um, I've never had trouble with removing amp glow from ZWO cameras when I've matched both the temperature and the gain of the darks. Um, but it, but it, it may be something else in how you're, how you're calibrating. Um, but I would, I would try just, uh, something sim a simple experiment might be just take a, take a single light frame, um, and create a, create a master dark, uh, with those exact same conditions. Um, so same temperature, same gain, same offset, everything the same and try just doing a dark calibration with, with, no, with no other calibration frames. And it should completely remove the amp glow. If it doesn't, uh, then I don't know. Um, short of that, there are some manual fixes you could do uh, in Photoshop, but they'd be really workarounds. And especially with something like these, um, these lines here, I think it would be difficult to get rid of those completely uh, other than just, you know, cropping. Um, but other than the, the, the color shifts, uh, and the, the amp glow, uh, I think this looks really good. Uh, and you have really nice sharp details and you can, you can really see the details because, uh, you've kept the, the black level pretty, pretty high. Um, okay. And then we have Hari 2597. And Hari2597 captured the Milky Way with a Sony mirrorless camera and a lens at 16 millimeter focal length from a Bortle 5. Um, and I think the, the key thing I suggest in processing here is um, not to go too heavy with the blacks um, and, the, and the shadows. Um, so I think there might be some data in the mids that we're missing out on here. Um, I'm not going to be able to recover it all since I just have the, the JPEG, but just to, just to go really crazy here, um, just to show you that you can see the whole dark horse there. If we really, um, push it while well, you're sort of losing it when you really darken the image like that. Um, so I'd say it'd be worth, you know, and maybe the reason you did it the way you did it is because of these bright patches up here and down here that were hard to get rid of. But I'd say even if you cropped it just to the middle section right here, it would be worth cropping down and uh, pushing your data to get more, uh, in my opinion. Okay, here we have Harish who captured the Seder butterfly with a ZWO mono camera, 12 nanometer narrowband filters, and an eight inch Rasa telescope. I think um, the top half of the picture for me is working pretty well. I like all the browns and then the pops of color with the stars. And then you have all the nice dark nebulae intersecting and these golden tones. Um, it's really down here that I don't, I don't like these blues. Um, I don't know. I think it, it's the O3 signal. It's just looking very broken up and too saturated, uh, compared to the rest of the picture. Um, I looked through your workflow, uh, that you sent in Pix Insight, and I think you're, you're overall doing too many steps with your data. And then some of them you're doing in the wrong order. So for instance, the deconvolution and the denoising techniques you're using should be done before the stretch on each linear narrowband master channel. Um, so you, you do the decon and denoising if you want on, on the HA, on the O3, on the S2, while they're still linear before you stretch them. Um, but you did them after combination and after the stretch. Um, I wouldn't really recommend doing it that way. So, 
but I overall I would just try really simplifying your workflow. Um, so to give you an example, I would try just do just stack each uh, narrowband filter, and on each one do dynamic background extraction, uh, do a little bit of noise reduction. Um, you can do a little bit more on the O3 and S2, a little bit less on the HA. Then stretch each narrowband channel, make each one starless, combine them, do the color mask and curves to taste, and then blend back in the stars. Um, and that, that's it. I, I wouldn't, uh, at this point, f focus on all the other stuff. Um, and, and I think, hopefully you'll see, um, be keeping it, less complicated, you might actually get a better uh, result. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think it's 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 very nice and you have great details. I just think that the processing um, uh, with the, the color work here, it seems a little bit of finesse. Okay. And next we have Harry. Harry took this from Hong Kong with a star tracker and a stock Canon 760D and a Canon 70 to 300 zoom lens. And this was Harry's first ever photo of a deep sky object. And that's a, it's a great choice uh, of target for your first uh, deep sky object. I think if it's a winter, I, I'd tell everyone to try Orion Nebula first. If it's summer, I I'd try a Lagoon Nebula. And Harry asked for any tips on processing. I'd say um, just raise your your shadow shadows, your dark part of the picture, um, to see more details. Um, you can see when I did that, just on your image, we're getting some green noise here, so you might have to manage that. Um, but that's that's sort of what I'd recommend is um, raise up uh, your overall brightness, especially in the shadows. Um, and then uh, just play around with um, removing gradients and um, and stretching it a little bit. And then you can also try the starless technique to bring out the nebulae. But that's sort of you don't you don't have to go there yet. Um, I don't think this picture really needs it. Okay, another Harry. Um, this Harry shot the veil. Nebula complex um, with a star tracker, a full spectrum Canon 800D, a Samyang 135 lens, and a CLS CCD filter. And Harry asked about the star color and it being so red. Um, I'm a little confused by that because I'm not used to there being so much chromatic aberration from the Samyang 135. Um, and with a CLS CCD filter, you should be cutting out the IR. So, um, I don't know what's so, why you have so much uh, chromatic aberration on the stars like this. Um, I think what I'd try in this case is removing the stars from this image. And then in the star image, not the starless image, um, applying the camera raw filter pretty aggressively, uh, targeting the orange spectrum. So like this, that's going to give you pretty much, um, you know, colorless stars, but, uh, and you know, usually I don't recommend star reduction, but this, this picture might benefit from it. Um, Oh, and, and you saw that I just, by doing that, what I just did, it removed a lot of the red from the nebulae. But again, if you, if you use the starless technique, um, then you can, re you can return that with, uh, with the starless image. Um, so that's sort of how I would go about processing that one. Okay. And then we have Riemann, uh, who sent in a really nice data of the crescent nebula and the surrounding nebulosity. You know, I like anything in, in Cygnus. Um, uh, one thing I'm noticing here is it it's, it looks backwards to me, um, horizontal uh, against across the horizontal axis. So I'm used to seeing it 
like this. Uh, I'm not sure if you meant to do that, if it was intentional or not, but uh, huh. But anyways, that's just a small thing. Um, the color choice is interesting. I'm not sure if I like it exactly like this. Um, feels a little too alien maybe, but I don't know. It's interesting. Um, you know, you, you could, I'm sure it was intentional, but uh, you could play around with it more and see. Um, you know what you think uh, by just going with something a little bit more uh, traditional. Let's see here. Iggy mentioned he's been having a lot of fun with astrophotography since getting a 10 millimeter lens for his DSLR, so very wide lens, and mentioned that due to his eyesight, he likes the slightly out of focus shots just as much as the in focus ones as it helps him see the natural star color. That's very true. You know, I try to do something similar to this with diffusion filters to make the star, the bright stars bloat, uh, but just making them out of focus uh, can work as well. Of course, the difference is uh, with the diffusion filter, the bright stars blow it and you still get the smaller stars. When you go this out of focus, you just get the bright stars. So, so that's the that's the main difference. Um, I really like this picture though. The, it looks neat, the glow over the mountain range um, and then having the, the tree come in, it just gives it all a nice perspective. And uh, I like the colors. So thanks for sending this, Iggy. I'm glad you're uh, having fun with, with astrophotography again. All right. And then we have Ika. Ika took this photo of Andromeda with a Nikon D5300 DSLR, an old Tamron 135 millimeter telephoto lens without tracking. Uh, so I think it looks good. Lots of good detail and nice processing. Um, my one suggestion is to look at the color balance of the black point. It just, I think it just looks a little too blue. It might be hard to do this with the JPEG. Um, let me just see here. If I use selective color, maybe that might work. So I'm gonna do it on my black. So I'm gonna bring down cyan a little bit and then bring up black. Yeah, I think that did it pretty well. So just an idea, um, just to bring down the blues and the in the blacks uh, a little bit. Um, uh, it might help uh, just even it out and, and make it uh, make the black point a little bit more neutral. All right, I R N B R O Iron Bro uh, took this of the Heart and Soul Nebulae with a Canon 6D and a 100 millimeter lens on a star tracker. They mentioned only using flats with no darks or bias files and then used sequator for pre-processing. Um, main thing that I noticed uh, when looking at the raw data, uh, the raw stack uh, that was sent, let me pull that up, was after subtracting uh, the light pollution background. Um, there were these colored rings of sort of alternating green and magenta. And I am not sure what's up with that. My first guess would be something to do with the flats and the way that you pre-processed. So I would try just stacking just the lights and see if those rings go away. Um, if that doesn't work, then I don't know what's next. Maybe just see if they appear again in your next uh, astro photo. I mean, it's probably it's been six months now since you sent this in, so you probably know if those have reappeared. Um, but I'm not sure what they would be if it, if it's not the flats. It could be some kind of light pollution artifact or something like that. Um, but other than the these rings, which would make processing difficult. Um, I think your data looks really good. So hope you can figure that out. Okay. And then next we have 
Island Astro, and Island Astro captured the North America and Pelican Nebulae with a modified Canon DSLR and a 75 to 300 millimeter lens on a star tracker. And they mentioned not being able to recover good star color. I think the issue there is one of color balancing. Um, because even though the image is made up mostly of these red nebulae, um, the image overall looks like not particularly well color balanced. Uh, you can see the red channel is just like super dominant. Um, more so than uh, normal. Uh, and the, the other giveaway here is that in the, in the central part here, this dark nebula should not be this red. It should be more of a neutral black. Um, so uh, I would just, you know, early on in the process, keep color balancing your channels a bit more um, as you're stretching. And you should be able to get these this red tone under control, which will make... Uh, the star color better too. Um, and then I will also just mention that PixInsight, which is a paid program, or Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, can make all of this easier because um, you can do things like background extraction and uh, photometric color calibration and all these tools that are specific to make your the colors in your astrophoto work well right away. Um, but it's, it's possible in Photoshop too, just by paying attention to your channels uh, as you're stretching and making sure the red isn't sort of taking over uh, too much. Okay, and then we have Ivan. Ivan sent in a photo of the Seder region in Cygnus uh, taken with a full frame stock Nikon DSLR and a William Optics Z61 with flattener. And Ivan identified two issues. One that he felt he might not have had the right spacing on the field flattener. And then the second, that the stars on the right side were leaving artifacts after running Starnet++. So I'd say these issues are most likely related. Um, you may also have tilt issues, um, which are going to be more common with a full frame sensor like you're using. Um, even half a millimeter of tilt can cause the stars to be not very round uh, and, you know, on one side or the other. Um, so. The two steps I'd, I'd do to, to figure this out is if you have the new adjustable field flattener from William Optics, make sure that you've set it correctly uh, to give you the correct back focus. I mean, that might be obvious, but uh, read the instructions, try to make sure that you understand, you know, how much, uh, where the sensor sits in a Nikon DSLR and then what you have in between. It should be pretty simple with your T adapter and everything like that, but just Make sure you have that set up correctly. And then two, look at your T adapter itself, which is the thing with the T ring inside and then a, a Nikon uh, mounting. And make sure there's no wobble there or rotational uh, wobble, because uh, that might cause tilt. Um, and if there if there is anything, um, if it has like the little grub screws, make sure to, to tighten those up, make sure that everything feels very secure and thread not threaded onto the telescope evenly. Um, you, you know, other than that with this picture, um, my personal preference is not to shrink the stars as much as you have here. Um, you know, I think that only draws attention to the stars being weird on this side, since it's so they're much smaller on this side and much bigger on this side. Um, so I would just more leave the stars alone and blend them in with, uh, you know, a blending mode and and see what it looks like after that and then if it, if you don't like how they look or how much dominance they're taking on the picture just um play around with uh this the stretch on the stars layer okay next we have jacko and jacko captured the milky way from australia with a Canon 6D Mark II and a Tamron zoom lens set to 75 millimeter focal length without a star tracker. They stacked their pictures in Cyril and processed with Photoshop and Starnet++. And uh, Jacko also sent, let me pull this up.
And Jacko also sent this nice summary of their image processing steps, which is very useful. Um, I think the one thing that stood out is that there should be a way to export from Cyril without a stretch applied. Um, I'm guessing this is with the auto stretch applied, which is what's causing so many stars to clip. And then in the final image, they still look a little clipped. So if you could figure out how to export the linear TIFF from Cyril and stretch that in Photoshop, I think you could bring out even more detail. Um, or you could also stretch it in Cyril, but not as much as you did here. I'm not sure why it's so stretched. Um, but other than that, I think it looks very good. I like the framing uh, with the, you know, the strong diagonal of the Milky Way. Um, and the color looks great. The, the I would just work on the stars um, and controlling the stretch out of Cyril uh, should should help with that. Okay, I've seen this one before. Uh, James is on my Discord, um, and James took three thousand six hundred photos untracked to capture this image of the Cygnus loop, uh, which is the whole Veil Nebula supernova remnant over here and framed it with this uh, very cool uh, little star cluster, open star cluster here. Um, and I believe that's called NGZ, NGC 6940. Um, and I think this photo is very impressive. It's hard enough to shoot the Veil Nebula with a camera lens and stock camera because of the dense star field, as you can see here. But to do it without tracking even uh, is really challenging. Um, so this is very impressive. Um, my one critique of it uh, is that there are some color shifts in the sky background that I think are not purely natural. Um, or if they are natural, they still just don't look quite right. Um, you know, they, they, it sort of is like an alternating red, blue, red, blue, red. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, there if there's going to be a good way to get rid of those without uh, ruining sort of the naturalistic uh, processing uh, you have here. So, uh, but that would be my one critique is if there would be a way to process it without those sort of color shifts, which I think even if they are um, correct, they look a little odd. Um, uh, but other than that, I think it's 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 beautifully done. Um, okay, here we have Cygnus. This is by Jankowski, who took this with a modified Fuji camera, a zoom lens set to 90 millimeter focal length, and a wind-up Omegon star tracker. And once again, this is shows you can get great results with simple gear, and the the framing is good. I like the processing. Um, this is one of my favorite kinds of framings for a setup where you have to manually center and maybe recenter since it was a windup tracker is to put a bright star right in the middle of the frame, but then have lots of interesting stuff going on around that bright star. Uh, you know, there's not too many of these uh, options in the night sky, but but Cygnus offers this nice one at 90 millimeter focal length on an APS-C camera, I'm guessing. Um, so we have the neb and then Seder, uh, and there you've got a nice color shift there. This is the neb looks blue and, and uh, Seder is more yellowish white. Um, so you can get big impact with these constellation shots. If you know, if you know how to frame them, you know how to rotate your camera to get the right uh, framing of all the objects. And this is Jay. Jay captured the Milky Way with a modified Canon camera, a star tracker, and a Sigma zoom lens set to 17 millimeters. And they also took a three minute exposure without tracking to get better details on the foreground. And I really like how uh, the Milky Way and the clouds over here form this sort of V shape to, or a bowl shape to hold the tree and get and also sort of lead your eye into the tree and then back out to the Milky Way. Um, 
So very nice framing. <clears throat> uh, my one critique of their finished photo is uh, with this composition, with the foreground being this dark, I feel like it just, uh, it, too much of the photo is just sort of dark foreground. It doesn't add much. Uh, there's all this dark dirt down here. Um, so I'd suggest cropping most of that away, um, doing a something more like that. Um, or if you want to include a little bit of it, more of it, maybe put the, the horizon line at this bottom third, but I think even something like that might be even better. Um, so that's just my preference. Uh, I think that if you have a lot of the picture that's not really adding much, then it's it's taking away from the part of the picture that's that's important. Uh, so the Milky Way. Okay, another J uh, that uh, sent in a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy taken with a Sony camera and a Sony zoom lens on a Celestron Astromaster mount with an added DC motor. And Jay asked about bringing out the outer parts of Andromeda more. I think um, what helps me in these situations is to use the, the Starnet++ plus plus process um, to, because it, it's really good at bringing out some of these fainter details in the shadows. Uh, when you then screen blend the star layer back on, it really makes those pop without bloating the stars. Um, it helps keep the stars sort of where they are now, but boosting the the shadow detail. Now, of course, that also boosts some noise, um, but then you can use curves to push that back down a little bit while keeping the galaxy brighter. So that's sort of what I'd recommend trying is the is the starless technique that I show in the in the Andromeda uh, start to finish video. Okay, and yet another J also sent in an image of Andromeda. This one is taken with an Omegon wind-up tracker, a Canon DSLR, and a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens. And Jay asked about getting more details in the galaxy and if it's just a matter of more total integration. So more total integration, that means getting more photos, more total time on the target. That helps change the signal to noise ratio, which can help bring out dim details. But I think the dim details are already brought out here pretty well. So I'm trying to think, um, let me look at them. A little bit better yeah they're already pretty good um so i think there's really sort of two ways to bring out uh, the details better um one is to examine all of your light frames all of your sub exposures and only pick the ones with the best detail the ones where they look the sharpest um so that's one idea um the other thing would be to use a lens or a telescope with a higher focal length and more aperture, um, but that might not work with your wind-up tracker. Uh, so that that might be a big gear upgrade to do that kind of thing. So, yeah, you might be sort of at the limit here of how much detail you're going to get with a wind-up tracker and a and a zoom lens on Andromeda, but um, if you're into nebulae, there's a lot of nebulae that don't really have uh, they have bigger details or, or the details aren't as important as with a galaxy. So I would, I would go after some of those with your wind-up tracker, like in Cygnus or Orion or things like that. Um, and then if you want to get, you know, better at the galaxy stuff, it might eventually require a, a gear upgrade. Okay. And then we have Jeev. Jeev sent in an image of the Milky Way taken from a red zone, wow, so very light polluted, untracked with a kit DSLR and kit lens at f3.5. So this is a very impressive image actually um, uh, to, to use that equipment and get this much detail on the, the dark uh, horse and the star cloud, uh, Sagittarius star cloud. That's really cool. Um, so we have some ring reflections here 
I'm guessing those are from, they're sort of all over the image, but they're most noticeable over here where there's not other stuff going on. And those are probably from light jumping into your lens at odd angles. And uh, you, mean, you can see all this light stuff, local light pollution here. So and my guess is that that's what's happening is you're, you're getting all these small reflections inside the lens, uh, which causes these rings and weird stuff. Um, only way to eliminate those would be to like get some kind of blocking system, uh, you know, so that that light isn't coming into the lens at odd angles. Like, uh, I've used trash bins and things like that before. Um, but it's a little annoying, uh, but you could try that. Um, other than that, the, it's a ni nice job. I think the eye is, uh, like I said, really drawn to the star cloud here, uh, and it's, it's interesting juxtaposing the night sky with uh, this bright building. Okay, and then uh, this is Jeff. Uh, Jeff captured the Elephant Trunk Nebula with an Apertura telescope, an Op Optolong L Enhance filter, and the ZWO 533MC camera, which uh, has this square aspect ratio. And uh, nice job bringing out the blues. It's sort of it's cool to see these uh, deep blues here. I'd suggest taming the saturation a bit, um, as the, it's just it's a little bit um, one note, especially in the reds here. Um, and I just have the JPEG here, but uh, what I'd aim for saturation. Let's see, something like like that. Um, will help bring out, I think, more uh, variations in the color. Um, the last thing is the stars look a little bit bloated, and I'm not sure if that's a processing issue or a focusing one or is it, uh, or what. Um, but take a look at your single exposures to maybe find out if, if you think... Because, uh, I mean, the, some of these smaller stars do look pretty tight but then the this it may and it might be overexposure too so maybe uh you might have to tame down your your exposure to keep the stars um not a little tighter than this um these big stars so i'm not sure but they just look a little bit uh fat and blown blown out to me okay then this is Jeremy, and Jeremy sent in an image of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebulae taken with a Red Cat telescope, a Canon DSLR, and a Star Tracker. I think this looks good. I like the framing a lot. Um, you know, it's nice to see this the the Lagoon extending into this uh, cool nebula up here, uh, and then this bright star. It has a really nice flow. To it here. Um, Jeremy asked about controlling noise, especially thermal noise, with a DSLR in the summer months. So I have two suggestions. Uh, one is to try manually dithering, dithering your star adventurer. Um, it's not something I've been particularly good about, but I know other people do it. So it has RA dithering, which can be automatic, but if you want to really get the best out of dithering you'd also want to maybe manually dither in deck uh, with the declination bracket it's going to be too annoying to do it every frame so or even every couple frames i'd so i'd try every 10 frames um but just you know move the ra a bit with the buttons or whatever and then you can move the deck with the bracket um with the like the slow motion controls um I've not been, like I said, I've not been good about doing that, but dithering can help with uh, n noise and thermal noise, uh, like hot pixels and stuff. The other thing uh, with thermal noise is to try shorter sub-exposures at higher ISO. So let's say you're doing 60 second sub-exposures at ISO 800. Then on a really hot night when thermal noise might be an issue, try 30 second sub-exposures at ISO 1600. So have the exposure time and double the ISO. And that should give you about the same image brightness, but with less thermal noise because thermal noise adds up in longer subs. 
Okay, a different Jeremy captured this image of the Orion constellation with a Pentax camera and a Takumar 135 millimeter lens at f4.5 on a Vixen star tracker. It's about six hours total integration of 30 second shots. I think this is very well done. I think the the detail and the dust across the neb, uh, you know across the constellation is great. Um, and, and also the detail in M78 over here and the Horsehead Nebula are very impressive. Um, my one suggestion, if you have Photoshop, and there is probably ways to do this in other programs too, is uh, if you have Photoshop, there's this defringe option down here in Camera Raw Filter under Optics. And I would just... Um, use this pretty aggressively something like that hmm for some reason it didn't work in this region as well well i'd have to figure out why but um i just think that uh the the purple and uh, the sort of overwhelming purple and orangeness of the stars uh, is the only thing I find distracting about your shot. And so if you can tame those a bit, I think it's uh it'll be better. Okay. And then we have Jim not carry. Um, so I, I really like this one. Um, you know, at first you might think that this framing is a mistake, but Jim Not Carey said this is what he specifically was interested in, was showing the Milky Way's transition um, uh, into just normal sky and how far these dark nebula streamers on this side of the Milky Way uh, extended. Because we often see the other side, which is the Rho Ophiuchi side, but this side is uh, not as often image. So I think that's pretty cool and pretty interesting. Um, this was taken unfiltered, I mean, untracked just on a tripod with a Canon DSLR and a Canon Nifty 50 lens wide open at f1.8. So that's impressive too. Uh, so it looks pretty good. Um, star distortions don't look bad at all. Um, I think uh, I mostly, with an edit for, if I was going to edit it, um, I would mostly just want it to go brighter. Um, uh, just, you know, like even like something like that. Uh, not quite that far, maybe like that far. So here's before and after. Um, just to, to show, off, I think that shows off the transition from Milky Way to non-Milky Way better. Um, if it was a little brighter, and it also shows off the contrast with the dark nebulae uh, a bit better. Um, and then there's some little bit of artifacts down here and up here. And I think you, you didn't want to crop those out because then you'd be losing too much of the Milky Way and you'd be losing the lagoon. So um, instead, you could manually go in with Photoshop and try to correct those with a little masking. Um, but uh, I'm not going to show that, but it, but it's pretty uh, simple to do. Just sort of you just want a curves uh, adjustment layer, and then um, draw in a little gradient mask on the curves adjustment layer to fix those. Okay, next we have Joao Andre Bastos. Joao Andre Bastos captured the Milky Way. Um, from Portugal with a Panasonic Micro Four Thirds camera and a wide angle lens. And this was their first time photographing the night sky. So this is great for your first time. Very interesting. Lots of nice um, detail here. Uh, I think you just went a little bit too hard with the noise reduction because it looks a little blurred in some places, but uh, really not too far off from what I think I would do with it. Um, so, uh, and then there's some um, stuff down here. You know, there's the, 
the orange, but then there's also sort of a green. And I'm not sure how much of that is natural sky glow. I'm suspecting that some of this green actually is what we call natural air glow. Um, and it's, uh, it's something you're going to see um, with darker locations, especially low in the sky. Um, and it can take on pretty interesting colors, like a very vibrant greens, but it can also be orange. So I don't know how much of this is air glow versus uh, light pollution. Um, one advantage that you have being in the Southern Hemisphere is that at certain times of year, the Milky Way will be very high in the sky. So if you can shoot it then, that's really ideal. And usually the air glow doesn't extend all the way up, uh, straight up at Zenith, uh, where uh, from what I've heard and seen, and from what I've heard from other people, uh, even this core part of the Milky Way will get right up in the uh, right straight up in the sky at times at certain times a year. Okay, um, Joel, Joel sent in an image of the central Orion area shot with a Nikon D5600 and a Samyang 135 lens on a Skywatcher Star Adventure. And Joel mentioned a green hue that he had trouble getting rid of. Um, yeah, maybe a, a, over by Orion, I see a little bit of a green hue. I think that you can just sort of, uh, you know, make a selection of it. That's a pretty bad selection, but anyways, just make some kind of selection of it and, um, you know, drop down the green in that area. And then it's going to look really obviously, uh, wrong maybe at first, but then if you just feather the selection, usually that works pretty well for me. I might want to feather it quite a bit. Um, so just where you see some kinds of weird little color shifts, um, Usually you can just attack them with a little bit of uh, curves and selective masking in Photoshop. Um, or if you have something like uh, PixInsight or Cyril, then usually the background extraction can take care of color shifts pretty well too. Um, All right, well, good job with this one. I think it, the nebulae come across really well. Okay, here we have M31 with uh, two meteors. Um, and I've, since stacking algorithms will reject uh, meteor trails if you have them on, you know, uh, Sigma clipping or something like that, um, what uh, Johnson did here is he. Uh, stacked hundreds of photos together and then composited uh, the meteors back in with Photoshop. And I really like this. Anything that shows the scale of different kinds of astronomical objects always makes for a good photo. And it was quite lucky to get uh, two pretty brilliant bright meteors of different colors in one 70 millimeter frame in one night. So congrats, Johnson. I did I don't really have anything to critique. Uh, this is a really cool capture you made here of uh, some meteors and Andromeda. Okay, John captured the Dumbbell Nebula with a Skywatcher 250P and a SV Boney 305 camera. So big telescope, small camera, uh, which is why this very small planetary nebula usually is filling our frame here. Um, and I think this looks great. It's an interesting technique using many short exposures with a small sensor on a big scope. Um, the stars are a little bit funky in that they're multi-colored, but um, other than that, uh, I think this looks really nice. I'm not sure where that multi-coloredness is coming from. Um, maybe, I don't know, because uh, you're using a mirror, mirrors, maybe it's from using a coma corrector I'm not sure uh, but anyways uh, other than that I think this looks really nice and I am very interested in the the technique of using short exposures with a with a large uh, telescope and a, and and a fairly inexpensive sensor in the SV Boney 305.
Okay, Joost from the Netherlands uh, captured Cygnus with a Canon DSLR and a Canon Nifty 50 lens on a Star Tracker. And Joost had some people helping him with processing advice, but they were Pix Insight users, so he was wondering if I could show a workflow in Photoshop. Um, sure. So let me jump over to this one. And I'll start at the bottom here. Okay, so first thing I did was um, I stretched the data and made a starless version here. And then I also made a regular version with, with just the stars. Um, but, okay, so I started with the regular version. Sorry, I stretched it and then I made this starless version. Put the starless version on the bottom here. Um, and I made that with Starnet++. And then I'm just going to uh, work with some curves adjustments, some hue and saturation, and more curves to correct the color balance. And so it's looking a little funky, but um, it's really just to bring out these nebula regions well. And then a lot of the funkiness gets hidden when we add back in the stars, um, which are stretched a little bit uh, differently than maybe I started with, um, but you can also control them here in Photoshop by just applying a curves adjustment layer and then um, just clipping it to the stars. So here's before, and then if I just hold down the Alt key and clip this, there's after. Uh, and then the last thing is I just noticed there's a little bit of a red glow down here so I just tried to sort of fix that a little bit with a curves adjustment and a gradient mask. So that's it. Um, and so it, it's it's not perfect, but um, hopefully you get the idea for a Photoshop workflow that sort of helps bring out the, the nebula details um, and uh, isn't isn't really destroying any of the the quality of the image too much. Um, yeah, when I say it's not perfect, there's some other things I'm noticing here, like little green shifts and things that you, you could work on. But uh, that's that's the basic workflow for you. Okay, next we have uh, J R Arquez. J.R. Arquez sent in an image of the Orion Nebula taken with a DSLR and Tamron zoom lens on a small Skywatcher mount. Looks good, some nice details, nice star shape and color. Um, my one critique is the sky background is a little bit um, pink and, and bright. So just to show you what you could do with just some simple curves adjustments, uh, there's before and then after just playing around with the color curves uh, to color balance it a little bit differently. Okay, and then we have J Regs. 85815. JREGS 815 captured the Wizard Nebula with a ZWO 533MC and an 8 inch Newtonian. Um, you know, and the detail, color, uh, framing all look good to me here. Um, the main issue I see is with the stars. I think you dimmed them um, a bit aggressively. Um, and I'm guessing. The reason you did that uh, is to hide the fact that they're a little bit funky. Um, you know, they're distorted in a way that's typical of needing a coma corrector. Um, and then on the bright stars, you can see this double diffraction line means they're they're not in perfect uh, collimation. So. Uh, I would just look into, you know, collimating uh, your telescope uh, better because then you'll get sharper details on uh, everything too. Um, 
So there's different kinds of collimation tools. I'm not going to go into it here. I'll just say I use a, a laser collimator that also has the attachment for barlowing it. So you can do the primary mirror adjustment. I think that's really easy. Uh, it works pretty well and pr pretty fast. So uh, work on collimation. And then if you can afford it, I'd also get a coma corrector to help with the stars. Okay, Julian shot the North America and Pelican with a Skywatcher 80ED and an Optolong L Enhance filter. And then they, they said that they used the auto stretch in Pix Insight on the separated HA and O3 channels. Um, and then also noted that the overall result was maybe more red than they would like. So I think the, the first thing to say there is to, I would avoid the auto stretch. Um, instead, stretch the O3 and the HA by hand using histogram transformation and just trying to sort of equalize the uh, the brightness of them uh, by looking at them. Um, and th that way you'll get a lot more power over the balance of the blue and the red and, and not have the image being so red. Um, but even if I was just to mess around, you know, here in Photoshop, I think we could we could do something interesting probably. Let's see. So let's just go into reds and add more cyan to red. And let's add it to magenta too. And then maybe we'll add a little saturation. Oh, too much. Okay, so here's before and after. So you can see it's the, it's in your data definitely to have bring out those blues. Um, so you just have to work work with it. Uh, and in terms of the the stars, it doesn't. I don't think it really matters too much. You could you could do this on a on the star uh, layer. The other thing I'm noticing here is the even the the dark nebula parts are a little bit too red. Um, so what you can do there is you can just grab the black point. Ooh, and that's really working well. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so that's, that's I think, a key part too there is just um, add a curves, grab your red channel, and reset the black point on, on the red channel. And here's before and after. So you can, you can do a lot of this color balancing in Photoshop after everything's combined, but also you can control a lot of it in the stretch uh, as well. Okay, a different Julian shot this image of a section of the Milky Way and Messier 11, which is the wild duck cluster right here. Something I've never shot, looks really nice though. And uh, Julian mentioned pre-processing with Cyril. Um, didn't mention Cyril's background extraction. So if, um, if, you, if you're having issues with sort of color gradients and things like that, I would try try the background extractor tool in um, in Cyril. I, I tried it with your data and got a, a fairly different result than you did. Um, I mean, not wildly different, just I, I think that uh, a little bit more star color after uh, running that. Um, So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, exactly what steps we did that were so different if we both used it, but uh, try it out if you, if you, if you haven't. And, it, and if you have tried it and, it's, and it wasn't working quite right, try placing the samples differently because that makes a big uh, difference to the, to the result. Okay. Um, Justin. And Justin said they're still pretty new, but they sent in a nice shot of the Orion Nebula done with a Nikon DSLR and a zoom lens on a star tracker. And Justin stacked in AstroPixel processor, which is another program I haven't, uh, I, I own it, but I haven't played with it too much. And they processed in Photoshop. And Justin only sent the JPEG. Um, so there's only so much I could show here, but, um, I think that they could go a bit further with the stretch. 
So let me just put an S curve on here just to show what I mean. So just to just to show, I think there's more uh, data in there to sort of bring out. Um, the other thing that stands out are some of these black um, marks, like right. Hold on. like here and here uh, and in different places. Um, so my guess is what's going on with those is you have uh, dust or something on your sensor. And then when you when your shot slightly drifts across the night, um, that and then you stack all the pictures together based on the star patterns, that dust is uh, causing these streaks. So two things to help with that. One is to blow on your sensor, uh, holding it upside down with just a manual air blower to try to get rid of those. And then the second thing to try is flat frames will, will help a lot with that kind of stuff. Okay, and then we have Joule, and Joule sent an image of the Pinwheel Galaxy uh, M101 and it was taken with a 200 millimeter Newtonian telescope and a Canon DSLR. And they said they just got a coma corrector, but this shot was taken before they got it. Okay, and they wondered about their stars looking bloated when they think they have best focus. So my guess is your stars may sharpen up um, with the coma corrector. Even in the center, they might get a little sharper, but especially away from center. Um, and then I guess collimation, I'm, I'm not, I can't really tell with these stars how well collimated they are. Uh, focus doesn't look off to me, so I'm not sure. In terms of processing, I think this looks really great. Um, I'd probably boost the saturation a little bit of the blues and the reds in the galaxy. So something like that. And, um, and then maybe make the sky background just a little bit darker for more drama. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, from you if, if the coma corrector has helped make your stars even in the center sharper um, or, or not. Because uh, I'm not sure if the I've mostly I've only mostly only used Newtonians with a coma corrector, so I'm not sure how big a difference it makes in the center. Cam, who lives in Denmark, uh, sent an image of the Pac-Man Nebula and mentioned that it was taken in the summer months when it never gets fully dark in Europe at their latitude. And uh, they also were using a stock DSLR um, on uh, a target that's mostly, you know, emission, uh, HA emission. Um, it looks like there's some nice, uh, good detail in here, though. Um, but it's it's lacking much color uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, but especially in the nebula, I wonder if we could uh, bring out more. And Cam did send the TIFF. So I tried my hand at processing it here. And uh, there's my attempt at processing it. Um, I was able to bring up more of the reds. Um, and all I did was in PixInsight, I did a single automatic uh, background extraction. I then stretched the data um, and applied Starnet++. And then here in Photoshop, I brought the starless picture in and darkened the background. Then I added the stars back in uh, just by bringing that layer in and setting it to screen blend mode. And then uh, adjusted the saturation and the black point again. So pretty simple processing, um, but the data looks really good, really pretty clean for uh, being shot in the summer. And um, the collimation looks spot on. You can see the diffraction spikes is just a very classic uh, uh, sharp line diffraction spike. So good job, Cam. Okay, next we have Camille. And 
Camille sent in an image of the Andromeda Galaxy and said they had mostly done wide-angle lens work before this. So this was their first astrophoto with a telephoto lens. And they took about 300 shots untracked at f5. Their issues were they thought the sky wasn't black enough. I don't, I don't think I agree with that. And the image you sent, the sky is very black, to actually sort of too black for my taste. Um, maybe you were trying to hide noise and you're saying um, it didn't look black enough until you uh, made it black. I'm not sure. But that's sort of inevitable with untracked deep skies. We're going to get some noise. Um, if you did go from 300 shots to, let's say, 1,000 shots, it would be a lot easier in terms of managing the noise. Um, and then color balance is a very hard thing in astrophotography. My biggest recommendation is to use Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. It's a free program, and you can use the background extraction tool and then the color calibration tool before you're bringing your TIFF into Photoshop, and that will help a lot to get you to a sort of neutral starting place. Um, and then my other tip for color calibration is just to look at other pictures of Andromeda online, like on Astrobin, compare them to yours. Um, I'd say um, compared to other images of Andromeda, I'm seeing yours looks a little purple in these outer arms and you might want them to look a little bit more blue. Um, so uh, we could go about that by trying to remove some magenta from the image. This is just on the JPEG, of course, but something like that. Um, I think it's you to a slightly better uh, color balance. Okay, another Camille. Um, this other Camille sent in an image of uh, Ro Ofuki Cloud Complex taken with a Sigma Art 135 and a Canon camera on a Star Tracker. And Camille said the biggest two issues were only one hour of data and that the object didn't rise very high in the sky from their location at 51 degrees north. Um, I think the details in the nebula and the saturation level are pretty perfect in the in the nebula part here. Um, my two suggestions, um, or maybe three, three suggestions, are all in processing. First is to um, work on the green noise a little bit. I think that some of this green noise seems unnatural to me. Um, and you can see it in a few different places in the image. But I think in Cyril, there's a green noise reduction tool that should work well. Um, just to show you sort of what I mean, let me just pull down the green a little bit. Okay, so something like that. Um, and then my next suggestion is to back off on star reduction. So um, I just think this, the small stars are too small in your image. Um, it's, they're, sort of, they're starting to look sort of like noise um, because they're so reduced. And then the last thing is I think it's a little bit too dark on this side of the image compared to this side. So I would just... If you didn't take flats, I'm not. Um, I, I'm not sure. I can't remember if you said you took flats, but um, you could just try brightening up that side, you know, with a curve or something, um, and a and a gradient. So let me just try that real quick here. Something like that. I mean, it's going to look weird in a JPEG, but just to give you an idea. Um, so those are my three. Uh, suggestions to try to get a little bit more flat, removing green, and back off on the on the star reduction. Okay, next up we have Carol. Carol sent in an image of Cygnus region taken with a stock DSLR and kit lens, and this is definitely a challenging scene uh, and untracked, of course. And this is definitely a challenging scene for that uh, kind of setup, uh, untracked uh, with a kit lens. Carol mentioned they did some processing on their own and then sent it to a friend who did some processing in PixInsight. And um, I think the PixInsight part got a little bit um, out of hand. They were they were trying. I can see what they were trying to do, which is bring out the nebula and reduce the star field. Um, 
but there's just so many artifacts from I think the star reduction and maybe they did a noise reduction. I'm not sure uh, that it, it got pretty, it, it, it's, it's pretty messy, I guess. Um, just, I just want to show you what it looks like with my sort of standard um, way of processing an image uh, just to show what's in it. Um, so this is just a stretch, a color balance stretch. Um, then I use Starnet, gets me there. Um, then I used curves and saturation to bring out the color. Finally, you bring the stars back in. I really reduced uh, the levels on this star layer uh, uh, to just sort of uh, get the big stars and the, their color. And then I did another uh, uh, layer of stars. And then we're going to reset the black point. Finally, I did um, just sort of a manual uh, burning dot, you know, bur there's the burn and dodge tool. So I just did a quick burn of the center here to bring it um, down to flatten out the image a little bit. And then a final curve to reduce the red noise in the background. So I think that's um, uh, a quick and easy sort of way to to process uh that gives you an idea of your your data set here. Um, in terms of improving it, um, I think it's 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 a lot about just sort of Cygnus is really hard untracked with the kit lens. I think you'll have better luck um, on the Milky Way core in Sagittarius or uh, the constellation of Orion because um, those are a little bit a little bit easier with the kit lens. Um, and then if you're looking to to step step up a little bit i think getting uh getting moving beyond the kit lens to a nicer lens uh but still going untracked would work well uh, but i hope you keep up with the hobby and uh, like to see more from you all right and here we have orion without tracking this is kartik's first astrophoto very good for a first try and the perfect object to go after too is orion nebula um my suggestion for improvement is just to stretch it further, as I'm guessing there is more data in here to bring out. Um, so just um, going further with the stretch, um, you can sort of start seeing the shape of the Orion Nebula here when I stretch it more. And uh, you might also be start bringing out the Running Man as well. Okay, Kent took this photo of Andromeda. Oh, sorry. Back up. Okay, this is Kartik's first astrophoto, and it's very good for a first try. It, you know, Orion's the perfect object to go after it, for your first uh, astrophoto. Uh, my suggestion for improvement is just to stretch it more. Um, uh, just to give you an idea of what I mean, I processed it here. And you can see I'll get a little bit more of the running man and a little bit more of the shape of the Orion Nebula um, just by stretching the photo more. And I did use the, the starless technique that I've shown a number of times here. Um, so that gives you an idea of sort of a direction to, to go with it. Uh, but keep it up, Kartik. And here is Kent. Uh, Kent shot the Andromeda Galaxy with a wind-up Omegon star tracker and a Canon DSLR and zoom lens. And Kent mentioned having issues with polar alignment due to only being at 9 degrees latitude. Was wondering if there's anything he could buy uh, to help with polar alignment. You know, nothing immediately comes to mind, um, but a whole series of videos on polar alignment is something I definitely want to do, but I have to research, you know, all the different ways myself. Um, I know there are more and more software assisted methods, uh, some of which don't require a view of Polaris. So I believe if you want to look into that, the free software Nina has an add-on module for plate solving without a view of the pole and some kind of polar alignment method there. 
I'm not sure how well it's going to work um, with a wind-up Omegon tracker. Um, but I, I'll pay attention to the channel, and, and hopefully I'll have a video on this at some point. I, I think, But I think this already looks very good for the equipment that you're using. Um, in terms of uh, processing, I just would suggest damping, tamping down this um, uh, bright area over here. I'm not sure what it's from, but I just used a curve and a sort of uh, unusual mask I just made with a, a soft brush uh, to tamp down that uh, bright spot. And then I brought down the uh, overall darkness of the fo of the background a little bit more after that. Um, it gives it a little bit more of a dramatic look on, on Andromeda. Okay, next up we have Kerman, and Kerman sent in a nice image of the Lagoon and Triffid done untracked with a Rokinon 135 and Canon DSLR. And I'm very impressed that this is only six minutes integration from a Bortal 7 Sky, because it really pulled out a lot of detail uh, in just six minutes. Um, and the, the one thing I'd say is just the, the color is a little... Um, dull maybe um it's a little uh feels like there's still a bit of sort of like overall red yellowishness to it um so i went ahead and and tried processing your photo uh from scratch and um you can see i did a fair amount of sort of work here to even out the field because this was shot untracked um so that's sort of par for the course with untracked you get weird uh things because you're constantly recentering it and all of that. But, um, you know, if you'd asked me, is this tracked or untracked data? I probably would have guessed tracked because it's really nice for six minutes from uh, Bortle 7. So um, I think you you have a, a really a good copy of the Rokinon lens here, and uh, I think you'll make some really nice images with it. Okay, next up we have Kiryubel, a 15-year-old astrophotographer from Arizona who sent a photo of the Rosette Nebula done with a Canon DSLR and zoom lens on an Omegon wind-up tracker from a Bortle 8 Sky. So that, that combo, I've been getting a lot here. Canon DSLR, uh, Canon zoom lens, and an Omegon wind-up tracker. I'm going to have to try that out. Um, so for that setup, I think this looks really great. My one advice is that it's very hard to do the rosette from a light polluted sky because um, it's hard to make the transition from the rosette to the dark, darker part of the sky very natural since it, it does keep extending out. There's very dim parts, um, um, but you sort of have to pick where you're going to start to clip the data to black. Um, so... Anyways, um, it's it, but it's still it's still a good target for for bright skies because it's so the core part is so bright. Um, so here's my attempt at, at sort of doing a natural transition into the dark uh, parts of the sky. Um, it's not perfect, um, but I, this is what what I came up with uh, using your data just to give you an idea. One thing I'd say is um, on yours, it's a little bit crunchy, um, a little bit um, high contrast in here, um, which is so the, the rosette doesn't feel very filled in. Um, so what I was trying to do with mine is go a little bit softer. Um, just, to sh just to step through the layers for you here. Okay, I think we use a lot of the same processing techniques. It's just a matter of you know the details of how you how you do it. Um, next up, we have Crinchy. Crinchy shot the Andromeda Galaxy at f two with a Yahika fifty millimeter lens on a Canon sixty D, and uh, this is really nice processing. Um, this was uh, 
there, there's Crunchy pointed out that there's very strong distortion here on the stars and the corners. Um, and that's, you know, really common with a fast 50 millimeter lens when you shoot it, uh, wide open like this. Um, I actually, I, you know, the, it's the same thing on the Canon nifty 50. If you shoot that at F 1.8, I actually think though, that it looks sort of cool, uh, in this kind of shot where the galaxy is centered like this, because the distortion is so regular, you know, that it almost looks like a warp drive effect of like, uh, you know, in star Trek, when you sort of enter warp speed and it, and the stars start to, to streak, uh, on the sides like this. Um, so that's one way of, of thinking about it that maybe will, uh, make you en enjoy it, enjoy the distortion a little bit. Um, but to get, yeah, to get rid of it, you'd probably have to start tracking and, and stop down the lens quite a bit. Um, maybe like to F4, F5.6, something like that. Um, and then, but then you're stopping down the lens so much that you're going to want to track to get the long exposures. Um, Crinchy said he also, uh, has, a kit lens was wondering if this is better or worse than the kit lens. I'm guessing this is going to be better than the kit lens. So I'd stick with, I'd stick with this one. Okay. And, uh, this was sent to me by Kunal. Kunal sent in, uh, here, the California Nebula taken only with a cell phone untracked. Um, so that's cool. I've never thought of the, of doing the California Nebula untracked with a smartphone. Um, I never thought I'd see it. Um, so, uh, because just cause it's a very diffuse nebula and I didn't think that a smartphone would pick it up with its small pixels and small lens, but there we are. Um, Kunal sent their tracked, uh, their stacked, uh, TIF file. They, so they stacked a bunch of pictures together from their phone. And, um, I thought that was pretty interesting. I went for a larger crop here, um, including the Hyades and the Pleiades, um, and the California Nebula over there. Um, so I, I really like the wide shots like this. So when I saw that this was wide, I couldn't help, but, uh, try to present it in this sort of wide field. Um, but you still sort of see the, the California Nebula there. I did, I did boost its saturation a little bit when I saw it. Um, yeah. So thanks, thanks for sending this canal. This is really cool. Okay. And Larry captured the Eastern Veil Nebula with a refractor telescope, a ZWO 294MC and an L Extreme filter. This is one hour and 10 minutes total from a portal five. And Larry noted he sometimes feels that he over processes. And if I have any tips for that, um, Sure. So I'd say the two areas where I feel, um, most people over process and it's what I would say you're saying, uh, that you're over processing here is, um, in saturation and in contrast. Um, and so saturation is easy enough to show. I can just go in here and, you know, bring down saturation. Um, and that, that gives you some idea of, you know, what we mean when we say it's oversaturated, but this is just the JPEG. So you're only getting sort of half the picture here, but really it's, it's like, it's a very delicate thing because, um, just changing it, you know, this much minus eight versus that might be all you really need to do something around there. Um, just to feel that it's not overly saturated and you're not losing detail to things being oversaturated. And then contrast is about just how dark the sky is, um, basically. And then how the brightest parts of the picture, your issue here is not really the brightest parts of the picture. It's just that the black level feels a little bit too low. Um, so for that, I would really just, um, you know, something, like this. So this is just the JPEG, but it gives you an idea from here, uh, to something like here. Now I'm doing these on top of a 
picture that's already over or whatever. So really you want it, you just want to stop um, adding contrast or stop adding saturation earlier in the process. And then we'll look something like this, but it'll look better because uh, uh, you'll, you'll have retained those details. Well, if you've already clipped something to black, you can't retain, you can't bring that detail back just by changing the levels like I just did. All right. So, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, other than that, I think this looks really good. I like that the, um, the framing is not straight across, but rather diagonal across the frame. I like that better. Okay, Leonardo sent in a photo of the Milky Way taken with a Canon T5i and a kit lens. And this is actually a good follow-up to what I was just saying uh, with Larry's picture. Um, so you could go watch that one too, which is, for my taste, this is too contrasty and too saturated. So the two things that I would say are sort of over-processing. Um, so I'd prefer less of both contrast and saturation here. Um, but again, it comes down to personal taste. So I'd encourage uh, Leonardo to try doing less, try doing a more subtle edit of your picture and see what you think. See if you like it more, see if you, or maybe you like it less. Maybe this is um, exactly how you want it to, to look. So, um, but again, by doing a more subtle edit, not stretching the highlights of the stars quite as bright um, and, and, and not making the dark um, parts perfectly black. Um, you often can keep things, you keep things more in the middle of the tonal range and you can see more detail um, because when you take a star and make it completely white, you lose all color. When you make a dark nebula or whatever completely black, then you again are losing gradations of color in there that might exist. All right. So thank you for sending this in, Leonardo. Um, I think that uh, the the framing of it is, is perfect with the dark heart horse there right in the middle and the diagonal uh, stretch of Milky Way. That's really quite impressive uh, sight. I wonder what it looked like in person. Okay, um, here's the Carina Nebula and Luke captured the Carina Nebula with a Canon 7D, a William Optics Red Cat 51 and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And Luke was wondering about how not to blow out the highlights of the Carina Nebula while bringing out the dimmest parts. Um, so there are a number of ways that can be done. Uh, one is, you know, you can use only masks to target the dim parts, bring those out um, just by selecting, you know, just the things you want and then processing just those using a mask. Um, it, it usually uh, requires fairly complex masks, um, but it's possible. Another way is, you know, you take shorter exposures, uh, like 10 second exposures for a part that you know is very bright, um, and then you use an HDR technique to bring those back in. Um, a third way um, is you can, this is sort of uh, uh, a lazy way, is just use something like a burn tool or uh, something, or, you know, you could do it with masks and, uh, and curves or whatever just to bring down the the bright parts until they're uh, more in line with what you what you like. Um, and usually if you do that sort of in combination with um, starless technique and, and, and the stars, so this is sort of my attempt at processing your data, you can get a fair amount of detail uh, to pop out. Um, so here's the background, and I did do a little bit of uh, burning on the keyhole region there and then I saturated it and then just added the stars back in to compare this to this here's a little bit more magenta I don't know which is the better color um, but I also saw out here in this region um, 
I think this is more natural star color for sort of the Milky Way, and yours looks a little bit too much red in there. Um, so just I think overall there's a little bit too much red and magenta out here in your sky. Um, I'm not sure uh, where it came from, but this is sort of more um, naturalistic look, if you want to call it that, um, uh, of the Milky Way. Okay. Oops. Okay, and this is Luis. Luis captured the Orion and Running Man Nebulae with an old Canon zoom lens adapted to a Sony mirrorless camera. And this was shot untracked with 1,800 0 0.6 second exposures. And Luis noted that's 750 gigabytes of data for the project. So yeah, that's, that's definitely a downside of untracked is the massive storage space required when you're doing several hundred or, or over a thousand shots. Um, in terms of the processing here, this is more um, noise reduction um, and star reduction. No, no, not star reduction. Maybe just noise reduction and saturation than I would do. Um, so here's sort of how I'd process it. Uh, it's a little, it's quite a bit noisier than yours, um, but I don't know. That's, that's I just I I'm okay with a little bit of grain. So I just took a starless image, saturated it. Put the stars back in, um, brought down the, the black point. Then I did a little bit of uh, noise reduction. And then here's sort of the step where if you wanted to do more noise reduction than me, you could. So, cause this is with camera um, raw filter. So let me just pull that back up. So if you wanted to do more noise reduction here, you certainly could. I'm just going to pile on a bit more. Okay, something like that. And then just darken the background again and got rid of the green glow that was left over. So just to compare, I think um, Yours has that intense sort of saturation. Mine is a little bit less intense, but then more detail in the Running Man and the and some of Orion there. Okay. And Maddie B sent in an Andromeda Galaxy taken with the Red Cat Fifty One, a Canon DSLR, and an iOptron Skyguider Pro Star Tracker. This is about forty minutes of data from a Bortle Six Sky at f four point nine looks really great um, and shows that you don't need super long exposures or a huge telescope to resolve great details on Andromeda. Again, this is just a, a telescope that has 250 millimeter focal length. Um, and the details in the core here are especially impressive. My suggestion um, for improvement is to take even more data, like maybe triple what you have here. Uh, so 40 minutes, uh, do three hours or something like that. And um, that should make bringing these outer arms out a lot easier and the, the color in them um, bring help bring out the blue stars. Even in a Bortle 6 sky, I think if you, if you got to three hours or four hours on Andromeda, um, it would really uh, be easier to bring out these fainter things uh, at f4.9. Okay, here's Mamange. Mamange captured the Rosette Nebula uh, with the William Optics Telescope and a QHY 163C camera. And Mamange mentioned that the stars with large halos being their biggest issue with the final image. Um, so I looked at the TIFF. This is a pretty dramatic crop into the center of it. Um, and that's one of the drawbacks of cropping in uh, is the stars will look bigger in proportion because they're taking up more of the image real estate proportionally. Um, personally, I, 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 I'm fine with big stars, especially when they have nice natural color like this uh, in this image. Um, 
so I don't I don't really mind um, them having nice natural big halos. Um, it's funny when I started astrophotography, I always was after the smallest stars possible, and now I'm appreciating bigger stars more. And I even use diffusion filters uh, to produce big stars for my wide angle shots. Um, but anyways, uh, the two things that stand out to me about this image for critique are that it should be a bit brighter. So I tried to do that here. And um, that's easy to fix with just a uh, curve. So there's my curve. And then the other thing I noticed when I was doing that curve is that the sky background was a little bit too blue. So I just fixed that with slightly changing the black point on the blue curve. And that's, that's it, just two quick uh, fixes. Make the image brighter and change the black point a little bit. Okay, and then we have Mark. And Mark sent in an image of the Pac-Man Nebula taken with a ZWO 533MC camera, an L Extreme filter, and a Skywatcher Newtonian telescope on a Skywatcher mount. And this was during full moon from a light polluted city. And I think um, it came out very well. Um, my first feeling was I wanted to change the intense orange color as it's not a color I've typically used um, in astrophotography. Sorry. My first feeling was that I wanted to change the intense uh, sort of orange color here because that's not a color that I've typically used in my astrophotography. Um, but the more I looked at this image, the more I thought that this orange and uh, purplish blue uh, really worked well for this object. And I, I don't always like pictures of the Pac-Man Nebula, but I like this one. So uh, the orange must be working for it. Mark asked about the star color. And I think it's okay to have some star color in narrow band, as, as long as you know the stars are pretty small as they are in this image. Um, how I treat the stars depends on the image. Sometimes I think narrowband looks better with just white stars, so you could just pull them from the HA. Other times, you know, pulling in star color from the narrowband data, even if it's not fully accurate uh, to the color of the stars themselves, looks nice. And sometimes going out and really getting real star color by shooting, you know, with a color camera, you can shoot without a filter or with an eye or cut filter, um, and getting the real star color is good. I've had limited success doing that with uh, from a city, but if you can ever get away from the city, shoot from a dark sky, uh, I think you'll you'll get good star color that way. So anyways, that's a bunch of words to say. I don't really have much of a critique for this image other than um, my personal preference would be to back off the saturation just a little bit. Let me just try backing it off um, 10%. Yeah, something like that is sort of where I'd rather end up. Um, okay, thanks for sending that one in. Okay, Mario sent in an image of the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae taken from, uh, let's see here, they're taken with, sorry, a ZWO 294MC, a 61 millimeter refractor, and an IDOS NBZ filter, which I believe is a dual narrowband filter, which isolates the HA and O3 emission lines. And it's great how you have this HA bridge here between the lagoon and this nebula up here. Um, I really like how that looks. Uh, my only nitpick with this image is if I zoom in, there's a lot of just like pure red stars. Um, so I'd probably desaturate those a bit cause just because they think they look like noise. Um, that's about it. Um, you know, another possible option is if you drive somewhere dark is to combine this image done with a dual narrowband filter with an unfiltered image because uh, another thing this image is missing out on a little bit is some of the extended blue reflection nebula here in the Trifid. Um, but also the yellows and golds that you get from natural star color. Um, and that's, you know, especially true over here because this is the Milky Way. Um, so yeah, to get that natural star color, maybe just using an IR cut filter with your 294 if you have one. 
um, would be good. Um, but again, like I said, the last critique I've, I found getting the natural star color uh, really sort of requires darker skies usually. Hey, Marco sent in an image of the Andromeda galaxy taken with a Sony mirrorless and a Minolta telephoto lens taken without a star tracker. Um, my two suggestions for Marco here are to ease off on the contrast. The black is level is very dark um, and then the stars and galaxy are, are very, very punchy, very bright. Um, the other thing I see here is that the stars in Andromeda and directly around it about this much are brighter than the rest of the stars just by a little bit. So I think that you probably selected all of this um, with the stars in the image and brightened it. And that's uh, that makes it sort of stand out weirdly. Um, so if you're gonna, if you wanna brighten the galaxy, I would do that with the stars out of the picture or build a really good mask where you're masking out all the stars and just focusing on the galaxy. Um, so either strategy, building a really good mask where you're, you're only selecting the galaxy and not the stars can work, or working on the stars and the galaxy separately can work too. And Marcus. Marcus captured the Rosette Nebula with a full frame stock Nikon DSLR a Samyang 135F2 lens, and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. It, and it, it definitely shows uh, how the Rosette is this bright, beautiful little nebula in the in this huge field of stars um, that are pretty non-distinct. It's in Monoceros, so it's not there's not a lot of like um, asterisms going on. Um, so it's an interesting uh, framing. Uh, I probably would have framed it a little bit differently. I think you're you're right off of the um, Christmas tree cluster and some more interesting stuff up here. So if you'd done it vertically, I think you would have rotated you know this frame vertically. I think it would have you would have caught some of those um, better. Um, you probably would have had to rotate vertically and not center the rosettes. That might not have been your your goal here. Um, anyways, I tried it out, uh, from your TIFF file. There's my attempt. Um, I cropped in further. I tried to get as much color out of the stars and the rosette as possible. I pushed the blues maybe too far here. It looks a little weird, but, um, I tried to push the blues, see, uh, how much sort of O3 signal I could get out of the rosette. And then I, I, um, with the stars, I I both put them onto their own layer and then screen blended them on. And I chose to do it at a reduced opacity a little bit, um, bringing it down to 83% and then saturated them. Did a little bit of work with um, desaturating the noise in the background and then saturating the nebula and the stars. And um, finally just, I don't know what that one's doing. I don't know if I like it better before or after there. Anyways, um, so this is just to show you uh, a different sort of kinds of processing, um, focusing more on the rosette, I guess, by cropping in and also trying to tame the star field a little bit. Marnus uh, took this picture of Andromeda Galaxy with a Canon DSLR and lens attached to a motorized Dobsonian telescope. So that's an Altaz uh, motor situation. And um, Marnus took just lights and flats and stacked and processed them with Sequator. So that's not sort of a, a process I'm familiar with, um, but uh, I'd have to investigate it more. Uh, to say what I think about it. Um, Marnus was wondering about these lines all over the picture of red, green, and blue. Um, to me, what those look like are hot pixels that uh, 
didn't get rejected um, by Sequator, um, and also didn't get rejected because you didn't use dark frames. So if, if you use a, a, a temperature matched dark frame, what should happen is if there's a hot pixel like like these uh, ones, then they should get uh, rejected uh, by the the dark frame, which will have the same hot pixel if it's a the same exposure length and the same temperature. Um, so without doing that, um, what's going on here is after you stack all of your pictures together, those dark frame uh, those hot pixels form these lines because um, there's drift uh, across the night, drift both um, from the tracking not being perfect, but also some rotational drift, uh, you can see the lines are going in slightly different directions because it's an alt as uh, mount. Um, okay, so all that's to say, let's say you want to know, you already have these uh, uh, lines of hot pixels, how would you get rid of them? Um, so here's one method I'll show you. So you're going to zoom way in on just the hot pixels here. Go to select by color range in Photoshop here and uh, click on the hot pixels and then increase the fuzziness slider a little bit. Let's look at the selection now. So you can see it selected that line pretty well. Okay, I'm gonna click okay. And then I'm going to expand that selection just a little bit by going to select, modify, expand by two pixels okay and then i'll feather that by one pixel all right so now we have the the lines of red hot pixels selected and if we find another you know line of red hot pixels you can see it's selected down there as well as we did it by color range then we just go to edit fill and choose content aware, and this will take a little while, but what it's gonna do is across the image, everywhere where we have that selection of those red hot pixels, it's going to do a, a fill command to get rid of them. Um, and then we would just do the same thing for the blue and for the green uh, to get rid of all of those uh, streaks of hot pixels, but you can see now uh, all the red ones are gone, and then we would just repeat that for the blue and the, the green ones. Okay, hope that helps. Let me go on to the next one here, and this one is Martin Yu, and Martin Yu sent a photo of the Cygnus Loop uh, supernova remnant taken with a Pentax camera, Sigma lens, and a Skywatcher star adventurer. And Martin Yu mentioned there being a lot of stars and wishing he could eliminate them. Um, so yeah, that's a big issue when shooting the veil with a camera lens is just how many stars there are and how dense that star field is. It makes it hard to process uh, without the star field sort of taking over the shot, but I think you did a really nice job here. Um, my one critique uh, is I think I'd like uh, a slightly bigger crop if you have one. So like, especially on this side, it feels that the, um, I always get these mixed up. Well, whatever veil this is, this veil seems very close to the edge. So if we could just expand the crop a little bit, I think it would look a little better. Okay, here's Martin. Martin captured the Pleiades with an Apertura 60 millimeter refractor and a field flattener and a Canon 80D with a Skywatcher Star Adventure. That's a great little setup. Uh, we'll make really nice data like this. Uh, the Apertura 60 with field flattener does a great job, better than most lenses, I think, at that price point of around $700. And it's a, with the field flattener, it, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, the field flattener is 1x, so it doesn't change the focal length or the uh, focal ratio, so it's still at a F6, uh, 360 millimeter focal length. Um, my only critique of this image is 
you brought the blue saturation up um, here in the center, you know, right to the edge, uh, and I think maybe just a tad over the edge, so you're starting to lose a little detail. In the Pleiades, you want them to look this really electric blue, but I think just uh, just maybe minus five or something like that um, might be better. Uh, so you, you, I just felt like you were just a, just a smidge over on saturation. Okay, Mate um, sent in this you know, wonderful looking panorama of the sky over a mountain range in Slovenia. And Mate said that uh, this was taken from the highest road in Slovenia in the Alps. So this is a very impressive shot. Um, it was all done without a tracker, just a Tamron 35 millimeter lens and a modified Nikon full frame uh, camera D600. Um, so while this was done without a tracker, uh, the processing for it sounds intense. As Mate uh, used a number of programs to bring all of this together. And it's, it's two rows of uh, 14 images per row. So it's a 28 panel mosaic. And Mate said that the foreground was taken during blue hour and then composited with the sky shots uh, after, um, which are of course taken at night, but from the same location. And um, I have no real suggestions for this image. It looks perfectly planned and executed. I mean, you, you told me all about how you know things went wrong, but um, I think it, it all came together very nicely, um, especially like seeing, you know, uh, a natural, interesting color shift in the Milky Way from the the bright core area here with its golden uh, hues to the brown, dark brown dust up here. And then, of course, the Cygnus and Cepheus region is so full of hydrogen, so you get all that red. So it's really beautiful seeing all these different colors. Um, and, the, you know, the other thing is uh, I think that you were very lucky with these clouds, how they uh, how they worked. Um, because it really, it really provides this nice middle ground between the mountain range and the sky. Uh, so I hope you submit this uh, image to competitions and uh, that it, it deserves, because uh, it really deserves awards. And, and I hope you, uh, uh, you know, do something with this image printed or, or something, because it's very special, very nice. And now we have Matteo. Matteo sent in an image of the Milky Way done with a Canon DSLR and a Canon 18 to 55 kit lens. And Matteo said his main issue was colors and getting strong colors out of his images, which he often felt looks sort of monochromatic. So I rarely say this, but I think uh, Matteo, your skill is starting to surpass your gear here. The, not the camera, but the lens. Um, cause from my experience, this is about as good as the Canon 18 to 55 kit lens can do. Um, it, uh, I think you'd be surprised if you get a better lens that the colors actually get much easier to bring out. I think that kit lens just doesn't have very good color fidelity. Um, and so, cause I've never been able to get really great Milky Way images with it either. I found even the Canon Nifty 50, which is like a hundred dollar lens, um, produce nicer colors than the, than the 18 to 55 kit lens. It must, it must be to do with the, the glass quality or something. Um, so that's not, not to say you have to go out and get one. Cause I, I still think this is a, a nice image, but, um, your, your issue we're talking about of getting the nice colors, I think your kit lens might be to blame there and not, not your processing skill. Okay. Next up we have Matt. Matt set in a nice image of the Pelican Nebula taken with astronomic six nanometer HA and O3 filters and a mono ZWO camera and a William optics refractor. And Matt said that he had issues with the O3 being noisy and with lots of starnet artifacts on bright stars and asked if switching to a different filter, like one with a narrow band pass for the O3 would help. 
In my experience, not really. Um, you'll still have those same problems of it being noisy. The Starnet artifacts may get a little bit better um, with a very expensive filter, but the issue doesn't really go away. Um, we all face it with O3. Um, the Starnet has, does, I just heard has a version two, so hopefully that will have less artifacts. But the best way to deal with noise in O3 is just take more O3 data and under dark skies, if at all possible. I shoot my O3 from a dark site and all my HA from home. Um, the reason for that is because the LED street lights that are now in most cities and all kinds of artificial lighting is invading that O3 spectrum. Well, it doesn't invade the, the dark, the deep reds of the HA as much. Um, so going to a dark site, even for O3 is often a good idea. Um, in terms of processing, it all looks pretty good to me, um, except uh, personally, I'd skip the Topaz noise uh, reduction process, the Topaz uh, denoise AI kind of stuff entirely. I don't think you need it here. Um, and just to show my process with your data, um, I'll pull that up here. So I went for a much sort of softer look, um, different color palette, a little bit, uh, more of an an orange and uh, pale purple. Um, so there is, what is this? This is the O3, add in the HA. Let's see what colors these are. For the O3, I went a hue of 222. And for the HA, a hue of six. You know, changing this can get you a pretty different look. This is just one way of combining starless data. Um, then I I messed with it a little bit in selective color, the broad increase the saturation too. Um, and then just added the HA stars, so just white stars, and then reset the uh, black point. And uh, one thing I I liked in seeing in this is like all the variations, even in this dark nebula rift. Um, so that's one thing I was sort of missing out on in your uh, rendition here is you, you sort of clipped that a lot of that to black. Um, but there's actually some interesting variation in color there. Okay, another math sent the Rho Ophiuchi region around the bright star on Teres, but done from a Bortle 7 without tracking. And this is a very high level of difficulty since this region is mostly very dim reflection nebula and dark nebula, both very difficult things to do from Bortle 7 without tracking. Um, what came out the best, unsurprisingly, is the star cluster right there, MSCA 4. Um, and so the, but really this whole thing is impressive given the high level of difficulty, uh, you know, because of that light polluted sky. So, uh, but if you did, if you were able to drive, you got to like a Bortle 4, you'd be amazed at the difference. Cause even from a Bortle 4, uh, while this is a very hard object, uh, without tracking, um, you, you'd still be amazed at the difference. Um, uh, just cause the light pollution brings its own noise uh, with it and when you subtract that light pollution you subtract the signal but you're still left with the noise basically um, and matt asked from a city where this object never rises above 20 degrees up from the horizon is this the best you can expect and my answer is yes unless you add tracking or uh get somewhere darker in the city i don't know uh but probably that's not Gonna make much difference if so long as you're in the city or, or you have the same equipment in the city then i think uh this is the best you're gonna expect from the from this target um because it's, it's a very difficult one um in terms of processing i don't know what we could really do here maybe removing some of the green noise might help let's see i mean i think that looks a little better just to take out some of the green um that's about all I could uh, think of uh, to really try on it. But 
nice job anyways. Uh, it's, I think it's impressive, uh, even if you might not be uh, super happy with it just because of how much noise there is. Okay, another Matt um, sent in an image of the Milky Way with a very nice foreground, very dynamic. I like the balance of the light painted um, wagon over here and then the um, the city or town, I guess, over here. Um, the stars are a little bit one note um, as they all seem to be very white and probably overexposed. Um, I'm not sure if that's from the processing or if they were just overexposed to begin with. My guess is it's from the processing. You mentioned uh, processing in Lightroom. So just be careful with the sliders. It's very easy to go too far with adding, sorry. Just be careful with the sliders. It's very easy to go too far with adding, you know, contrast and you'll actually see more detail by keeping the contrast more restrained, not, not pushing your highlights uh, so much so that all your stars sort of get white like this, um, uh, which is even more noticeable sort of over in this region. Okay. Mattia sent in an image of the North America and the Pelican region taken with a Skywatcher AZ GTI and a Canon DSLR with a 75 to 300 zoom lens from a pretty light polluted city sky. Um, so this looks pretty good. I think the <clears throat> framing is very nice for this uh, focal length. I definitely know this temptation we all have to really push uh, the data, um, but at a certain point, the data is what it is. You can't push it any further. <clears throat> and I think the limitation that Mattia is facing here is not their processing skill, but the light pollution uh, level. Um, so one of those dual narrowband filters like the Allen Hance would do wonders, I think, for you, Mattia, with this scene. Um, but anyways, here's how much I would push your data personally uh, before stopping. Um, so it's just a little bit more restrained than what you did in terms of contrast and saturation. So pretty, I think, similar processing choices, just not going as far with them. Maddie S. Um, captured the Crescent Nebula with a modified Canon DSLR, an SV Boney light pollution filter, and the William Optics 73 millimeter refractor. And I think this looks great. My one suggestion is to play with the color balance a bit more. Um, while this whole region is filled with red nebulosity, I think the shadows are a bit too red. Um, and I'd also boost the mids in the blue channel just to show you what that can look like. Here's just playing with the JPEG. So just boosting the blue and resetting the the reds uh, black level, and uh, I think you'll you'll get a lot more out of this uh, with the TIFF. So just to show you, there's before it's just a little bit too red in the shadows. There's after, and you can see some of these interesting blue parts coming out by boosting the blue. And uh, yeah, that's it. Um, other than that, I think it looks great. Okay, next up we have Max. And uh, this was very tricky data to work with. Um, this is my best attempt to subtract the background. And you can still see there's, even with my best attempt, there's still some color shifts here and unevenness that would have to be worked out. So uh, given that difficulty, I think this is a really good job at processing this uh, data. Um, if there was a way to make the transition from the galaxy to the background sky a little bit more subtle, um, I think that would be good. Um, but you, you really pulled out all the details that were, that were in there, um, I found. Uh, so good job with the with the processing here. And another Max. This uh, is a nice Milky Way nightscape done with a Sony mirrorless camera and a Lawa lens stocked down to f5.6. But Max made a barn door tracker, so the Milky Way is 
actually three five minute shots tracked with the barn door tracker. And I think um, it looks good. It's an interesting foreground with uh, these crops or whatever these are over here. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the, the f sort of foggy light pollution looks natural. Nice way to transition into the foreground. Um, Max was wondering why all the stars were white and was wondering if that was in capture or in processing. So I started, uh, I'd, I wasn't going to do the full, uh, you know, uh, composite like you did here, but I just cropped out the Milky Way and started processing that in PixInsight. And just to show you that uh, there's indeed plenty of good star color in your images. Uh, uh, so it's all just about processing. And and most of the, the processing I did here was uh, trying to find a good uh, color balance, uh, but mostly just gradient removal. You know, uh, PixInsight has this automatic gradient removal tool uh, called the Automatic Background Extractor. If you're looking for a free program to do that, Cyril has it too. Um, but, you know, I, down here, you're not going to really recover too much because there's a pretty extreme sky gradient. Um, so this might not be the best uh, direction, even though this is a Bortle 4 uh, because of the light dome down here. Um, but overall, I'd say, yeah, you have a lot of uh, good star color. It's just about bringing it out uh, if you want to. Okay, and then we have Max Maxence. Maxence, sorry. Then we have Maxence. Uh, Maxence just started five months ago. So this is pretty amazing uh, image for just starting five months ago. And Maxence uh, took this with a Red Cat 51, a ZWO 533MC, an iOptron Skyguider Pro, and an L Extreme filter. And Maxence asked if it was over sharpened. Um, and yes, uh, they made my job easy because that's the, my one issue with this image is the over sharpening. Um, Maxence said they sharpened with multi scale linear transform and a lightness mask. So my critique is easy just skip that <laughs> from your workflow entirely i don't think nebula shots really need sharpening with mlt um beyond like a little deconvolution if uh your data is still linear and well sampled uh go for decon but otherwise skip uh skip any kind of sharpening i don't think it's needed and just makes it uh look sort of crunchy and not quite right um I mean, from a in an Instagram post, I think this, you know, the sharp the extreme sharpening is cool. But if you're really gonna, you know, zoom in and look at it, uh, like that doesn't that doesn't look quite right. So that's my two cents. Um, okay, here we have Max R. Max R shot Andromeda with a Sony camera and a Jupiter 135 lens tracked. Uh, with 30 second exposures on an EQ1 mount. So I think the processing and color look good here. The biggest uh, issue I saw is with the capture. You can see all the stars, um, zoom in, are trailed in the same direction. See how they're all trailed like this uh, down and to the right. So when you see trailing all in the same direction, it's either a matter of the mount isn't um, accurate enough for 30 second exposures or your polar alignment was not on enough and you're getting drift that way. Either way, if you see trailing like this, you're better off using shorter exposures uh, at higher ISO. So, you know, if you're doing 30 second exposures at ISO 1600, do try 15 second exposures at ISO 3200. And uh, if you see you know, less trailing that way, uh, you'll get a sharper picture overall. And next we have Mete. And Mete sent an image of the Lagoon and Trifid shot with a 135 millimeter lens and a Nikon D5300, but without tracking. 
And Mete said they followed my processing steps exactly uh, from my Lagoon uh, Nebula uh, untracked uh, video. So I think that it's no wonder that I like the result because they, uh, if you use sort of my techniques uh, exactly, I'm probably going to like uh, how it looks. Um, the only thing I'd change here is I think the blacks are too blue. Like if we look over here and down here, they look too blue to me. So I'm just going to take a blue curve and do that. And that's it. Okay, next we have Michael. Michael captured the cat's paw and the lobster nebulae from the southern hemisphere. I think it looks very good. Um, personally, I do less saturation. So let's just try that here on uh, Michael's image. Now on a JPEG, that's not going to look quite right. Um, but Michael actually did send me their um, uh, TIFF. So here's how I processed it, just to show you. So the the nebulae are still pretty, um, pro, you know, saturated, but I'm just doing uh, less saturation out here in the Milky Way. Uh, so it's it's pretty similar, but just a little bit different. Um, just a little different, different look, different look overall. Okay, and. What else did Michael say here? Michael mentioned having trouble with polar alignment in the Southern Hemisphere using the octans and the reticule in Star Adventurer. So yeah, that's a common problem. Um, if you wanna throw money at it and you have a laptop you can use, I can recommend the QHY Pole Master. It's worked well for me. It's an electronic polar scope, um, just so it's a gadget that works well. There are other options though, like if you wanted to eventually get a guide scope and guide camera, or if you, you know, you could get those, and then once you have those, you can use software like uh, ASI Air, SharpCap Pro, uh, Nina, all these kinds of different things that will help with computer-assisted polar alignment, and that should make it uh, easier than doing it visually through the polar scope. This is from Miguel. Miguel asked about his stars. Um, being bloated and about color balance. Um, so color balance with Photoshop is hard. I don't really have any great solution other than just trusting what you think it should look like um, and then using any tools necessary, uh, you know, like color balance or uh, selective color or whatever it is uh, to get you to what you think it should look like. Um, in astro-specific software like PixInsight and Cyril, they actually have something called a photometric color calibration, which looks at the actual stars and identifies them, looks them up in a catalog, and then sets a white balance based on the actual stars in your photo. Um, last thing you can do, of course, is look at reference photos of the, of the galaxy from things like NASA or whatever and uh, try to match that. Uh, with the star bloating issue, I noticed um, most of the bloat is happening in the blue and the violet. Um, so uh, Photoshop has a nice tool uh, for sort of managing that. Um,
Okay, Miguel asked about his stars being bloated and about color balance. Color balance with Photoshop is hard. I don't have any really um, great solution other than just trusting what you think it should look like and then using any tools necessary to get you there. You know, there's Astro specific software like PixInsight and Cyril that actually have photometric color calibration. Cyril is free, so if you want to try it out, what photometric color calibration does is it looks at like the stars and then it's like, oh, I know what these stars are. I'll look them up in a catalog. I know what color they should be. And then it applies a white balance function based on that. Um, other than that, I think it's just, you know, looking at reference photos and, and trying your best with color balance. In terms of the star bloating, um, I don't know if you already use this, but there's the camera raw filter with its uh, defringe. And so you can try to you know, if this the for the blue and purple stars, you can try to reduce them a little bit with that. Um, other than that, it's really just probably up to the specific lens you're using. Um, I did process your TIFF, so just to show you my interpretation, there's what I did with it. Uh, I really like yours though too, so I probably don't think mine is any uh, better. Just a different uh, look at your data. All right, next up we have Mihalo. And Mihalo sent in an image of the Milky Way taken with the Nikon DSLR and kit lens on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And Mihalo mentioned they had an issue with the t shirt method of taking flats because they could see the threads in the flats. Uh, from the t-shirt. So I think the key there is just, um, you need a tightly woven t-shirt and then also it can help to double layer the t-shirt material, uh, like that. And, uh, that should get rid of those seeing the threads. Um, Mihalo said that their other problem was with the unevenness with some parts being darker and some brighter. And yes, that's a common problem. Um, I'd suggest looking into Pix Insight or Cyril. Cyril is free. They both have background extraction tools that work really well for getting a flatter, cleaner result um, that I can ever do in Photoshop. And uh, so that's, uh, I think, it for that one. Um, but it's a really nice composition and nice detail. So yeah, just look into Cyril or PixInsight for a, a way to get a flatter field there. Okay. And Mike Astrophotography captured the Seder butterfly and Crescent Nebula with a stock Canon 100D, a Tamron zoom lens at 200 millimeter focal length and a Skywatcher EQ3 mount with auto guiding. Um, this looks very good. I'm really impressed with this star field considering this was a zoom lens wide open. Uh, the stars look really well controlled, uh, no major aberrations or anything. Um, I love this field too. It includes this blue reflection nebula over here, this little guy. Um, I think that's uh, NGC 6914. Um, and then we have this, you know, this uh, nice uh, bridge, uh, you know, between that and Seder and this other nebulosity and the crescent up here. So I just think this. This field is great. Um, the, the only thing uh, I'm, I'm thinking is I wonder if you rotated the field slightly, if you could have gotten the crescent away from the edge. I mean, that might have looked a little bit better, but I don't mind it. You know, the crescent being close to the edge, it almost looks like it's like trying to escape the photo. Um, so uh, yeah, good job. Um, let's go on to the next one here. And this is... Milo Quisp. Milo Quisp captured the Eagle and Omega Nebulae with a Red Cat 51 and a Nikon DSLR with an Optolong L Enhance filter on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer mount. And it's from a red zone shooting 125 second long exposures at ISO 2000. I really like this composition, uh, you know, with uh, the Eagle and Omega. Um, the one thing. I'd suggest is to either work on um, polar alignment or 
balance, maybe polar alignment and balance, I should say, order to shoot uh, shorter exposures uh, than 125 seconds. Because when I zoom in, I can definitely see that there is trailing all over the field that's um, up and down trailing. So that suggests because it's the same basically everywhere, you can see um, that suggests there's an issue with either polar alignment or uh, something else, you know, balance or uh, yeah. So um, I would just try shorter exposures, you know, uh, you know, uh, you probably don't need 125 seconds. You could do 60 seconds, half, so half what you're doing now, and bump it up to ISO 3200 and try that. Um, and I think you'll you'll find the data is just about as good if you take the same total integration. And now we have MJ07. And MJ07 sent this photo of the Milky Way taken with a star tracker, a Nikon DSLR, and a 50 millimeter lens. And this framing is great. I love how the, the dark horse looks like it's walking on the bottom of the frame. That's cool. Um, and it, you know, it, the Milky Way really fills the frame. With the processing, I think uh, this orange here uh, is too much. It's too saturated. Um, but then the, the big thing is that it's, it's a too big of a saturation shift from here to here. Uh, that and then there's sort of like an artificial line all of a sudden where it's happening right there. Um, so I tried to sort of uh, tone down and then tone up this just to sort of show you where where I'd go uh, with this. Um, just try to make the whole thing flatter in terms of saturation. I think that you know you your nebulae are highly saturated and that's fine. I think that looks good. But in terms of the Milky Way, um, back off on that sort of selective saturation and just keep it more, more natural. All right, Naveen sent in an image of the Iris Nebula in Cepheus with a taken with a uh, ZWO 533MC and a William Optics 73 millimeter refractor. Um, so like uh, the last photo, um, the saturation balance seems a little bit off here to me. Um, the blue reflection nebula, uh, you know, here looks, this is the iris, but then this, the blue part here just looks super saturated to me. But then the rest of the image, like the blue stars out here, barely seem to have any saturation. So it just like looks a little artificial when the saturation in one part doesn't match the other part. But I do like how the blue reflection nebula looks. So what I would recommend to Naveen is to just saturate the rest of the image like they saturated this part. And this is just the JPEG, but just to show you sort of what I mean, something like that, where just go for a super saturated look all over with the stars, with the dust. Uh, so you're going to get much more brown dust highly saturated star field and I think that will it will match what you're doing with the uh, reflection nebula more um, but the rest of your processing uh, what you're doing here with the star repair you described and the the noise reduction and stuff like that I think all looks looks really good so that's my one recommendation is the saturation uh, balance between the, the reflection nebula and the rest of the field Okay, and then we have Nico, not me, but Nico from Texas, um, who said, captured the Elephant Trunk Nebula, of course, here, uh, with a modded Nikon DSLR, William Optics 61 with Fladner, um, and an Ioptron Skyguider Pro. It was taken from Bortal 2, but with some moonlight. And Nico from Texas was disappointed with the amount of noise in the photo. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Elephant Trunk Nebula is deceptively difficult to do without filters. Um, you know, to do it in broadband like this, you're 
bringing it up so much because it's such a faint object that you're going to bring up the noise too, even, even with good skies. Um, but I think this is a very good result. The processing is very well done. It looks perfectly correct for broadband. Um, you know, I, I tried to do something a little bit different um, and didn't fully succeed uh, trying to bring out color, you know, bring out blues in here a bit. But um, yeah, so I think I like your processing better than what I tried to do here. All right. Nicola. Nicola participated in my last critique. And this is actually the photo they sent in that time because I want to show this compared to what they produced a year later. There we go. And so this is the same scene, but through practice, trying, you know, trying to do it again uh, over and over and getting better, they went from this to this. And hopefully everyone can see that's quite the glow up. Uh, and so thank you very much for sending this in, Nikolai. I think that's really cool to show how you've improved from one year to the next. Um, and this shot is really nice. It basically has all the treasures of, of Cygnus from uh, this, from all these, these cool dark nebula complexes, this one and this one, um, to you know the North America and Pelican, to the Seder Butterfly, uh, to the, even has the veil over here a little bit. The only thing, yeah, that's the only thing I wish is that the veil came through a little bit clearer, but you know, it is what it is. That's a minor nitpick. Uh, I love how the star field looks here with just like so many stars, uh, but doesn't feel uh, like too much to me. I mean, it just feels right. Um, and I think that is because you wisely uh, stop down the lens uh, to get the stars nice and sharp, which is is really cool. I, I, I have to try more of that to do tracked exposures with a, a stop down lens to get a really nice, uh, nice tight stars, but tons of them everywhere. So thanks for sending this in and congrats on your progress. Okay, and then we have Nicolas. Nicolas said that they had trouble with star reduction because Starnet++ didn't cleanly remove the stars. Um, so the way that I use Starnet++, it doesn't really matter if it cleanly removes the stars or not. Um, and I found the same thing with, with your data. Um, let me just show you what I mean here with I processed your data here. So if I go down here to the starless layer, you can see it did not cleanly remove the stars. There's a lot of artifacting over here and over here. Um, and it's even more clear when I corrected the color balance. But when I add the star layer back in, it doesn't matter because it covers, this star layer covers up all of that artifacts completely because I don't do any kind of star reduction on the star layer. And then I just do a final uh, black point reset here. And I think that looks really nice. So I think your data looks really good, really clean. So I would just uh, process it more simply, I guess. And uh, and I think you'll, you'll be happy with it. Okay. And then we have Nico with two Ks. And Nico sent in a photo of Andromeda shot with a Canon DSLR, a vintage Takumar 200 millimeter lens and a Star Adventurer. Um, and Nico was having difficulty bringing out any color variety in Andromeda. So let me show some of my tricks in Photoshop here. Okay. Okay. We're starting with the starless image, not a huge amount of color variety, but then we're going to make it sort of blue. It makes the background blue too. That's okay. We then take a curves layer. This is just global adjustments, and we um, reset the black, the blue point, the blue uh, black point. But then we've we've blued up the <laughs> blued up the galaxy a little bit, and then we can increase saturation on the galaxy a little bit. Um, we're gonna add the stars back, reset the black point again, and then this is just a uh, luminance mask. So I just basically made a copy from visible and then turned it black and white with 
image adjustments. Um, let me find that here. Image adjustments, black and white filter. Then I copy this um, black and white luminance mask onto here, onto a, the mask for a hue slash saturation layer. Then I turn this off. So now this hue slash saturation layer is affecting everything below. And then I just increase the saturation on uh, the bright parts of the image. And so that's how I got more color variety into your Andromeda shot. Uh, hopefully you could follow that. Uh, and, and hopefully also it's a little bit more simple than maybe what I showed in the Andromeda video, which watching, watching it back, I think I, I go through too many steps and masks and things, and this is hopefully a little simpler. All right. Next we have Nix Shutter. Nix Shutter, or is it maybe it's Nix Shutter? Um, anyways, they shot the Ophiuchus region untracked with a Canon 200D and a 50 millimeter lens. And they asked to see what I could do with their linear TIFF file. So here's what I came up with. I think it's a bit noisier than their image. So uh, I don't think I did any noise reduction on it yet. So if you wanted to do some noise reduction, let's just open up camera raw filter and uh, apply some here. I don't know how much. Something like that. Yeah, I don't know if it made much change, but anyways, um, my goal with uh, processing your TIFF file was just to capture the whole of what you of what you got here. So I really like how these dark streamers look, um, and then the row of Yuki down here in that corner. So I'm not sure why you cut that off, but uh, but I like it. So that's. Maybe just because it was sort of a noisy part of the image, um, but you know, I think it looks really cool. Um, it's, you know, for an untracked shot at 50 millimeters, um, the way to make this better is, of course, just to capture more data. Um, but all the dark nebula in this shot is what makes it so neat. So that's from uh, Nix Shutter, and then next here we have from Nils. And Nils sent this image of the Cygnus wall region, um, you know, in part of the North America nebula in Cygnus. It was taken with a Nikon DSLR, an Optolong L Extreme filter, and a Skywatcher refractor and mount. Nils mentioned not being sure how to handle the color with the L Extreme filter and was wondering if I thought the photo was too red. So I think leaving the nebula very red like this is closer to a natural representation of it in the sense that if you took a long photo of this nebula with a modified camera, it would come out very red. Um, an L Extreme filter is a dual narrowband filter though. So if you wanna play around with sort of narrowband techniques, what you can do is you can separate the uh, red channel from the green and blue channel so for instance, if I look at here, if I just click on this and then I look at the channels, you can see there's the green channel. Uh, so it's there's a lot of stuff going on in green, but you can see the red channel is so much brighter. So to equalize these a little bit, what I can do is I can copy this green channel, put it here, and change it from normal to screen. And then we have this. So that already looks sort of interesting. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to colorize this layer. Uh, this is with a hue saturation layer set to colorize and set to, you know, uh, a blue green. So this is to get a sort of natural representation. If you wanted to make it more of a fantasy representation, you can do a deeper blue. It's up to you. Um, how, you know, where you want to put this. An actual really natural representation might look like that, but I think that's pretty ugly. So I'm going to do somewhere in between. Anyways, then I'm just going to reset the black point with some curves and call it a day. And so that's an easy way to bring out more color variety is just take 
the green or blue channel right from the data, put it here as a screen blend, colorize it, and do some curves. There's other ways you can, of course, uh, do this, but this is one way. Now, this does have some downsides. You can see it brought out some of this blue noise up here, so you might want to crop and you might want to do noise reduction on this layer, different things, but this is the basic uh, workflow. Next up, we have Noah, who shot the Pelican Nebula with a small Newtonian reflector, an Optolong L Enhance filter, and a Canon DSLR. And um, my critique here will be sort of similar to the last one, and that the L Enhance, like the L Extreme, is a dual narrowband filter, meaning it picks up O3 data in the blue green spectrum and HA data in the red spectrum. So usually the way to get the most color is you separate the channels, stretch them independently, map them, that kind of thing. Um, in this photo, I feel like it, it all looks pretty orange. Um, so I don't see a lot of color separation. Noah noted they did use a palette, uh, a defined palette, one by another astrophotographer named Forax, F-O-R-A-X-X. -X. Um, I don't know how you stretched the channels before using the palette, um, but it, it's just, it's uh, like I said, there's just not a lot of color separation, which is what I usually go for rather than this more sort of monochromatic uh, look. Um, so just to give you an idea of how I might do it, um, here's sort of my processing style, I guess. Um, so I started here with just your red channel, applied a red coloration to it. Then I took your green and blue channel, combined them, and uh, put that on as a screen blend, and then colored that to taste. So I did 216 uh, on the hue thing here. And then I used a selective color layer to intensify the reds even a little bit more, um, give them even a little bit more separation from this, uh, you know, this, these blues and pinks out here. And, uh, and then dropped the black point a bit back down. I think I'm maybe going a little too far there. I think something like that might be better. Um, but that gives you an idea of how I approached it. Um, it's a little bit more uh, crazy maybe than your editing, which feels very restrained. Um, uh, so maybe somewhere in between what I'm doing here and what you're doing here might be good. Um, okay. And then the other thing I'll say is, you know, I like working with uh, Pix Insight, I mean, Photoshop for this because um, it's just so easy to play around with color palettes when you can just have complete control over uh, it and then see immediately what you're, what you're doing when you set it to like that color versus that color, whatever. Um, well, in Pix Insight, it's like if you use Pixel Math, it's sort of like you you put in a formula, you you, you have to wait a few seconds, then you see the result. It just takes, it's just not as fun. <laughs> um, so I like Photoshop for this kind of thing. Okay, another Pelican Nebula. Uh, this is Ophir. Ophir uh, took this with the L Extreme filter, pretty similar uh, to what we did uh, last uh, here, and. Um, but this uh, was done with an Esprit 120 telescope. And uh, Fear said the way they do the color uh, is they unlink the channels and apply an STF auto stretch to get to colors that they like. Um, but this was their first time doing so with an Alex Stream filter and was surprised by how much orange came out. Uh, so I guess the reason for this is with an unlinked stretch, it'll basically try to equalize the red, green, and blue channels as much as it can. So since the L extreme filter is made up of just these two tiny parts of the spectrum in teal, green, and red, uh, when you put that together, I guess you get this sort of orange uh, look, uh, orange and neutral, sort of white almost, very pale blue, I guess. Um, so. I won't go over this again because I just sort of 
went over it with the same uh, object here, but when I work with uh, these dual narrowband filters, I like doing it this way, having more control in Photoshop. Um, but you know, for uh, uh, not having much control, just doing it with an auto stretch, I actually think this looks pretty good. Um, partly, I think, because you you captured a lot of cool detail in the in the dark uh, nebulae here uh, with. Uh, your Esprit 120, which is a, a nice big refractor. So thanks for sending that one in, Ophir. And then we have Owen. And this is a picture of the Trifid Nebulae, Nebula, sorry, uh, with his university's 32-inch uh, Ritchie Crichton telescope and an S-Big uh, CCD camera and it was 15 three minute subs each with red green and blue filters and owen asked about the color balancing you know i think it looks pretty good um the trifid in natural color should have this sort of pinkish uh red to represent the, the h beta um and the, the, then there's the reflection nebula down here and it's interacting with an h alpha signal um and you, it looks like your star color variety is nice. Um, one thing I'd change in processing here is just uh, the crop. I think when you're this close to it being centered, I think it's just going to look better uh, centered. And I don't see really anything interesting over there. So I would just do that. Um, but that's really it. I think. Uh, you know, I don't have that much experience with a 32 inch scope. So I don't know if this is critical sharpness. The stars like look a little uh, bloated, but that might just be because you're battling, you know, seeing conditions and all of that, you know, because the because the details in the nebula do look pretty sharp. So. All right. And this is by Pascal. Pascal sent a single exposure of the Milky Way taken with a Sony camera and a wide angle lens. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple suggestions. One is with a single wide angle shot like this, it can be nice to include a bit more of the foreground. You have a little bit of a roof here, but I think I'd appreciate even more. Like if you turned your camera vertical, if that's possible on your tripod, if you could get more of like the horizon, uh, I think that would look cool. Um, and then my second uh, thought is that it's very blue. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional. Um, I, I tried with the JPEG to maybe go back, go to a sort of more neutral color balance here with more star variety color. Paulinho C88 shot the Milky Way core with a Canon XTI DSLR and a Canon Nifty 50 lens wide open at f1.8. And this was all on a Celestron alt as mount. And they also used some custom programs on a Raspberry Pi computer to control everything. And Paulinho C88 mentioned that the chromatic aberration and the vignetting were likely a result of the lens. And yes, I can confirm with this Nifty 50 wide open, um, this is the best performance to expect in terms of star distortion. Um, and I think it looks pretty good uh, for this lens. So well processed with Cyril and Gimp. Uh, Pauline Hosiede did mention this glow in the bottom right here and was wondering if I knew what it is. To me, it just looks like a stacking artifact. Um, you know, I can sort of see it here too. Uh, probably a rotational artifact since you're using an alt as mount. So as the um, night progresses, it's rotating the frame slightly. And uh, you can see that down there. Now, why can't we see it up here? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I can see a sort of red line right there. So I think the whole frame is rotating and it's just clearer, cl clearer down here. So, uh, you know, what I would do with that kind of thing is just uh, lose about whatever, 30, 20% of the picture uh, and get rid of that. Because I think as long as you still have sort of the key things you're going for, uh, I think it's it, it's fine. And you still have 
the lagoon and triffid centered if you sort of crop in on all directions. Okay, and here is from uh, Peter or Petar, I'm not sure which pronunciation, um, but uh, Petar sent in an image of the Eagle Nebula um, taken with narrowband filters and a mono camera. And they said the thing that they struggled with the most was the color mix uh, being new to narrowband. I played around with the data that you sent in and you know, I didn't get anything radically different or better uh, than you got here. Uh, I think that it's just that HOO, uh, hydrogen and oxygen only, is sort of unsatisfying uh, on this target since the Pillars of Creation shot uh, literally invented the Hubble palette, which is this more gold, green, and blue look. Um, and we, we can only achieve that once we have separation with the sulfur data too. So I think that that's just become so iconic that this, with this object, that it's hard to feel it like that it's finished with this more subtle HOO palette, even though it's still quite beautiful. Um, you know, we could we could go further with making this blue, but I, I tried that and it didn't look really quite right. Um, so I think you did a really fine job here with very nice details and uh, well controlled stars and a and a very nice field. Okay, and then we have Peter H. Um, different Peter sent in this image of the Cygnus Loop supernova remnant, and it was captured with a Nikon DSLR, a zoom lens, and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer tracker. And the nebulae came out really well in your rendition here. Um, lots of fine details. The difficult part with this region is always how to handle that star field um, since it's uh, so dense and packed with stars. It can overwhelm the photo and then you also have the noise from the DSLR to deal with, um, which makes it extra difficult. So here's my attempt. Um, I think compared to yours, I sacrificed star color a bit um, to get a slightly cleaner result um, in the background. A little bit more uniform and free of color noise. Um, and then the other thing I did is I just felt your crop felt a little bit cramped, so I just opened it up a little bit uh, in the corners here. Okay, next we have Prashant, and Prashant sent in an image of the Markarian's chain of galaxies. This was taken with 107 millimeter refractor, a QHY 268M and LRGB filters. Uh, so this is excellent framing. Uh, you know, I like that Prashant was able to fit it in like this. It looks really cool. And uh, I think that, you know, with, with a wide view like this, you, you want to try to be able to see differences between these, all these little on galaxies and that's hard to do because you're you're so far zoomed out so you really have to push things like saturation and contrast and things like that uh, to make them stand out now of course that's a trade-off because when you when you really zoom in on them if you've really pushed saturation then you get sort of uh things where it's like that's just blown you know it's like it's just a, a pink blob around an orange blob uh, you know, same thing over here. If we really zoom in, there's just like blown details, but those, those details actually look much better, um, than not pushing them as hard when you're zoomed out like this. So I think that Prashant, you know, hit a good balance here by pushing the saturation so hard on an image like this, because I'm often not satisfied when I look at Markarian's chain in an, in a wide field and it just looks sort of boring and this doesn't. So I think the only, the only way to make it better, uh, would be to shoot with an even bigger telescope, like a, a mirror, a mirrored telescope and, um, and then do a mosaic of this region, but that's a lot of work. So I think, uh, this is the best you can do with, with a, a wide field refractor like he has. Okay, and then we have Pratulia, and Pratulia sent an image of 
Orion and part of Monoceros, um, shot untracked with a Nikon mirrorless camera and a lens at 42 millimeter focal length. And Pretulia stacked in Deep Sky Stacker, extracted the background gradient in Serial and stretched in Photoshop. I like it. Uh, it's a very nice composition and uh, you brought out the, the interesting dark nebula structures up here. Um, the, the only thing I think is a little funky is over here on the right hand side, you're getting some stacking artifacts, I think. So I might chop that off. Um, here's sort of my rendition where I chopped that off and just added a bit more contrast and saturation uh, compared to your rendition. Um, but I think that yours is definitely on the right track and looks it looks really nice. Uh, so well done. It's a it's a balancing act with wide field shots like this to you know control the star field, uh, bring out what you want to bring out, and also work on the the noise and everything that comes with that with shooting untracked. Randall sent an image of the Milky Way shot with a Nikon DSLR and an eighteen to fifty five kit lens on a star tracker. And Randall stacked 31 minute exposures with Sequator and then color corrected in Photoshop. And I think your color correction looks very good. Uh, one thing I was a little confused of was this little white line here uh, next to this bright star. Um, I didn't see it in your stacked TIFF file that you sent, so I'm not sure what caused that. It looks sort of like it could have been a satellite trail, but then usually stacking with, you know, a rejection algorithm will get rid of those. So I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Randall said that he struggled with how much noise there is and how many stars there are, which are both common problems with Milky Way shooting. Um, I wouldn't worry about noise too much with this image as it's not super visible when you look at the whole photo like this. Um, the only thing I'd maybe do is just reduce the green noise a little bit. Photoshop, you can just sort of bring it down a little bit like that. Um, some, you know, ways to try reducing noise are to take temperature matched dark frames, but the best way is just take more total frames, uh, more total photos. So if you did 30 minutes. Uh, if you do two hours, the signal to noise will be twice as good and you, you won't notice the noise as much. Um, in terms of the stars, I, I really like how your image looks with all the stars, but uh, I'll just show you a way to reduce the appearance of the stars, which is uh, different than a traditional star reduction method. So I took your file, I applied Starnet++ to it, I then put the original image back on top, set it to a screen blend mode. And at first it will look no different, but then if I just want to um, reduce the appearance of the stars, I can literally just take the opacity of that stars layer and play around with it a little bit to make them a little bit dimmer in the overall picture. And I think for a Milky Way shot, this works uh, pretty well. Uh, to just, just to reduce the stars uh, with opacity and a screen blend. Okay, Ray sent an image of the Milky Way shot with a Canon DSLR and kit lens on a tripod. It's 45 shots at 13 seconds each from a green zone, uh, meaning green on the map in terms of light pollution. It was processed in Lightroom with selective color masks. And Ray asked about how uh, would flats and darks have helped? Maybe a bit. I don't honestly see, you know, there's a bit of vignetting up here. Maybe flats could have helped with that. There's probably hot pixels in there, but it, for a wide shot, I don't know if it really matters. Uh, if you, There's a couple hot pixels. So there'd probably be some benefit, but I often skip them for my Milky Way shots too. Um, my main critique your shot is I think it's just a little bit over processed um, with the saturation and the and the colors. Um, uh, but this is of course a more of a personal preference thing. But I would have 
processed it a little bit more like this just to get the natural color of the Milky Way. Um, it's more, your, yours is more of like a, um, a fantasy look, I guess, with sort of this like blue and pink. Uh, and then this is more of like a, you know, a naturalistic look, I guess. Um, so not quite as pretty. Uh, so I could go either way, but that's just sort of, uh, if you wanted to see what it looked like with more, uh, the natural color of the Milky Way, this is sort of the direction to go. Okay, and then Remus. Remus sent an image of the bubble nebula region in Cepheus. I think this looks uh, very good in terms of capture and processing. Uh, for some reason, when I started to process your TIFF, I'm, get, I'm getting really weird banding. I'm not sure if you're seeing that on your end when processing. If you are, try to get to the bottom of it. It could be like a power supply issue uh, with the camera or try a different gain setting. If you aren't seeing that banding, then just ignore this because it's, I don't really see it in the end result that you have here. So maybe something went wrong with the TIFF file you sent. I'm not sure. Um, in terms of what else to try with this, I try separating out the color channels to mono and um, that's easy to do with uh, a button in PixInsight. And you might be able to pull out some more separation of the HA and the O3. But honestly, this, this region is pretty HA dominant. So this mostly red look is mostly what I've seen for this uh, region of the sky. There, there is more O3 in the lobster claw here, but you've only caught sort of the part of it. But um, the O3 you do have in the lobster claw is looking sort of green. I, I think... I prefer more of a blue O3, so I just changed it here just to show you what that looks like. So here's green. We'll zoom in. And then if I change it to like a little bit more of a blue, it looks like that. Um, but there's not a lot of, like I said, there's not a huge amount of O3 in this, in this region. So I think this looks uh, pretty good. Okay, Rendon says this was their first attempt at an HA RGB image, and it's of the Seder butterfly. Um, it's processed with PixInsight followed by Photoshop, and Rendon says their issue with the image is the dark circles around the stars, as you can see. Um, I looked through all of Rendon's steps that they said they um, made, and I'm not sure at what point the, the dark circles appeared and Rendon said they weren't sure either. My first guess is they mentioned a smart sharpen step in Photoshop and sharpening can often cause these dark rings or at least accentuate them. So I would just skip sharpening because I never, I never do it to my nebula shots. I don't think it's necessary. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you to try is just Process your HA however you want, then make it starless with Starnet++, which is included with PixInsight. Take that starless HA into Photoshop, set it to RGB mode, um, colorize that, and then put the RGB image on top and use a blending mode like Screen uh, or Lighten or whatever, and then just use curves until the blend looks right. Um, so th that's just another processing idea. Um, but I, I think probably your dark rings are from that smart sharpen step or, uh, cause I didn't really see anything else in your processing workflow that was going to cause them. Okay. And then, uh, Rick, Rick sent in a photo of Saturn and, you know, I'm not really the best to judge planetary images cause all my attempts at it have been lacking much detail, but this looks really good to me. Uh, Rick has clearly resolved the Cassini division, which is this uh, separation between the rings there. And um, my only critique here is that there seems to be a little bit of separation um, between the, going in too far there, between the red and the blue, because you can see some red outline there and then some blue bluish stuff here and here there um 
and so that usually that happens because uh, the atmosphere. Um, so an atmospheric dispersion corrector, an ADC, may help with that if you don't already use one. I think ZWO makes a pretty inexpensive one. Um, that's my only sort of planetary tip that I can I can think of. Otherwise, I think it looks really good. Ricky, a 17-year-old astrophotographer from New Zealand, sent a great image of the Ophiuchus region here, taken with a stock Canon DSLR and a 50 millimeter lens and a star tracker, and uh, processed with PixInsight and Photoshop. I think this looks nearly perfect. Uh, the only thing that stood out to me to improve is that there's still just a little bit of uh, green noise left. Um, the best thing to do for that is after you color calibrate, but before you stretch, use the SCNR green noise reduction tool at about 25-30% strength. Um, you know, uh, just to show the difference here in Photoshop, it won't be the same. It'll just something like that uh, is the difference I'd expect uh, if you just reduce the green noise a little bit. Um, that's the only thing I saw. Other than that, this looks you know perfect to me. I love this framing uh, that you have here with the the row Fuki coming out from the uh, from the bottom like a sort of like a tree. Uh, looks really nice. Okay, Rishub. Uh, Rishub sent an image of the Milky Way shot untracked. It's just 51 shots at 10 seconds each with a Canon M50 mirrorless camera. In terms of editing, um, I would just suggest cropping off um, a little bit. The sides here, I don't think they are adding much. Uh, and so just something like this, I think. And then I'd probably just try to fix this uh, spike of light pollution. Um, in terms of acquisition, I'd try doing maybe 10 times or more the number of lights uh, if possible, just to really bring down uh, the noise in the final image. Uh, but it looks like a great start. Uh, just to manage the noise, we just need more signal. So something like 500 shots or 1,000 shots uh, is, is best for this kind of Milky Way untracked kind of image. OK, and then another uh, reshub and another Milky Way image. This one, a single image shot from a city. And they said that they they used the expose to the right rule to capture it. So I actually don't suggest expose to the right for astrophotography. It will tend to just blow out highlight detail and make it unrecoverable. So uh, generally, I don't recommend that. Maybe for a single exposure, it's fine. Uh, maybe that's, but if you're going to stack, which is what I'd recommend you try next, then don't expose to the right, expose to the left, uh, not, you know, just above uh, the, the left edge. So getting it, you know, getting that histogram bump to about one quarter of the way over is what you want. Anyways, uh, Rishab asked if I could try to bring out as much detail in the Milky Way as possible. So let's see, here we go. That's what I was able to do. Uh, compared to Rishab's shot, you can see here, um, I was able to bring out a, a little bit more of the dark nebula streamers, um, but nothing I can do about these extreme gradients. So it's really just trying to get this middle part as uh, re recovered as possible. Uh, and I think that's it. So that's sort of what you can expect to achieve from a single exposure from the city exposing to the right. It's a good experiment. Okay, and then we have Rob. Rob sent in an image of the Carina Nebula taken with a Canon R6 camera uh, stock and the William Optics 73 millimeter refractor and a Skywatcher HEQ5 mount. 
And Rob says this was their first time using PixInsight. They were struggling to bring out the depth of the nebula. Um, but I, th I think this looks really good, especially with a, you know, a stock camera. I wonder when you're talking about bringing out the depth, if you're comparing it to shots taken with a modified camera or an astro camera, which is pre-modified, because uh, they're going to pick up a lot more of the dim hydrogen emission that extends out. Uh, but it's a trade-off because then if you're if you're using one of those, then the H alpha will sort of dominate all this blue stuff in the middle and it will turn out a lot more pink or, or red. Um, so anyways, I don't really have anything to critique with this image. It looks great to me. And uh, I can't uh, wait to someday try this uh, object out myself. Okay, and then we have Roger and Roger uh, sent in an image of the Orion Nebula, had some questions about his gear. He's using an Artist Sky flattener reducer, but uh, wasn't sure it was flattening the field correctly. Because uh, if we look at the stars here, they do look pretty elongated, especially in the corners. So no, that doesn't look right for uh, field flattener. Um, the spacing should be pretty easy with a flattener. It's 55 millimeters with that particular field flattener. So with the DSLR, you should just want to get a 48 millimeter T adapter designed for Canon uh, EOS. So your Canon 60D, you know, screw that on to the flattener and then attach your DSLR to the T adapter and no additional spacers. And you should be right at 55 millimeters. Um, so hopefully that works, uh, to get the right back focus. Um, if you're already doing that, then I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, other than that, my only other processing note is it looks a little bit blue in the blacks, uh, especially towards the bottom of the picture here. Um, so that's easily fixed with just like a curves adjustment, just, you know, uh, something. Like that, I don't know, just a little bit of uh, bringing down the curves. We might, for this shot, you know, there's so much blue down here in this corner still, we might have to do some gradient uh, masking on the on the curves. But uh, that's the that's the basic idea is bring down the blue curve, the blue, blue uh, presence here a little bit in the background. And next up, we have Rohit, and Rohit uh, took an image of the Andromeda Galaxy with a Red Cat 51 and a ZWO uh, 183MC from a Bortle 3 Sky. And I think this looks really good. The overall color rendering is great, and pairing the 183 with the Red Cat is a nice combo. Uh, very good for pulling out lots of detail because uh, you're sampled so well there. My one critique is I think um, at some point in processing, you used a range mask or something um, to increase saturation in the galaxy. And then, but it also increased the saturation of the stars in the galaxy, but not the stars outside of the galaxy. And so then it looks a little bit odd because the, the, you have stars that are in front of the galaxy, not part of the galaxy. And so if those are saturated and these ones aren't, then it looks a bit off. Um, so you need to, when you make a mask, like a range selection, you also have to make a star mask and subtract the star mask from the range selection to get the best, uh, results there. Okay. Ronin captured an image of the North America nebula. This is three hours of broadband and three hours with an L enhance filter. And I think the broadband component is great as the star color looks very good, especially if I look at it sort of over here. Um, but I'm not convinced this is the best palette choice for incorporating the L enhanced data. Um, I think it should be possible to get some separation of the O3 and HA, uh, but this looks sort of like all the one, same color pink. Um, so I think with a different stretch, different combination of the channels, you can get better uh, color separation there and it will help, um, you know, 
make the the things like the Cygnus wall stand out from the rest of the nebula here because right now it's sort of the details getting a bit lost in how same color everything is. Okay, and then we have Rowan. Rowan took this image of the Milky Way untracked with their smartphone, and this was their first attempt. Um, so I think this looks really great with the gear and technique that Rowan is using. Um, they asked about calibration frames. I, I haven't had much luck with calibration frames on a smartphone, so I probably would skip that. Um, in any case, I think it's really nice how well you captured, you know, uh, some of the details here, like the Lagoon Nebula um, and the dark horse uh, right here. Um, I think next time, if you uh, recenter the Milky Way about five times uh, over the night as you're taking more frames, that should help eliminate uh, some of this diagonal walking noise uh because i think that's maybe from if you just let the image drift uh pretty dramatically and then realigned it based on the stars you're going to get a lot of noise like that um so breaking up that noise uh could just be recentering the milky way in a few different ways uh as you go and and that should help break up the the noise patterns and Sage, Sage took this image of the M51 uh, colliding galaxy pair with their William Optics Z61 telescope and Canon T6 DSLR on an Ioptron Sky Tracker. Uh, so this is a very uh, impressive how much detail Sage got on this galaxy with such a small setup. Uh, the, the only thing I noticed to critique here is just a tiny bit of tracking error uh, sort of going up into the right hand corner it's very minimal though it's just slightly egg shaped left to right um, but I'm surprised there's actually not even more tracking error considering this is a Z61 it's a pretty big hefty you know little telescope this is 360 millimeter focal length on an Ioptron sky tracker so not their bigger sky guider pro but the the sky tracker so uh, really all I can say is, you know, keep it up, Sage, because this is, I love stuff like this, of like trying to push the limits of your gear and go after, you know, the M51 with a, with a small package like that. That's cool. <clears throat> and Sally, Sally took a great image of the trapezium region uh, of the Orion Nebula with a Mead ETX 60 and an SV Boney 105 camera. And Sally said that this setup is very challenging for astrophotography and hasn't been able to make calibration frames work with it yet. And I mean, I can imagine that would be a very difficult, really challenging setup uh, to have a tiny sensor, one of the smallest to cheapest cameras you can get, and then pairing it with a long focal length Altaz motorized telescope. I mean, it sounds like a fun challenge, but a, a difficult one. And uh, the trapezium, though, is uh, the obvious choice for me uh, for a deep sky object because it's the brightest deep sky object in the sky, I believe. And so a half second long exposure works well. This is multiple half second long exposures stacked. Um, but, you know, this you I think you've just split the, the four... Uh, trapezium stars there a b c and d in the cluster and uh so i think this looks really good i don't really have any particular advice for improvement since i don't have much experience with this kind of gear but uh i do have a suggestion for another object to go after i'd like to see what you could do with the ring nebula m57 uh, i think it's bright enough so that half second exposures should work well for that too i don't know it might be harder to find than Orion, or I, I know it would be harder to find than Orion, but if you can find it and uh, uh, get exposures going on it, I think that would be a cool one with this setup. And then we have Sam. Sam sent in an image of the Milky Way captured untracked with a smartphone. Uh, Sam shot 76 photos at 25 seconds each from a yellow zone. 
So Sam asked how to improve, but I feel like I should be taking lessons on smartphone astrophotography from Sam because this just seems remarkably good to me, uh, considering the technique, untracked smartphone and the sky condition being yellow. Um, I mean, I suppose it might be even better with like a barn door tracker. So I have a video on making one of those, but I don't know. The processing here looks really great to me. It doesn't look overdone. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a dark um, darkening on this side uh, and then a little bit of green down here. But uh, overall, I think, you know, this just looks really good for for this technique. So well done, Sam. And here we have Samuel um, and Samuel captured the Milky Way centered on the lagoon at Triffid with a Sony mirrorless camera, Rokinon 135, and Star Tracker. And Samuel said that he shot this low on the horizon and therefore had trouble with natural color except for the reddish feel. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I guess just that it looks reddish. Um, I'm not... Uh, so if you want to correct the red, then, um, I mean, a simple way, we could just take a curves adjustment and go to the red and see that there's a bunch of room there and then just like do that. Um, you know, now it looks a little green, so then we might have to go into greens and correct that a little bit too. But then, you know, that's a simple way to correct the sort of overall red tone to it. Um, I think that gets us sort of like 80% there. If you want to go all the way, I think you need to start with um, uh, a gradient, you know, reduction technique, like a background extraction when the data is still linear. So that's what I did here. That gets us to an even more neutral uh, photo. And I, this, you know, you could process this further, but I think it's pretty interesting that, uh, you know, this is pulling out some pretty interesting little stuff. This is the Twiddlebug Nebula right there. I can sort of see it. Um, and then we have the star clouds up here at the top look pretty good. So uh, the program I can recommend to do this kind of work is Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. It's a free program or PixInsight that's paid, um, but it'll allow you to extract the background while the data is still linear, and that's going to look uh, even better for color correction. Okay, Sandu G sent a wonderful photo here of the Blue Horsehead Nebula which is a nice challenging object, very large reflection nebula near the more famous uh, Ro Ufiuki region, sort of just above it. And Sandu G said they had issues with star reduction, leaving artifacts and gaps. Yes, that's why I don't use star reduction for the most part. Um, I just use star removal with Starnet++ and then blend the stars back in as is but you can sort of control this intensity of them since they're on their own layer and you can control the stretch. Um, I, I guess these stars seem to me to be like overstretched and then reduced. Uh, they're like very bloated here and then they seem reduced after that. So I don't think that's a good idea generally. Um, then I also think you went a little bit too dark with the background here. Like if I look at your uh, starless image, you have a lot of dust out here. And I, I get that it's sort of broken up because of noise. Uh, so maybe you went dark because you wanted to hide some of that um, broken upness of the of that. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's a balancing act. I get it. Um, so I'm not going to criticize that too much because I, I didn't go through the steps of processing this. And so maybe you found you just couldn't bring out all that dust. Um, uh, so it, it's uh, something to consider. But the other thing I'd say about the stars is if you don't reduce them, I think they can help hide actually some of that noise um, rather than, you know, when you when you reduce the stars and then you have the all of the dusty stuff, it's it's really difficult because it's it's usually that very faint dust is noisy. And so. Uh, it's uh, you're gonna have to do something with it and the gaps and artifacts you're talking about are just sort of the result of of processing the photo too much sometimes um so i think you you 
this is a very dramatic look, um, but if you wanted to go for something a little bit less dramatic, I think just putting all of the stars onto something like this and then just increasing the saturation might look good too. All right. Sandmore. Sandmore shot the Lagoon and Triffid Nebula with an Olympus camera, a Nikkor lens, and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. Oh, and a SV Boney UHC filter, ultra high contrast. And Sandmore processed this with Deep Sky Stacker, Cyril, and Snapseed. So I think the Lagoon Nebula here looks great. Um, not blown out, but in nice detail on that cluster. Um, some of the stars, or most of the stars, I guess, seem too saturated to me. You know, when they're this bright red, uh, sort of a solid saturated red, that almost looks like a hot pixel. Uh, I think that means your stars are are too saturated. So just to show you how I'd, how I'd process your image, this is just um, uh, a crop background extraction and stretch in Cyril followed by just a small reduction in green here and that's it um and you can see the the star color is a little bit more natural so stars that have gone sort of red in your image are more of a orange in my image i mean they're, they're sort of red stars but they they don't look that red um uh so this is sort of uh a more natural maybe more boring uh look than what you have here but uh just to give you an idea of another way to go and then next we have sasha and sasha captured this wonderful dark nebula region with a 170 no, 107 millimeter refractor and a zwo 2600 mc camera so a color ZWO camera, and they processed it in PixInsight. And uh, so they're most concerned with color and saturation. And, uh, you know, I think both the color and saturation are really well done. Uh, the colorful star field always looks so good with this um, brown dust stuff. And then I think your your black is perfect. I love, I love this black. Um, so I think that looks really good. Well, my one critique is um, you wrote out all your steps. And personally, I would have skipped the morphological transformation step at the end. Uh, just because to me, uh, you know, I think what happened when you did that is it made the smallest stars smaller. And uh, that that when you do that, I think the smallest stars just end up looking sort of like noise because they're so small. Um, with PixInsight, if uh, to play with a star de-emphasis just with PixInsight, I would check out Adam Block's method. Um, and there's now a script for it too, which can make it even easier. Um, but I found that the Adam Block method, um, instead of going after the smallest stars, it's going to go after this size star, like a medium size star, and make that a little bit smaller. Um, it leaves the big stars alone and it leaves the smallest stars alone. It goes after those sort of medium ones, which I think is is the best uh, idea for a star de-emphasis. Okay, and then Sasandu. Sasandu shot the Milky Way with a Canon DSLR and kit lens, untracked from a yellow zone, processed with Deep Sky Stacker and GIMP. And it looks like Sasandu pushed the saturation pretty far um, and maybe before removing light pollution gradients, which, what, which is what's giving us this sort of color shift from red to yellow uh, to green even. Um, and so I'd suggest Sasandu look into using Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. It's free and open source. It has a background extraction tool and uh, so that's what I was able to get out of it. Um, it gives a much flatter image like this, and uh, and then you can continue to process and you know add saturation and do all that kind of stuff to it. Um, but if you're if you have a pretty flat image like this to start out with, then when you add 
saturation to your image. You don't get these sort of extreme artificial uh, color shifts because basically you're just uh, coloring uh, a light pollution gradient when you if you haven't flattened the the overall image first. And Sergey Sergey shot the North America and Pelican with a modded Nikon DSLR, a telephoto lens, and an Optolong L Enhance on a Star Tracker. And Sergey said that their main problem was with flats and thought that they didn't take them correctly. And my first thought was that this picture looked a little bit soft. Um, so I wondered if it was out of focus. But when I processed the raw data that Sergey sent, it was much sharper. So I'm not sure why it came out sort of soft like that. But then also in the raw data, um, there are these little black artifacts sort of all over. Um, and so I don't know. Uh, Sergey didn't really mention those, I don't think. Um, so my guess is that the sensor or the lens are dirty. I'm betting more on the sensor. Um, it looks like a physical issue of some kind, um, but I guess if the flats were really wrong, it could be that too. Um, but without knowing more details, I can't say. But for flats, uh, an easy thing to try is just uh, very short exposures on a bright, you know, blue sky. Uh, those are called sky flats. Uh, try those if you if you haven't, because I think you have really nice data here except for all these little black spots so i'm not really sure what those are about and then next we have shake van shake van captured the cygnus loop supernova remnant with a canon 80d and a 200 millimeter lens on a star tracker with an sv bony cls filter from a yellow zone and i think this looks pretty good um, as we've seen from past pictures in this critique, the Veil Nebula is difficult with this dense star field. And this is a pretty dramatic way to handle it. It's like uh, all most of the stars, the small stars are gone because uh, they're so dimmed. Um, but I think, um, I actually think it looks pretty well done uh, for the technique you used. My one crit critique of this uh, picture is that the sky background looks sort of blue green so i just maybe move the black point slightly on that um something like that i don't know uh might be slightly better um then but then you are losing maybe some of this uh o3 nebulosity um by doing it that way so i don't know a trade-off okay and then we have shushank pincha shushank pincha um captured the eagle nebula with a zwo 533mc and an optolong l enhance and a william optics zenith star 81 on an ioptron mount from a Bortle 7 sky. And this was their first shot with the new equipment. Uh, so they didn't have much time to set it up and they didn't have as much time for gathering the images, only 49 minutes. Uh, but Shashank asked if there is anything to do in processing that can make up for having so little data. Not really. Uh, the only thing I'd suggest is um, your background sky is very bright here with like lots of weird noise i'm not sure the i think you did something weird with noise reduction um to get it like that so i would do much less noise reduction try not to brighten the sky so much try to keep it more dark um uh, maybe some of this is actual ha emission um I don't know. It, it looks weird to me. Um, so I don't remember ever seeing a ton of HA emission like this above the Eagle. I think I, I thought most of it was low, so, but I could be wrong. That could be actual HA, but it, it, it looks weird. Um, uh, and then 
Shashank also asked about Deep Sky Stacker versus Weighted Batch Preprocessor WBPP in Pix Insight versus doing a full manual calibration, registration, and stacking in Pix Insight. And personally, I've had good luck with any method, um, but what I do, if it's just one night, uh, a one night project, then I'll typically use the weighted batch preprocessor in Pix Insight. If it's an ongoing multi night project, then I do everything manually because I find that easier and more flexible to manage the way that I do it. Um, uh, and then you wrote a number of other things. Um, I'll, I'll note them down and try to address them in, in future videos. Okay, and then Shipwreck 88. Uh, Shipwreck 88 captured the Lagoon Nebula with an L Enhance filter, uh, but actually didn't mean to use the L Enhance filter as they usually have it installed for city imaging, but this was taken from a darker Bortle 4 site. Uh, and then one thing Shipwreck 88 asked is if the L Enhance was a detriment to the image. I mean, yes and no. In this case, I'd say mostly yes, since this is um, in the Milky Way. And so getting that natural star color looks really cool in this for this field because it really fills the field with lots of nice stars. Um, and the L Enhance being a dual narrowband filter is pretty crappy for the stars. They all sort of look white or red. Um, uh, when like that, this cluster here should be a brilliant blue, for instance. Um, and then also, uh, speaking of blue right here, this should be a brilliant blue reflection nebula because of the L enhance, it gets, it gets pretty dimmed out, uh, cause you just have that sm smaller 20 nanometer band pass, uh, for picking up the blue. Um, and most of that's sort of actually tilted to the green. So no filter probably would have been better but also a mix of this and the no filter would have been good too. Here's my uh, crazy rendition, just to really pull out uh, as much detail as there is in here. I know that it's like very noisy uh, outside of the nebulae, um, but I just wanted to show you that how much was in your data in terms of uh, this bridge between the lagoon and this thing, and uh, even there's even more blue sort of reflection uh, in there. Um, so just to give you an idea of if you really wanted to push your data further, um, you could. Uh, the best would be to do something like this, like what I'm doing here, and then make this starless and then put the good stars on, on top of this uh, for, with no filter. Okay, hey, this is Simon. Simon captured the central part of the Orion constellation with a Nikon Z50 and a zoom lens on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And Simon mentioned that the right star here on the Orion's belt looking a bit funky, but found it looked that way in all of their light frames and uh, asked if that's about the lens. And yes, I can confirm that that's distortion that's common with camera lenses, so uh, nothing you can do about it. I do like the saturation of the blue stars. That looks cool. Um, I think the saturation on the reds and magentas across the frame is a little bit too much. So just to give you an idea of where I'd put it, I'd put it closer to there. So here's before. Notice these very reddish orange uh, saturated things. And then there's after. And even though this is just the JPEG, I feel like I'm recovering detail in the flame there. Uh, so uh, that's a personal thing, but that, that's where I'd put the saturation on those colors. The blue saturation, I think, looks fine. Uh, very high, highly saturated like you have it. Okay, and then we have Simon Pepper 85 who captured the Veil Nebula or the Cygnus Loop, whatever you want to call it, with a Red Cat, a ZWO294MC, and an Optolong L Extreme filter. I think this looks pretty good. Um, it's a very dramatic look, lots of contrast. The, you know, maybe this 
you're starting to blow details here in some parts uh, with how bright this is. Um, but it stands out very boldly. And Simon Pepper 85 mentioned they're never satisfied with prints compared to seeing their photos on a monitor or on Instagram. And I think there are a number of reasons prints can end up not looking how we want compared to what we see on the screen. I plan to do a series on printing options in the future, including lots of tips for printing at home where we have a little bit more control over the process and can experiment a bit more to get the best results uh, possible. And so hopefully I can get to that this year um, and give people some good tips for printing astrophotography because it's pretty different than printing anything else, I think. Um, okay, and then we have Stefan who sent in the Eagle Nebula taken with a full spectrum Canon DSLR and a combination of HA filtered exposures and ones with an astronomic um, L2 filter, which is a luminance filter. So that's good for getting the natural star color, which Stefan has here. Um, I did process this uh, picture from scratch and didn't think that my uh, rendition really looked any different than yours. Uh, I think the only chase choice I made differently was cropping in just a tiny bit more than you did. Um, but other than that, I think uh, with the great sort of, you know, detail you got here in the pillars and the HA data, I just wanted to crop in a little bit more. Okay, and then we have Steph, who is a 16-year-old astrophotographer who captured the Veil Nebula with a Skywatcher 200 PDS uh, reflector and a ZWO 294MC and an Optolong L Enhance filter. And Steph asked why the background looks so dead, uh, especially the lower right here. And says their guess is that it needs more contrast. Um, I think the issue there is you're bringing out the details uh, too much. Uh, basically, that this should be a fainter signal than the main part of the Veil Nebula here. But because you're pushing it to be as bright as this, then it looks dead in comparison, um, if that makes sense. So, because if we imagine the Veil Nebula is this big sphere, that's what it is, sort of, is a supernova remnant. Um, I think this part is probably the back of the sphere, and then this part is like the front of the sphere. And so this part should be a lot dimmer than this part. Um, so uh, here's sort of my interpretation, given that, of how I would change your processing. So here's yours, there's mine. You can see I made this part back here, this part here, this part here. Kept those all much dimmer while making the the veil, the main veil nebula here a lot brighter because uh, it feels like it should be, and it is, I think, closer to us. Um, so uh, just keeping it very simple, uh, don't oversaturate, don't over brighten the background stuff, focus your attention on the main event, which will help it stand out and look like it is more uh, in front and in charge. Um, all right, and it's a, you know, it's a really nice data, it was fun to process, so thanks for sending it, Steph. Okay, Stefan captured the Andromeda Galaxy with a Canon EOS R6 and a Canon FD 80 to 200 millimeter lens, which is an old lens. Um, he said no matter what he tried with flats, he couldn't get rid of this very strong ring pattern. Um, and so, you know, that's really, those ring patterns are hard to get rid of. Sometimes you have to track down what could be reflecting I don't know if it's something with the lens, um, uh, but I've, I've encountered those ring patterns mostly with spacers that were sort of an anodized metal and shiny, um, even though they were black, they were, would reflect. Um, 
course, in this image, you just crop down to get rid of them. But uh, if you didn't want to crop them out, uh, they're hard to, like I said, they're hard to get rid of. The way I'd sort of approach it is making these circular gradients and so then brightening the middle part. I didn't quite get it right. And then brightening the outer ring and then you darken the whole thing. And you can see it's still there a little bit because I didn't quite do it right. But um, that's the basic idea of how I'd approach trying to get rid of those those rings. Uh, very difficult, unfortunately. Okay, and then we have Subtle Astro. Subtle Astro shot this at f5 on a static tripod with a Sigma zoom lens and a stock Canon DSLR without any filters from a Bortal 8 sky. So that's a very challenging uh, setup. So good for you for giving it a go. Um, my suggestion with processing is to be careful with the star treatment um, as it feels like lots of your stars have disappeared or sort of turned into a pattern of noise kind of thing. Um, uh, I did process your image from your stacked TIFF file and um, got a pretty different result because I kept in all the stars. Um, but I, I still think a, a very impressive result that we can really see the clear outline of the North America and Pelican, even some details within them, um, untracked from a Vortal 8. I didn't even know that was possible with a stock camera from Vortal 8. So uh, I, always, I always like to know that uh, things I didn't know were possible are actually possible. And then we have Sons of Cosmos, who captured the North America Nebula with a Celestron Rasa, uh, ZWO294MM, and Botter high-speed narrowband filters. And I like, uh, I like these colors for the Nebula. The green looks awesome here. Uh, this cool, it's like a sort of bluish green, I think. Um, and uh, has a nice subtle transition into the other colors, into the yellows and the and the oranges. Um, I have two small critiques. One is that the stars don't need to be this saturated, and the um, saturation I think is what's causing them to have these sort of dark ring-like uh, features on them, which is most distracting, like over here and in here uh, where the the dark rings really stand out doesn't really matter in the dark nebula and then speaking of the dark nebula they they look this one especially looks way too blue I'm not sure why that happened but um be easy to fix just to you know go into your blue channel and and uh bring and fix that like that well maybe it's not as easy to fix as i thought is I'm now really <laughs> changing the color balance. So let's see if I do something like that. No. Well, anyways, I that's uh, I guess it's not working on the JPEG here, but that that dark nebula there uh, shouldn't be blue. It should be uh, black, basically. Uh, Tadij uh, captured the Cygnus region around the bright star Deneb right here, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen it uh, like this. Uh, this is feels flipped to me. I'm just gonna flip it just, uh, just to show you what I mean. So I'm used to it looking like that with uh, the North America in the right way around. Um, anyways, um, the only other uh, Suge suggestion I have in terms of I don't you can flip it or not flip it I don't really care um, but uh, just for me it feels more natural this way but uh, the only other suggestion I have is uh, here this um, bright corner right here just feels a little bit uh, unnatural I think that's a light pollution gradient um, and it, it feels like um, maybe combination of like a slight crop uh, with 
uh, something in Photoshop here. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, so if I just do maybe a slight crop and then do a I know this is this is weird what I'm doing here. This doesn't seem to make sense, but then what I'm going to do is on this mask, I'm just going to apply a little gradient like that. And then the result is this, taking out the that brightness of that corner. And you just get a nice flatter field that way. Um, but I think this looks really nice. I should have mentioned this was shot with a Nikon DSLR, Nikon zoom lens, and on a Star Adventure by Skywatcher, and it's from a Bortle for Sky. And so, yeah, there's just that same process. I guess I already did it once. Okay, and here is Talal. Talal is a 16 year old astrophotographer from Kuwait. And Talal shot the Elephant Trunk Nebula untracked from Bortle 9 Sky, wow, with a stock camera and lens. And this they took over 3,000 shots. Wow, I think this um, that's dedication. And this looks really good considering that gear and uh, technique and sky condition. Um, you can see a lot of the dark nebula and the sky and the stars look really good too. Now we're not seeing really any of the emission nebula, um, but it's very dim uh, to shoot untracked. It's not the first one I would have thought of uh, to try untracked. It's it's a very dim nebula. So I'm amazed at how much you were able to bring out and clean up uh, here uh, just uh, with what you did. Um, so keep it up. I think you're going to love that tracker you mentioned when you get it. Uh, maybe you already have it at this point, and I, I'm interested to see more from you. Okay, and then we have uh, Tapfret, and Tapfret sent in a nice image of the Andromeda Galaxy taken with a Canon DSLR, a telephoto lens, and an Ioptron Skyguider Pro. And Tapfret said their issues they had in processing was the glows left behind by Starnet++ when it removes stars and dealing those without dealing with those without complex masks. And Tapfret specifically mentioned having issues with Messier 32, which is this little thing right here, this little satellite galaxy. And so let me show you my approach here. So let's start with the starless. You can see here's the starless M32. We have that nasty artifact. But when I add the stars back, M32 comes back, and I don't think it really looks that bad because it covers up that artifact. Um, and then I just add some selective color and curves adjustments uh, until it's uh, done. So it's there's more stars. Uh, the stars are brighter than in Tapfritz. Uh, uh, interpretation um, in mine's a little there's you know it's a little bit um, more stars and like I said but uh, I I don't find that starnet artifacts don't really bother me because they, they get covered up uh, as soon as I add back the stars um, but with the benefit of the galaxy does pop out uh, by doing it this way because like if I just use the stars layer let me turn this off turn this to normal you can see that doesn't look nearly as finished as if I turn this back on and turn the stars layer to screen okay next we have tensor and tensor captured the lagoon and trifid area with an aperture 60 ed at f6 with a ZWO 294MC and on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. Wow. So just over an hour of data from a Bortle 4 Sky. And they said they were disappointed in various aspects, various aspects of it, but 
you know, I really think that's just a matter of expectations being too high, perhaps, because I think this looks excellent for the equipment and sky conditions and amount of data. I don't really see anything in the processing that could be improved. In my opinion, it's excellent. Uh, you have really cool details throughout the field. Um, Tensor mentioned they hadn't found many processes in Pix Insight that had worked well to improve their data with some processes making it worse. For um, processes, they mentioned making it worse. They mentioned deconvolution and multi-scale multi -scale linear transform, MLT. So in my experience, the only way deconvolution works well on undersampled data like this is if you get a ton of very well dithered data, drizzle it at two times, and then do decon on that drizzled data. Um, but this unfortunately won't work for you since you can't dither effectively enough with a star adventurer since it doesn't move in declination. And so then I don't think drizzle is a good idea. Um, so I wouldn't do decon, um, or you can, but it's just not going to do anything. MLT um, can be used for blurring or sharpening at different scales. So I'm not sure which you tried it for. With enough data, I think it can be used to blur out some fine noise scales, um, like the very like sort of small variations in noise. Um, but with only an hour of data, I wouldn't recommend it for that. Um, I find that kind of blurring noise reduction with something like MLT or MMT, that works best when you have like 15 to 20 hours of data to work with. Um, so anyways, all that's just to say I agree with you. Many of the processes in PixInsight only work well when we can really push the data. Um, and to push the data, it needs to have pretty high SNR, signal to noise ratio, which you'll only get from gathering more data on the target. An hour is uh, going to be tough for a lot of processes. Now, one you did uh, use is the background extraction tools. And I think uh, that's a really cool feature in Pix Insight, and you use them well here because this looks like a very nice flat field. Okay, and then next up we have the astronomy enthusiast who sent in an image of the Eagle Nebula taken with a modded Nikon DSLR, a 500 millimeter telephoto lens, and a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. Wow, another cool one on the Star Adventurer. Uh, this was from Bortal 2 and taken over three nights, so about 12 hours total integration. And the astronomy enthusiast mentioned the one thing they felt they could work on is star control. Well, I'm glad they didn't try to overly reduce the stars. Uh, they look good, they look natural. The, the thing that I notice um, is the stars are sort of one note in terms of color. Um, they're pretty yellow or white, and I think that's a function of sort of blue in general being missing from this photo. Um, so just to step you through how I would process this data, let me switch over to PixInsight. So all I did was I opened your master light and I ran automatic background extractor on it to get this, which I think has really nice um, star color and also nice, um, you know, variation uh, here in the you know, in the main Eagle Nebula region. Um, and then I just ran uh, Starnet++ plus plus on it to get this. Then I brought that, both these images back into Photoshop. Here we go. And I put the Starless on the bottom, put that masked uh, stretch um, on top. This is the stars. Set it to screen blend mode at 100%. And then it was just a little too bright, so then I just brought down the black point, and that's it. So that's an, that's an idea of a very, very simple workflow. I mean, you could, you could keep processing from here, of course, um, do different things, add saturation, whatever. But um, I think uh, it shows you sort of a more natural 
look to your data, uh, natural color uh, with all the star variety and everything. Um, here, I think you just, yeah, you went a little too far into the, like the um, one sort of color scheme. It's just sort of red, pink, and yellow um, only. Um, and then here you just, this is a lot more color variety. Um, so you have sort of like browns and pinks and reds and blues and yellows. Let's see what happens if we add some saturation to this. Not too much. Uh, let's do there. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, Maybe has a little bit of uh, green parts we have to deal with, but pretty nice uh, data. Twelve hours from Bortle two. That's that's. I wish I could uh, have that more often. Okay, next up we have the Mad Lawyer, and the Mad Lawyer sent in an image of the Shark Nebula in Cepheus, taken with a Canon RA and a William Optics GT eighty one telescope. This is about five hours total of data at f5.5 from a Bortle 4 sky. And the Mad Lawyer said that they had a hard time processing dark nebula successfully, finding it hard to pull them out without accentuating artifacts. Um, and the, like the last one, I again tried to keep this very simple. So I'll just step through my process here. I just stretched your uh, TIFF file and ran Starnet++ on it. That gave me this. And yet you can see there's artifacts left over, but I don't, I'm not gonna deal with those. I'm just gonna add contrast here to the starless image and then put the star uh, filled image right on top of it, set to a screen blend mode with the opacity set to 92%. And anywhere there was an artifact, like right there, the star covers it right up. So I'm not gonna care about those artifacts. And then I can uh, reset the black point. So we're really starting to get somewhere now. Um, looks pretty good, I think. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is I just made a new copy of this from Visible. So that's Control-Alt-Shift-E. And then I turned that black and white by just going to image adjustments, black and white. And this is just to make a mask. So I copied this. I'm just going to do control A, control C to copy that. Then do alt click and control V to throw it into this mask on the hue saturation adjustment layer. Turn this layer off so that this hue saturation layer is adjusting on everything below, and this is the difference it makes. So just adding some saturation, and you know we could go even further with it if we wanted to. And then this is how we can sort of see the brown dust, and but also all the nice star color across the field uh, by adding saturation to it. So that's it. Um, I didn't do any noise reduction. I didn't try to clean up any artifacts. I just went starless, contrast, stars with a screen blend mode, reset black point, added saturation. All right, next up we have the Stellar Remnant, who says this is their first photo with this setup and their second attempt ever at astrophotography. They captured the North America and Pelican Nebulae here with a Canon EOS RA, Optolong L Extreme, and a Radian Raptor 61 on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. They said the outside temperature was 93 degrees Fahrenheit but they didn't do any noise reduction just to see how well the camera, the RA, handles high temperatures. Well, I think it looks perfectly well captured. It's very impressive that this is only our second attempt at astrophotography. The processing is good. I, um, it's just a little one note uh, red for my taste. So let me just show you uh, sort of what I would do with it. Um, I would, Start with your, you know, red processing, then go into the channels here 
and extract out this green channel just by copying it, pasting it on here. Okay, I'm gonna then change that green um, layer from normal to screen, gets us this. And then I'm going to clip a hue slash saturation adjustment layer to that green channel extracted, set to a hue in the blues here. That's gonna get us this. And then it's too bright overall now. So I'm just gonna reset our black point like that. And I'm now noticing there's a bit too much green over there. So let's do another curves layer. Go to the green channel, bring down the green, and then do a slight um, gradient here like that. There, actually, maybe there's too much green on almost the entire picture. Let's see. And maybe we don't need a gradient mask at all. Let's just fill that with white. Yeah, actually, I like that. Take out all the green. Okay, so just that just to show you the before and after. So here's before, very red. Here's after, bringing more blue back into the nebulae. And now we have Tim, the astro nerd who sent in a nice rich field of the Pleiades taken with a stock Nikon D5300, a William Optics Red Cat, and the Orion Atlas mount. And Tim said they were pretty new to Photoshop and processed this with an arc sine curve preset. And um, I like how, you know, how much the, you got the dust to stand out. I think overall the image is a little too uh, bright and a little too blue. Um, so just to show you sort of where I would go, I'd bring down the black level a bit like that, and I would bring down um, some of those blues. Now the image is too green, so let's do something like this. Okay, so I would go somewhere like that with the processing, um, just to give you an idea. Some of these dust clouds which look very blue in your image because there's sort of like a blue wash to your whole thing should be more brown and uh yeah and the the sky background should be more of like a a dark blackish brown it's looking you know because i'm just working on the jpeg now it's looking almost too red but you get the idea um, but other than that, I think this looks really good. It looks very nice and sharp and in focus. Whoops. Okay, now we have Tobias. Uh, and Tobias sent in this very well done Star Trails photo. And uh, it's a nice change of pace uh, for this critique. It was shot with a Sony mirrorless camera and a Sigma wide angle lens. And it was uh, over a thousand photos at 30 seconds each combined in Photoshop. Um, nothing to really critique here. It looks pretty flawless to me. Um, I especially like how the color balance of the trails, which is overall pretty blue, plays against this more golden brown of the tower here. I do wonder about your technique, as you said that it was 30 second exposures and combined in Photoshop. I've tried that kind of thing. And um, if, you know, between the 30 second exposures, there's usually like a one second gap while it's taking the next, before it takes the next picture. And I found with that one second gap, it would like leave little gaps that were visible in the star trails. So I found a, a program called Star Stacks that fixes that by filling the gaps. But I wonder if you have a different uh, method in Photoshop for doing that. Okay, and then this next one, this is by another Tobias who captured the Bodes and Cigar Galaxies from a Bortle Six Sky with a William Optics 102 millimeter refractor, a ZWO 2600 MC, 
and an ioptron sem 40 ec mount 12 hours integration time so this is really well done it shows if you put in the time even if you have some light pollution it's possible to get some really nice color and details on galaxies um, and get a very clean result i think um tobias said the only thing they felt there was missing from their photo was attention to the background since they'd seen lots of pictures where i assume what they saw was people bringing out like um, these little uh, satellite galaxies and ifn and all kinds of stuff in the background i'm not sure for, i mean even though you know i just said you got this really nice clean result on the galaxies these are really bright these messier galaxies and so i'm not sure from a Bortle six how much you're going to be able to bring out IFN um, or if it's you know worth worth doing worth trying um so anyways I think you made the right call here with how you processed it uh and and darkening the background to make these galaxies really stand out Tom uh Tom you captured the wizard nebula with a Canon T7 uh, a Skywatcher Star Travel 80T telescope and a Scar Skywatcher Star Adventure. Tom shot 100 lights at 30 seconds each at f4.9. And this is a, definitely a hard object to go after with a stock DSLR. So hats off to you, Tom. And Tom said they struggled with details in the nebula outside the central part and also star color shift between the nebula and the rest of the photo so i guess they mean these sort of pinkish magenta stars here in the nebula i wonder if you were trying to do some selective adjustments and, and caught those stars when you were trying to change the color of the nebula maybe um i'll show my process for your, your data that you sent the stacked tiff for it's a pretty different look um what I did is I took your uh, photo. I did a background extraction in the free program Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. Then I ran that through Starnet++. You know, it left a fair amount of artifacts, but it also isolated the nebula. I then applied this uh, color correction curve to that, to bring out the nebula a little, little bit more then put the stars on top of that and set them to screen blend mode and then just reset the black point and i kept the image a lot wider um, than you did i know maybe that wasn't your intention maybe you always wanted to crop in a lot more on the wizard but i i like wide field stuff so that's why i did it this way um, but anyways thanks for sending that in tom and here we go this is wow it's bright uh toshal sent in an image of the moon and clouds taken with a smartphone and an explore scientific newtonian reflector and it's a single frame image but toshal asked about how to get sharper images so i think the key to sharper images of the moon and the planets is instead of taking a single exposure like you did here take uh video and then use pip uh and auto stacker to two free programs on windows to pull out the best frames from that video they can do it automatically you sort of tell them how to how how many you want to pull out and then you stack only those best frames and the way that that technique works it's called lucky imaging it works because the software can find frames where there are moments of great seeing moments where the air isn't as turbulent and stack only those and you get this sharper image than you usually ever can with a single exposure so that's my advice for a sharper moon image okay and then we have tyler and tyler captured the andromeda galaxy with a canon xsi dslr a 55 to 250 zoom lens and a skywatcher star adventurer and this looks great especially considering that that's a very old dslr the first dslr i used for astrophotography was the canon t2i 
And this XSI was an older Rebel model, I think three or four models before the T2i. So it must have been pre-2010 that it was released. Um, anyways, the processing looks very good. Nice work bringing out the colors. The, the colors look perfect, you know, the, exactly how they should uh, with the, the dark um, nebula and the, and the blue star clusters and the, the core. Everything looks great here. Uh, my one critique is I think you might have a little bit of polar alignment error because the stars all have a little bit of trailing up and down. Um, so you did 90 second subs. I would try maybe 60 seconds, see if the stars are, are sharper and rounder with shorter sub exposures. Okay, this is by Euclid's. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Euclid sent in a photo of the Lagoon and Trifid nebulae taken with a Canon SL3 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens and a Skywatcher Star Adventure. And they mentioned they limited the 30 second exposures because the ambient temperature was high when they took this. So they wanted to be careful about not adding too much thermal noise. That's a smart strategy. My critique of this image is mostly to do with the color. So I'll show you where I'd head with it. Um, so here's just your original JPEG. Um, I'd start by removing a lot of green because green is not a particularly natural color to deep sky. There's no green stars. So I would just first remove a lot of those green uh, stars like this. And then um, overall, I'd rem I'd lower the saturation, which I think will actually help recover detail. Even in this JPEG, I feel like by lowering the saturation, I'm seeing more detail in the core of the nebula here. And But also, I think it helps the star color, the star field look a little better. Okay, V, like the letter V, sent in an image of the Cygnus region taken with a ZWO 1600mm, a ZWO 7 nanometer HA filter, and a Canon Nifty 50 lens on an iOptron Skyguider Pro, all controlled by a Raspberry Pi mini computer. And this is just five lights at five minutes each. So I love this, it, I love Cygnus, and the, but it also, this picture shows the flexibility of astrophotography today, that you can pair an inexpensive lens, an, a relatively inexpensive star tracker, uh, it's like a Skyguider Pro is like $500 maybe, but with a dedicated mono camera and an HA filter and get results like this in 25 minutes. Uh, that's amazing uh, how good this is. And perfectly framed, you know, the, the veil is a little tight, but you did get it in there. You also got the tulip up here. That's so cool. Um, v plans to shoot O3 and S2, and I think it's going to look really great if you make this full color and narrow band. You know, 25 minutes is relatively little integration time, but it already, I think, looks pretty nice. Um, don't really have anything to critique about this, uh, and I think it's a really neat idea for a kit. All right. Valentin captured the Triangulum Galaxy Messier 33 at 85 millimeters with a Sony mirrorless camera and a Skywatcher Easy GTI in equatorial mode from a Bortle 7 location. And Valentin said they did not have the disk space to stack all their shots at once, so they would stack groups of 200 exposures and then delete, I think, the individual 200 exposures, then stack another 200 and keep doing it that way, and then stack all the resulting uh, masters together. And they asked if this was okay, and yes, I think it works pretty well. I mean, I still need to do a more rigorous test to see if I can actually see a, any difference between doing it that way versus stacking everything at once. 
but theoretically, I don't think there could be there would be a huge difference between the two. Anyways, I think the processing looks really nice here. Um, my only critique is with color. I just think that M33 shouldn't be quite this blue. Um, so I processed it from scratch just to show you sort of the color. I'm thinking M33 should be closer to, which is more of a neutral with pockets, lots of pockets of pink. Um, because uh, it has a lot of hydrogen emission. So just to show you the difference here. Before and after. And I zoomed in a little bit, or cropped in a little bit, I guess. Uh, but I actually sort of like your crop better. So maybe I should have left it like that, because I, I like the seeing the sea of stars and then the little galaxy in the middle. Okay, Voltaire. Voltaire took a photo of the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae with a Canon 600D Skywatcher 72 millimeter refractor and a Skywatcher EQ3 mount. And I think this looks really good. The data looks very nice. Um, my only critique of it is that the processing feels too dark. Um, the Lagoon here is within the Milky Way. So there should be more faint stars sort of popping out. Um, so let me show you what that would look like. This is the same data, just brighter, basically. Um, and But I think that by making it brighter, you can also see more details in things like the blue reflection nebula around the Trifid and some of this extended nebulosity in the lagoon. And then Van City Astrophotography captured the pillars of creation at the center of the Eagle Nebula with a Celestron 8-inch SCT and a 0.63 reducer on an Altaz mount, all taken with a Canon 60D. And I think this looks really nice. Uh, Van City Astro asked about why the stars looked funky around the edges. My guess is it has nothing to do with your optics um, and all to do with your mount. With an Altaz mount, you're going to get field rotation. It's uh, unavoidable, and this looks just like field rotation. So uh, the only answer there is moving to an equatorial mount, uh, unfortunately. But I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think it detracts from the shot very much. Um, You could also always just crop in because I don't think the, you know, you have so much detail here in the in the nebula that just cropping out those sort of funky stars uh, would actually maybe be good. Let me just go here, something like that. And the only thing with uh, processing I'd recommend is just maybe just a tad brighter. So I just did a slightly brighter version here where I brightened up the, the nebula. But this is really cool. It's one of the better natural color pillars of creation shots I've seen. Okay, and then next we have Vlad, and Vlad captured the Milky Way untracked with a stock Canon DSLR, Canon Nifty 50 lens, and stacked 41 four-second shots with Sequator, and then processed them in Photoshop. And my thought on this one uh, is it looks a tad on the green side and could use a little bit more contrast. So... Just to show you that that direction, I just put a curves layer here on your uh, photo and uh, did a little more contrast and took out a little green and there's the result. So before, after. Other thing I could recommend is if you want to add another free program other than Sequator to your workflow, uh, Cyril, S-I-R-I-L, has a background extraction tool 
that should make getting good color and get rid of some of these gradients um, very easy to do. Okay, Giannis captured the Ro Ofuyuki Cloud Complex with a Sony point-and-shoot camera, an RX-10 version 2 on a move-shoot-move move star tracker. So that's a really neat lightweight kit there. It probably all fits in a small carry-on bag. Um, the move-shoot-move move is one of the smallest trackers I know of, and I think the Sony RX-10 is a very compact camera as well. My suggestion for improving this shot is either shoot flat frames, because uh, you can see there's a lot of vignetting, or, um, you know, uh, if you don't want to do flats or they don't work for you, um, you could just crop in. Uh, so I cropped in a little bit here just to show. And it doesn't look too great, but um, get the idea you can bring out a little bit more color in the nebulosity. Um, I have to work on the noise a little bit, I think, uh, in the background, but that's the idea. Uh, yeah. Because I think this might be uncorrectable vignetting. Uh, it looks too dark to probably correct. Because now I'm, I'm actually liking your crop better. So maybe just leave it as is. I don't know. Okay, and now we have Yantung, Yantung Bemo. Yantung Bemo captured M101, uh, also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy, with a Canon DSLR and a Celestron Nexstar 102 SLT telescope in its default with its default Altaz mount. And Yantung Bemo processed with Zero, GIMP, and Lightroom Mobile. And they said that they found the noise hard to deal with in processing, especially in the background, and would end up just dealing it with crushing the blacks. And, you know, that's exactly what I would do too, uh, and what I did. I think galaxy shots look good with nice black backgrounds. Um, well, with nebula shots, I'm always telling people, you know, don't crush your blacks. But here, I think, let's see where you put them. Yeah, I think uh, putting them around 15, 15, 15, something like that is good. With a nebula shot, I'd recommend 30, 30, 30. But I think crushing the blacks a little bit more to deal with noise is fine. Um, I process this one too. Let's see. I it looks a little noisy, but um, what I was trying to do, I guess, was um, get a little bit more color uh, variety into the galaxy, because I know that this galaxy does have these HA regions, which give the inner part uh, some of this sort of like pinkish look. Um, so I thought that was interesting to try to try to bring that out. Um, as for your question about being at the limit of your gear, um, I don't know. You might be close because I think this looks very good for that telescope and DSLR. Um, I think the best thing to save for if you're looking for a gear upgrade would be a star tracker or an equatorial mount because um, an Altaz mount is probably going to be limiting uh, in some ways. Um, so probably one of those would be something to save for. And now we have Zan. Zan sent an image of Cygnus taken with a Canon DSLR, a Canon Nifty 50 stopped down to F 3.2 with a barn door tracker. And Zan took 20 light frames at three minutes each for one hour total. And they were wondering about how to get better especially when it comes to noise. Um, but Zan already put in the caveat how to get better about hiding noise without taking more data. <laughs> so they knew I was going to say, yeah, just triple your exposure time. Um, well, 
so but I mean, I'll just mention it again. Getting more total time under the night sky is always going to be the best because that's going to increase your signal to noise ratio and then you can push the data further in processing. Um, the only good way to hide noise without getting more data is just being more conservative in how you're pushing the processing. So Zan did a really um, pretty cool job of really pushing the processing here. The stars have almost disappeared uh, uh, how much you know this is pushed. Um, it's almost like a starless edit. Um, but stars themselves can sort of hide noise. So I don't think that actually looks any better when it comes to noise, but then compared to Z Zan's edit. But I guess my idea here was that if, you know, if you do a more conservative thing, maybe it hides some noise. I think this just is a different kind of edit. Uh, not really necessarily a less noisy one. So, well, it depends what you mean by noise, I guess. I don't know, visual noise or, or actual noise. But anyways, different edit, uh, keeping all the stars in gets you that. Uh, it's a balancing act, you know, between bringing out the, these dark structures in wide field, bringing out the stars, if that's you're interested in that, bringing out the emission nebulae, um, but I really actually do like this edit, even though normally I don't like the ones where they've taken out all the stars. This one looks really tasteful to me for some reason. Um, okay, and then we have Zane Kite Photography. This is uh, the last photo in the critique, and it's of the central Orion region taken with a Nikon DSLR on an iOptron Skyguider Pro. It's just 14 exposures at two minutes each. And Zane Kite said that they couldn't get rid of this airplane flying through in the lower right part of the frame down here. Um, that actually I'm surprised by with something that bright with 14 exposures stacked. I wonder um, if in Deep Sky Stacker you were using the average stacking method rather than the default Kappa Sigma clipping. Because um, I, I would think that with Kappa Sigma clipping that those pixels would have been um, bright enough that you wouldn't it, they would be rejected. Um, and same thing with this um, meteor strike right here. I would have thought that would have been rejected from the stack if you're using Kappa Sigma. So my, my guess is you were using average something like that. Um, I don't know of any good way to manually get rid of uh, plane trails or satellite trails. Um, I always just rely on the rejection algorithm when you stack. Um, but other than that aspect, um, I think this photo looks really nice, um, really well processed, bringing out all of this brown dust in just a 28-minute total exposure. And the saturation level looks pretty nice. Um, just right on the edge, you know, like a, it's uh, bringing the saturation right up to that limit, uh, but not uh, over that limit where we'd start losing details to uh, the saturation. For anyone that has stuck around to the very end, congratulations. And I've decided I want to do a bonus clip here at the end where I critique one of my own astrophotos. Uh, this is something I just remembered that I did on the last critique video, and I thought it'd be nice to keep up the, the tradition. Um, this time, I'm going to critique uh, the astrophoto I've by far spent the most time on to date, um, which is an ongoing mosaic project in the constellation Cygnus. And it's, but it's centered so far on a part of Cygnus that I don't think gets as much uh, attention. And it's uh, definitely a project that has helped me learn a lot of troubleshooting and processing techniques and even new software, because at some point um, I added AstroPixel processor, uh, which was really actually invaluable for doing some of the mosaic construction. Um, so to start out, let me explain for anyone who doesn't know about this project that originally I plan to stop with this, which is hopefully you can see is the central part of this, right? Um, and so this is just eight panels and 46 hours total integration. Um, 
across HA, O3, and RGB uh, filters. And I finished this in 2018 and was very, very happy with it. I thought, wow, that's my best astrophoto to date. I really like it. Um, and so I was thinking originally when I was just making this that I that's that would be it. But then as soon as I f was done, I was like, I felt this feeling of like, I'm, it's done. I want to keep going. And then people, you know, encouraged me to keep going, too. So I thought, well, OK, maybe I'll expand it. Um, so I thought of different ways to expand it, like I could expand it to the right, to the left, uh, down, up, whatever, um, decided to expand it in one panel in every direction. So if you have eight panels and you go out one panel in every direction, that would make it 24 panels total. Um, so big undertaking, but I managed to actually gather all that data um, to make a 24 panel mosaic in 2020 because um, I took 2019 off. But then when I tried to stack all of this, uh, all 24 panels, I was still working on only laptops. I had a Mac laptop and a Windows laptop, and that's it. And I tried it both on the Mac laptop, the Windows laptop, no luck. <laughs> both PixInsight and AstroPixel processor both told me there is not enough memory. 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes or whatever it is was not enough, and it, it just crapped out. Uh, it would sometimes try to run all night and crap out. Other times, like AstroPixel processor would just tell me when I click the button, no way, <laughs> I'm not going to stack it for you. Um, so uh, by I ended up um, gathering more data in 2021 while I was saving for a new computer, which I have now. It's this like giant PC uh, with 128 gigabytes of RAM and a really good uh, uh, processor. Uh, a Ryzen 9 processor. Um, so but by the time that I had bought that computer, I had gathered 214 hours of data. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, and over 24 panels, I got it all stacked and processed like this. And guess what? After three years of waiting, I was disappointed <laughs> with the result. Um, maybe that was inevitable. I don't know. I just didn't feel that artistically it was that much of an improvement over the original eight panel uh, release, despite probably being, I don't know, 15 times, 20 times the effort and time put into it. I mean, in terms of just integration, going from 46 to 214 that's like something like five times more total but when you think of all the setup time and and all the processing and all the time spent saving for the computer and all these different things i think it was probably a lot a lot more uh, than that um so there there i'm not going to say it was i felt that they're equal in all ways like there are definitely some things um that i'll point out here that i think improved in this new rendition. Um, so in in 2021, one thing that happened because I was waiting to buy the computer was I had more time on these 24 panels. So I spent some of that time um, gathering more O3 on the Cygnus shell area here, W63, which definitely helped with um, making sure it wasn't noisy or too noisy at least um, compared to the original. And it also sort of beefed it up a little bit. Like I think it looks a little bit more filled in in this one. The other thing that I did that I really actually thought was pretty cool was I gathered S2 data um, and figured out a way to incorporate that into this. And it, it's pretty subtle, but there's a couple areas where it just helped a, a whole lot. And one of them is right here in the propeller region. Um, you see that there's like sort of like pinks and it's just very subtle what it did. Well, in this one, this is the area um, right here, oh, I can't see, right down here, that I thought stuck out like a sore thumb. I hated that so much, how this looked, the 03 edition right here. But I just, I couldn't figure out how to handle it, how to bring it out uh, without it just looking dumb like that. But it, it, so I think that in this one, that's really improved. Um, but to me, um, the drawback of this one artistically is that the focus is still the W63 supernova remnant. That's what I spent the most time on. And I also really loved how um, this pair of stars looked with this and then this streamer right here. But now this central feature takes up so um, little space compared to the overall picture 
when you compare it to this one where it's really in your face that I feel just artistically, it's sort of a wash. I don't think that this one is any better uh, than this. I love how this more fills the frame with interesting stuff to look at. And this one, it just sort of feels like, okay, you're drawn right away to that blue center and then your eye doesn't really know where to go next because there's just so much going on. Um, so uh, I, I even thought, well, okay, well maybe I could draw the eye better in an SHO version. So I did this, it's cropped in a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's better. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it at this point. Right now I'm just feeling sick of this. So maybe, maybe that's why, but I, I don't like this version that much. Um, I, I did release it because I thought I'd get some feedback, but uh, I don't know. I don't like it. So um, this is sounding like a downer. It's really not meant to be, though. Um, I just sort of want to talk through artistically this project since I haven't really before. Um, and I think that well, I'll wrap it up by saying that even though I'm somewhat disappointed in the result, I still find this project really exciting um, because when you go really deep on a project like this, it sort of takes on a life of its own. And at some point you just have to accept that your vision and, and the reality of what you actually have captured might not always match up, but that's okay. It can be more about the journey of creating a large project than the final result being the most satisfying part. Um, and in any case, like I did in 2019, I took a break of all, all of 2019, worked on other, other things. I did a, a cave, uh, a big thing in the, on the cave nebula, which was fun. And so I'm going to be taking a break from this Cygnus mosaic in 2022 um, to work on other things. Um, but hopefully in 2023, I'll feel energized to pick it back up with some fresh ideas. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, if I could expand it to to some of the more recognizable stuff in Cygnus, like the North America, which has a lot of O3 signal, maybe that offset of another big blue object will really uh, be cool. I'm not sure. Um, that would be expanding it mostly down. So I th I'm thinking that might be what I do um, rather than just keep going out, uh, which I'm, I'm thinking maybe wasn't the best idea. So anyways, um, this is a very long video. I've been working on it now all day and into the night. Um, so you are now seeing the names of all of my Patreon supporters um, because whenever we have a long video on the channel, um, you get to see the credit in the credits, all of the names of everyone who supports me on Patreon. So if you wanna see your name in the credits on, on any long video, you can sign up over on patreon.com slash nebula photos. And in addition to having your name in the credits, uh, as you're seeing now, there are lots of other benefits to joining us uh, with us over on Patreon. Um, the one, one of them is there's a direct chat feature right through Patreon. So as soon as you sign up, you can start chatting with me. Um, but then there's also it's linked to our Discord server. So that's where you can meet all the people who are already part of Patreon, all the people who you're seeing now. And they'll chat with you too about astrophotography where there's everyone on there is just really dedicated uh, astrophotography people. And so I, they know, you know, collectively way more than I do and can help you out with all kinds of things. I also organize a monthly imaging challenge um, where each month I'm gonna give you a challenge like shoot something in Orion, shoot something uh, that's a reflection nebula, so that kind of thing. Um, so it's a prompt and then you go out and shoot uh, a picture and do it in one month and submit it on the Discord server and it's, it's a lot of fun. And we pick um, winners and the winning images each month are published on my Instagram and on Astrobin. I also do monthly Zoom chats. So this is an opportunity to come in live and ask me questions. Um, I usually do a short presentation. Uh, we also sometimes have community presentations. So if there's something that you feel you wanna present on, um, that's great too. Um, and then there's just a bunch of other th stuff. I, I do, a, there's some exclusive videos that are only on Patreon. I'm gonna be doing some Patreon giveaways. Um, there, oh, and then new, uh, also new is we're doing a group imaging project. So this is, we're all going to be shooting, or we all are shooting M78, Messier 78 in Orion right now. And then we're going to 
try to put all of our data together and see what we get. So I think it's really worth your while to sign up um, so you don't miss out on all of this uh, activity uh, if you're into astrophotography. It starts at just $1 per month, um, and then there's a $3 tier and a $7 tier. And I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it that way. I don't I don't plan on really changing it uh, for a while at least. Um, but it's been it's been really fun, and, and hopefully you can join us on Patreon. Well, until next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies. <laughs>